Chapter One of the Roots of the Mountains by William Morris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Roots of the Mountains, wherein is told somewhat of the lives of the men of Burgdale, their friends, their neighbours, their foemen, and their fellows in arms, by William Morris whiles carried o'er the iron road we hurry by some fair abode the garden bright amidst the hay the yellow wain upon the way the dining men the wind that sweeps light locks from off the sun-sweet heaps the gable grey the hoary roof here now and now so far aloof how sorely then we long to stay and midst its sweetness wear the day and neath its changing shadows sit and feel ourselves a part of it such rest such stay i strove to win with these same leaves that lie herein longman's green and company london new york and bombay eighteen ninety six first edition printed november eighteen eighty nine two hundred and fifty copies were printed on large paper second edition february eighteen ninety three chapter one of Bergstead and its folk and its neighbours. Once upon a time amidst the mountains and hills and falling streams of a fair land, there was a town or thorpe in a certain valley. This was well nigh encompassed by a wall of sheer cliffs. Toward the east and the great mountains they drew together till they went near to meet, and left but a narrow path on either side of a stony stream that came rattling down into the dale toward the river at that end the hills lowered somewhat though they still ended in sheer rocks but up from it and more especially on the north side they swelled into great shoulders of land then dipped a little and rose again into the sides of huge fells clad with pine woods and cleft here and there by deep gills thence again they rose higher and steeper and ever higher till they drew dark and naked out of the woods to meet the snow-fields and ice-rivers of the high mountains but that was far away from the pass by the little river into the valley and the said river was no drain from the snow-fields white and thick with the grinding of the ice but clear and bright were its waters that came from wells amidst the bare rocky heaths the upper end of the valley where it first began to open out from the pass was rugged and broken by rocks and ridges of water-borne stones but presently it smoothed itself into mere grassy swellings and knolls and at last into a fair and fertile plain swelling up into a green wave as it were against the rock wall which encompassed it on all sides save where the river came gushing out of the straight pass at the east end and where at the west end it poured itself out of the dale toward the lowlands and the plain of the great river now the valley was some ten miles of our measure from that place of the rocks and the stone ridges to where the faces of the hills drew somewhat a nigh to the river again at the west and then fell aback along the edge of the great plain like as when ye fare a-sailing past two nesses of a river mouth and the main sea lieth open before you besides the river aforementioned which men called the weltering water there were other waters in the dale near the eastern pass entangled in the rocky ground was a deep tarn full of cold springs and about two acres in measure and therefrom ran a stream which fell into the weltering water amidst the grassy knolls black seemed the waters of that tarn which on one side washed the rock's wall of the dale ugly and awful it seemed to men and none knew what lay beneath its waters save black misshapen trouts that few cared to bring to net or angle and it was called the death tarn other waters yet there were here and there from the hills on both sides but especially from the south side came trickles of water that ran in pretty brooks down to the river and some of these sprang bubbling up amidst the foot-mounds of the sheer rocks some had cleft a rugged and straight way through them and came tumbling down into the dale at diverse heights from their faces 
but on the north side, about halfway down the dale, one stream somewhat bigger than the others, and dealing with softer ground, had cleft for itself a wider way, and the folk had laboured this way wider yet, till they had made them a road running north along the west side of the stream. Sooth to say, except for the straight pass along the river at the eastern end, and the wider pass at the western, they had no other way, save one, of which a word anon, out of the dale, but such as mountain goats and bold cragsmen might take, and even of these but few. This midway stream was called the Wild Lake, and the way along it Wild Lake's way, because it came to them out of the wood, which on that north side stretched away from nigh to the lip of the valley wall, up to the pine woods and the high fells, on the east and north, and down to the plain country on the west and south. Now when the weltering water came out of the rocky tangle near the pass, it was turned aside by the ground, till it swung right up to the feet of the southern crags. Then it turned and slowly bent round again northward, and at last fairly doubled back on itself, before it turned again to run westward, so that when, after its second double, it had come to flowing softly westward under the northern crags, it had cast two-thirds of a girdle round about a space of land a little below the grassy knolls and tofts aforesaid, and there, in that fair space between the folds of the weltering water, stood the thorp whereof the tale hath told. The men thereof had widened and deepened the weltering water about them, and had bridged it over to the plain meads, and athwart the throat of the space left clear by the water, they had built them a strong wall, though not very high, with a gate amidst, and a tower on either side thereof. Moreover, on the face of the cliff which was but a stone's throw from the gate, they had made them stairs and ladders to go up by, and on a knoll nigh the brow had built a watch-tower of stone, strong and great, lest war should come into the land from over the hills. That tower was ancient, and therefrom the thorpe had its name, and the whole valley also, and it was called Bergstead in Burgdale. So long as the weltering water ran straight along by the northern cliffs, after it had left Bergstead, betwixt the water and the cliffs was a wide flat way, fashioned by man's hand. Thus was the water again a good defence to the thorpe, for it ran slow and deep there, and there was no other ground betwixt it and the cliffs, save that road, which was easy to bar across, so that no foemen might pass without battle, and this road was called the portway. For a long mile the river ran under the northern cliffs, and then turned into the midst of the dale, and went its way westward a broad stream winding in gentle laps and folds here and there, down to the outgate of the dale. But the portway held on still underneath the rock wall, till the sheer rocks grew somewhat broken, and were cumbered with certain screes, and at last the wayfarer came upon the break in them, and the gill through which ran the wild lake, with wild lake's way beside it. But the portway still went on, all down the dale, and away to the plain country. That road in the gill, which was neither wide nor smooth, the wayfarer into the wood must follow, till it lifted itself out of the gill, and left the wild lake, coming rattling down by many steps from the east. And now the way went straight north through the woodland, ever mounting higher, because the whole set of the land was toward the high fells, but not in any cleft or gill. The wood itself thereabout was thick, a blended growth of diverse kinds of trees, but most of oak and ash. Light and air enough came through their boughs to suffer the holly and bramble and eglantine and other small wood to grow together into thickets which no man could pass without hewing away. But before it is told where two wild lakes way led, it must be said that on the east side of the gill where it first began, just over the portway, the hill's brow was clear of wood for a certain space, and there, overlooking all the dale, was the moatstead of the dalesman, marked out by a great ring of stones, amidst of which was the mound for the judges and the altar of the gods before it, and this was the holy place of the men of the dale and of other folk whereof the tale shall now tell. 
for when Wild Lake's way had gone some three miles from the moatstead, the trees began to thin, and presently afterwards was a clearing and the dwellings of men, built of timber as may well be thought. These houses were neither rich nor great, nor was the folk a mighty folk, because they were but a few, albeit body by body they were stout carls enough. They had not affinity with the dalesmen, and did not wed with them, yet it is to be deemed that they were somewhat akin to them. To be short, though they were free men, yet as regards the dalesmen were they well nigh their servants, for they were but poor in goods, and had to lean upon them somewhat. No tillage they had among those high trees, and of beasts, nought save some flocks of goats and a few asses. Hunters they were, and charcoal burners, and therein the deftest of men, and they could shoot well in the bow withal. So they trucked their charcoal and their smoked venison and their peltries with the dalesmen for wheat and wine and weapons and weed. And the dalesmen gave them main good pennyworths as men who had abundance wherewith to uphold their kinsmen, though they were but far away kin. Stout hands at these woodlanders, and true hearts as any, but they were few spoken, and to those that needed them, not somewhat surly of speech and grim of visage. Brown-skinned they were, but light-haired, well-eyed, with but little red in their cheeks. Their women were not very fair, for they toiled like the men, or more, they were thought to be wiser than most men in foreseeing things to come. They were much given to spells and songs of wizardry, and were very mindful of the old story lays, wherein they were far more wordy than in their daily speech. Much skill had they in runes, and were exceeding deft in scoring them on treen bowls, and on staves and door-posts and roof-beams, and standing-beds and such like things. Many a day when the snow was drifting over their roofs, and hanging heavy on the tree-boughs, and the wind was roaring through the trees aloft, and rattling about the close thicket, when the boughs were clattering in the wind, and crashing down beneath the weight of the gathering freezing snow, when all beasts and men lay close in their lairs, would they sit long hours about the house-fire, with the knife or the gouge in hand, with the timber twixt their knees, and the whetstone beside them, hearkening to some tale of old times, and the days when their banner was abroad in the world, and they the while, wheedling into growth out of the tough wood, knots and blossoms and leaves, and the images of beasts and warriors and women. They were called naught, save the woodland carls, in that day, though time had been when they had borne a nobler name, and their abode was called Carlstead, shortly for all they had and all they had not for all they were and all they were not they were well beloved by their friends and feared by their foes now when wild lake's way was gotten to carlstead there was an end of it toward the north though beyond it in a right line the wood was thinner because of the hewing of the carls but the road itself turned west at once and went on through the wood till some four miles further it first thinned and then ceased altogether the ground going downhill all the way for this was the lower flank of the first great upheaval toward the high mountains but presently after the wood was ended the land broke into swelling downs and winding dales of no great height or depth with a few scattered trees about the hillsides mostly thorns or scrubby oaks gnarled and bent and kept down by the western wind here and there also were yew trees and whilst the hillsides would be grown over with boxwood but none very great and often juniper grew abundantly this then was the country of the shepherds who were friends both of the dalesmen and the woodlanders they dwelt not in any fenced town or thorpe but their homesteads were scattered about as was handy for water and shelter nevertheless they had their own stronghold for amidmost of their country on the highest of a certain down above a bottom where a willowy stream winded, was a great earthwork. The walls thereof were high and clean and overlapping at the entering in, and amidst of it was a deep well of water, so that it was a very defensible place, and there too would they drive their flocks and herds when war was in the land, 
for naught but a very great host might win it, and this stronghold they called Greenbury. These shepherd folk were strong and tall like the woodlanders, for they were partly of the same blood, but burnt they were both ruddy and brown. They were of more words than the woodlanders, but yet not many worded. They knew well all those old story lays, and this partly by the minstrelsy of the woodlanders. But they had scant skill in wizardry, and would send for the woodlanders, both men and women, to do what so they needed therein. They were very hale and long-lived, whereas they dwelt in clear bright air, and they mostly went light-clad, even in the winter, so strong and merry were they. They wedded with the woodlanders and the dalesmen both, at least certain houses of them did so. They grew no corn, naught but a few pot-herbs, but had their meal of the dalesmen, and in the summer they drave some of their milk kine into the dale, for the abundance of grass there, whereas their own hills and bents and winding valleys were not plenteously watered, except here and there, as in the bottom under Greenbury. No swine they had, and but few horses, but of sheep very many, and of the best, both for their flesh and their wool. Yet were they not so deft craftsmen at the loom, as were the dalesmen, and their women were not very eager at the weaving, though they loathed not the spindle and rock. Shortly they were merry folk, well beloved of the dalesmen, quick to wrath, though it abode not long with them, not very curious in their houses and halls, which were but little, and were decked mostly with the handiwork of the woodland carls their guests, who, when they were abiding with them, would oft stand long hours, nose to beam, scoring and nicking and hammering, answering no words spoken to them, but with eye or no, desiring naught save the endurance of the daylight. Moreover, the shepherd folk heeded not gay raiment overmuch, but commonly went clad in white woollen or sheep brown weed. But beyond the shepherd folk were more downs and more, scantily peopled, and that after a while by folk with whom they had no kinship or affinity, and who were at whiles their foes. Yet was there no enduring enmity between them, and ever after war and battle came peace, and all blood whites were duly paid, and no long feud followed. Nor were the dalesmen and the woodlanders always in these wars, though at whiles they were, thus then it fared with these people. But now that we have told of the folks with whom the dalesmen had kinship, affinity and friendship, tell we of their chief abode, Burgstead to wit, and of its fashion. As hath been told, it lay upon the land made nigh into an isle by the folds of the weltering water, towards the uppermost end of the dale, and it was warded by the deep water, and by the wall aforesaid with its towers. Now the dale at its widest, to wit where Wild Lake fell into it, was but nine furlongs over, but at Burgstead it was far narrower, so that betwixt the wall and the wandering stream there was but a space of fifty acres. And therein lay Burgstead in a space of the shape of a sword pommel, and the houses of the kinships lay about it, amidst of gardens and orchards, but little ordered into streets and lanes, save that a way went clean through everything, from the tower-warded gate to the bridge over the water, which was warded by two other towers on its hither side. As to the houses, they were some bigger, some smaller, as the housemates needed. Some were old, but not very old, save two only, and some quite new, but of these there were not many. They were all built fairly of stone and lime, with much fair and curious carved work of knots and beasts and men round about the doors, or whiles a wail of such like work along the house front. For as deft as were the woodlanders with knife and gouge on the oaken beams, even so deft were the dalesmen with mallet and chisel on the face of the hewn stone, and this was a great pastime about the thorpe. Within these houses had but a hall and a solar, with shut-beds out from the hall on one side or two, with whatso of kitchen and buttery and outbower men deemed handy. Many men dwelt in each house, either kinsfolk, or such as were joined to the kindred. Near to the gate of Burgstead, in that street aforesaid, and facing east, was the biggest house of the Thorpe. 
it was one of the two above said which were older than any other its door-posts and the lintel of the door were carved with knots and twining stems fairer than other houses of that stead and on the wall beside the door carved over many stones was an image wrought in the likeness of a man with a wide face which was terrible to behold although it smiled he bore a bent bow of his hand with an arrow fitted to its string and about the head of him was a ring of rays like the beams of the sun and at his feet was a dragon which had crept as it were from amidst of the blossomed knots of the door-post wherewith the tail of him was yet entwined and this head with the ring of rays about it was wrought into the adornment of that house both within and without in many other places but on never another house of the dale and it was called the house of the face thereof hath the tale much to tell hereafter but as now it goeth on to tell of the ways of life of the dalesman in burgstead was no moat hall or town-house or church such as we wot of in these days and their market-place was wheresoever any might choose to pitch a booth but for the most part this was done in the wide street betwixt the gate and the bridge as to a meeting-place were there any small matters between man and man these would the alderman or one of the wardens deal with sitting in court with the neighbours on the wide space just outside the gate but if it were to do with greater matters such as great manslayings and blood wipes or the making of war or ending of it or the choosing of the aldermen and the wardens such matters must be put off to the folk moat which could but be held in the place aforesaid where was the doom ring and the altar of the gods and at that folk moat both the shepherd folk and the woodland carls foregathered with the dalesmen and duly said their say there also they held their great feasts and made offerings to the gods for the fruitfulness of the year the ingathering of the increase and in memory of their forefathers nathless at yuletide also they feasted from house to house to be glad with the rest of midwinter and many a cup they drank at those feasts to the memory of the fathers and the days when the world was wider to them and their banners fared far afield but besides these dwellings of men in the field between the wall and the water there were homesteads up and down the dale where so men found it easy and pleasant to dwell their halls were built of much the same fashion as those within the thorpe but many had a high garth wall cast about them so that they might make a stout defence in their own houses if war came into the dale as to their work afield in many places the dale was fair with growth of trees and especially were there long groves of sweet chestnut standing on the grass of the fruit whereof the folk had much gain also on the south side nigh to the western end was a wood or two of yew trees very great and old whence they gat them bow staves for the dalesmen also shot well in the bow much wheat and rye they raised in the dale and especially at the nether end thereof apples and pears and cherries and plums they had in plenty of which trees some grew about the borders of the acres some in the gardens of the thorpe and the homesteads on the slopes that had grown from the breaking down here and there of the northern cliffs and which faced the south and the sun's burning were rows of goodly vines whereof the folk made them enough and to spare of strong wine both white and red as to their beasts swine they had a many but not many sheep since herein they trusted to their trucking with their friends the shepherds they had horses and yet but a few for they were stout in going afoot and had they a journey to make with women big with babes or with children or outworn elders they would yoke their oxen to their wains and go fair and softly whither they would but the said oxen and all their neat were exceeding big and fair far other than the little beasts of the shepherd folk they were either dun of colour or white with black horns and those very great and black tail tufts and ear tips asses they had and mules for the paths of the mountains to the east geese and hens enough and dogs not a few great hounds stronger than wolves sharp-nosed long-jawed dun of colour shag-haired as to their wares they were very deft weavers of wool and flax 
and made a shift to dye the thrums in fair colours, since both Wode and Madder came to them good cheap by means of the merchants of the plain country, and of greening weeds was abundance at hand. Good smiths they were in all the metals, they washed somewhat of gold out of the sands of the weltering water, and copper and tin they fetched from the rocks of the eastern mountains. But of silver they saw little, and iron they must buy of the merchants of the plain, who came to them twice in the year, to wit in the spring and the late autumn, just before the snows. Their wares they bought with wool spun and in the fleece, and fine cloth, and skins of wine and young neat, both steers and heifers, and wrought copper bowls, and gold and copper by weight, for they had no stamped money. And they guested these merchants well, for they loved them, because of the tales they told them of the plain and its cities, and the manslayings therein, and the fall of kings and dukes, and the uprising of captains. Thus lived this folk in much plenty and ease of life, though not delicately, nor desiring things out of measure. They wrought with their hands, and wearied themselves, and they rested from their toil, and feasted, and were merry. Tomorrow was not a burden to them, nor yesterday a thing which they would fain forget. Life shamed them not, nor did death make them afraid. As for the dale wherein they dwelt, it was indeed most fair and lovely, and they deemed it the blessing of the earth, and they trod its flowery grass beside its rippled streams, amidst its green tree-boughs, proudly and joyfully, with goodly bodies and merry hearts. End of chapter 1「II of the Roots of the Mountains」by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of Face of God and His Kindred Tells the tale that on an evening of late autumn, when the weather was fair, calm, and sunny, there came a man out of the wood, hard by the moatstead aforesaid, who sat him down at the roots of the speech mound, casting down before him a roebuck which he had just slain in the wood. He was a young man of three and twenty summers. He was so clad that he had on him a sheep-brown kirtle, and leggings of like stuff bound about with white leather thongs. He bore a short sword in his girdle, and a little axe withal, the sword with fair-wrought gilded hilts, and a dew-shoe of like fashion to its sheath. He had his quiver at his back, and bare in his hand his bow unstrung. He was tall and strong, very fair of fashion, both of limbs and face, white-skinned, but for the sun's tanning, and ruddy-cheeked. His beard was little and fine, his hair yellow and curling, cut somewhat close, but for its length so plenteous, and so thick, that none could fail to note it. He had no hat, nor hood upon his head, nought but a fillet of golden beads. As he sat down he glanced at the dale below him, with a well-pleased look, and then cast his eyes down to the grass at his feet, as though to hold a little longer, all unchanged, the image of the fair place he had just seen. The sun was low in the heavens, and his slant beams fell yellow, all up the dale, gilding the chestnut groves grown dusk and grey with autumn, and the black masses of the elm boughs, and gleaming back here and there from the pools of the weltering water. Down in the midmost meadows, the long-horned dun kine were moving slowly as they fed along the edges of the stream, and a dog was bounding about with exceeding swiftness here and there among them. At a sharply curved bight of the river, the man could see a little vermilion flame flickering about, and above it a thin blue veil of smoke hanging in the air and clinging to the boughs of the willows anear. About it were a dozen menfolk clear to see, some sitting, some standing, some walking to and fro, but all in company together. Four of these were brown-clad and short-skirted like himself, and from above the hand of one came a flash of light as the sun smote upon the steel of his spear. The others were long-skirted and clad gayer, and amongst them were red and blue and green and white garments, and they were clear to be seen for women. Just as the young man looked up again, those of them who were sitting down rose up, and those that were strolling drew nigh, and they joined hands together, 
and fell to dancing on the grass. And the dog, and another one with him, came up to the dancers, and raced about and betwixt them, and so clear to see were they all, and so little, being far away, that they looked like dainty well-wrought puppets. The young man sat smiling at it for a little, and then rose up and shouldered his venison, and went down into Wild Lake's way, and presently was fairly in the dale, and striding along the portway beside the northern cliffs, whose greyness was gilded yet by the last rays of the sun, though in a minute or two it would go under the western rim. He went fast and cheerily, murmuring to himself snatches of old songs. None overtook him on the road, but he overtook diverse folk going alone or in company toward Burgstead, swains and old men, mothers and maidens coming from the field and the acre, or going from house to house, and one or two he met, but not many. All these greeted him kindly, and he them again, but he stayed not to speak with any, but went as one in haste. It was dusk by then he passed under the gate of Burgstead. He went straight thence to the door of the house of the face, and entered as one who is at home, and need go no further, nor abide a bidding. The hall he came into, straight out of the open air, was long and somewhat narrow, and not right high. It was well nigh dark now within, but since he knew where to look, he could see by the flicker that leapt up now and then from the smouldering brands of the hearth amidmost the hall under the luffer, that there were but three men therein, and belike they were even they whom he looked to find there. And for their part they looked for his coming, and knew his step. He set down his venison on the floor, and cried out in a cheery voice, "'Oh, Kettle, are all men gone without doors to sleep so near the winter tide that the hall is as dark as a cave? Hither to me, or art thou also sleeping?' A voice came from the further side of the hearth. "'Yea, Lord, asleep I am, and have been, and dreaming. In my dream I dealt with the flesh-pots and the cake-board, and thou shalt see my dream come true presently to thy gain.' Quoth another voice, Kettle hath had out that share of his dream already, belike, if the saw saith sooth about cooks. All ye have been away, so belike he hath done as Rafe's dog when Rafe ran away from the slain book. He laughed therewith, and Kettle with him, and a third voice joined the laughter. The young man also laughed, and said, Here I bring venison, which my kinsman desired, but as ye see, I have brought it over late. But take it, Kettle, when cometh my father from the stithy? Quoth Kettle, my lord hath been hard at it, shaping the yuletide sword, and doth not likely leave such work as ye wot. But he will be here presently, for he has sent to bid us dight for supper straight away. Said the young man, Where are thy lords in the dale, Kettle? Or hast thou made some thyself, that thou must be always throwing them in my teeth? Son of the alderman, said Kettle, ye call me Kettle, which is no name of mine, so why should I not call thee lord? which is no dignity of thine, since it goes well over my tongue from old use and want. But here comes my mate of the kettle, and the women and lads. Sit down by the hearth away from their hurry, and I will fetch thee the hand-water. The young man sat down, and kettle took up the venison, and went his ways toward the door at the lower end of the hall. But ere he reached it, it opened, and a noisy crowd entered of men, women, boys, and dogs some bearing great wax candles, some bowls and cups and dishes and trenchers, and some the boards for the meal. The young man sat quiet, smiling, and winking his eyes at the sudden flood of light let into the dark place. He took in, without looking at this or the other thing, the aspect of his father's house, so long familiar to him. Yet to-night he had a pleasure in it above his want, and in all the stir of the household, for the thought of the wood wherein he had wandered all day, yet hung heavy upon him. Came one of the girls, and cast fresh brands on the smouldering fire, and stirred it into a blaze, and the wax candles were set up on the dais, so that between them and the new quickened fire every corner of the hall was bright. As aforesaid, it was long and narrow, over-arched with stone, and not right high, the windows high up under the springing of the roof-arch, and all on the side toward the street. Over against them were the arches of the shut-beds of the housemates. 
The walls were bare that evening, but folk were wont to hang up haulings of woven pictures thereon when feasts and high days were toward, and all along the walls were the tenter hooks for that purpose, and diverse weapons and tools were hanging from them here and there. About the dais behind the thwart table were now stuck for adornment, leafy boughs of oak, now just beginning to turn with the first frosts. High up on the gable wall above the tenter hooks for the hangings were carven fair imagery and knots and twining stems, for there in the hewn stone was set forth that same image with the rayed head that was on the outside wall, and he was smiting the dragon and slaying him. But here inside the house all this was stained in fair and lively colours, and the sun-like rays round the head of the image were of beaten gold. At the lower end of the hall were two doors going into the butteries and kitchen and other outbowers, and above these doors was a loft upborne by stone pillars, which loft was the sleeping chamber of the good man of the house. But the outward door was half way between the said loft and the hearth of the hall. So the young man took the shoes from his feet, and then sat watching the women and lads arraying the boards, till Kettle came again to him with an old woman bearing the ewer and basin, who washed his feet and poured the water over his hands, and gave him the towel with fair broidered ends to dry them withal. Scarce had he made an end of this, ere through the outer door came in three men, and a young woman with them. The foremost of these was a man younger by some two years than the first comer, but so like him that none might misdoubt that he was his brother. The next was an old man with a long white beard, but hale and upright, and lastly came a man of middle age, who led the young woman by the hand. He was taller than the first of the young men, though the other who entered with him outwent him in height. A stark carl he was, broad across the shoulders, thin in the flank, long-armed and big-handed, very noble and well-fashioned of countenance, with a straight nose and grey eyes underneath a broad brow. His hair grown somewhat scanty, was done about with a fillet of golden beads, like the young men his sons. For indeed this was their father, and the master of the house. His name was Ironface, for he was the deftest of weaponsmiths, and he was the alderman of the dalesmen, and well beloved of them. His kindred was deemed the noblest of the dale, and long had they dwelt in the house of the face. But of his sons, the youngest, the newcomer, was named Hallface, and his brother, the elder, Face of God, which name was of old use amongst the kindred, and many great men and stout warriors had borne it aforetime. And this young man in great love had been gotten, and in much hope had he been reared, and therefore had he been named after the best of the kindred. But his mother, who was height the jewel, and had been a very fair woman, was dead now, and Iron Face lacked a wife. Face of God was well beloved of his kindred, and of all the folk of the dale, and he had gotten a two-name, and was called Goldmane, because of the abundance and fairness of his hair. As for the young woman that was led in by Iron Face, she was the betrothed of Face of God, and her name was the Bride. She looked with such eyes of love on him when she saw him in the hall, as though she had never seen him before but once, nor loved him but since yesterday, though in truth they had grown up together and had seen each other most days of the year for many years. She was of the kindred with whom the chiefs and great men of the face mostly wedded, which was indeed far away kindred of them. She was a fair woman and strong, not easily daunted amidst perils. She was hardy and handy and light foot, she could swim as well as any, and could shoot well in the bow, and wield sword and spear. Yet was she kind and compassionate and of great courtesy, and the very dogs and kind trusted in her and loved her. Her hair was dark red of hue, long and fine and plenteous, her eyes great and brown, her brow broad and very fair, her lips fine and red, her cheek not ruddy, yet no wise sallow, but clear and bright. Tall she was, and of excellent fashion, but well-knit and well-measured, rather than slender and wavering as the willow-bough. Her voice was sweet and soft, her words few, but exceeding dear to the listener. In short, she was a woman born to be the ransom of her folk. 
now as to the names which the menfolk of the face bore and they an ancient kindred a kindred of chieftains it has been said that in times past their image of the god of the earth had over his treen face a mask of beaten gold fashioned to the shape of the image and that when the alderman of the folk died he to wit who served the god and bore on his arm the gold ring between the people and the altar this visor or face of god was laid over the face of him who had been in a manner his priest and therewith he was born to mound and the new alderman and priest had it in charge to fashion a new visor for the god and whereas for long this great kindred had been chieftains of the people they had been and were all so named that the word face was ever a part of their names End of chapter two chapter three of the roots of the mountains by william morris this librivox recording is in the public domain they talk of diverse matters in the hall now face of god who is also called goldmane rose up to meet the newcomers and each of them greeted him kindly and the bride kissed him on the cheek and he her in like wise and he looked kindly on her and took her hand and went on up the hall to the dais following his father and the old man as for him he was of the kindred of the house and was foster-father of iron face and of his sons both and his name was stone face a stark warrior he had been when he was young and even now he could do a man's work in the battlefield and his understanding was as good as that of a man in his prime so went these and four others up onto the dais and sat down before the thwart table looking down the hall for the meat was now on the board and of the others there were some fifty men and women who were deemed to be of the kindred and sat at the end long tables so then the alderman stood up and made the sign of the hammer over the meat the token of his craft and of his god then they fell to with good hearts for there was enough and to spare of meat and drink there was bread and flesh though not gold mains venison and leeks and roasted chestnuts of the grove and red-cheeked apples of the garth and honey enough of that year's gathering and a meddler's sharp and mellow moreover good wine of the western bents went up and down the hall in great gilded copper bowls and in mazes girt and lipped with gold but when they were full of meat and had drunken somewhat they fell to speech and iron face spake aloud to his son who had been speaking softly to the bride as one playmate to the other but the alderman said scarce are the wood deer grown kinsmen when i must needs eat sheep's flesh on a thursday though my son has lain abroad in the woods all night to hunt for me and therewith he smiled into the young man's face but goldmane reddened and said so is it kinsman i can hit what i can see but not what is hidden iron face laughed and said hast thou been to the woodland carls are there women fairer than our cousins face of god took up the bride's hand in his and kissed it and laid it to his cheek and then turned to his father and said nay father i saw not the wood carls nor went to their abode and on no day do i lust after their women moreover i brought home a roebuck of the fattest but i was over late for kettle and the flesh was ready for the board by then i came well son quoth iron face for he was merry a roebuck is but a little dear for such big men as are thou and i but i read thee take the bride along with thee the next time and she shall seek whilst thou sleepest and hit when thou missest then face of god smiled but he frowned somewhat also and he said well were that indeed but if ye must needs drag a true tale out of me that roebuck i shot at the very edge of the wood nigh to the moatstead as i was coming home harts had i seen in the wood and its lawns and boars and bucks and loose not at them for indeed when i awoke in the morning in that wood lawn ye wot of i wandered up and down with my bow unbent so it was that i fared as if i were seeking something i know not what that should fill up something lacking to me i know not what thus i felt in myself even so long as i was underneath the black boughs and there was none beside me and before me 
and none to turn her back to. But when I came out again into the sunshine, and I saw the fair dale and the happy abode lying before me, and folk abroad in the meads merry in the eventide, then I was full fain of it, and loathed the wood as an empty thing that had naught to give me. And lo, you, all that I had been longing for in the wood, was it not in this house and ready to my hand? And that is good, me seemeth. Therewith he drank of the cup which the bride put into his hand after she had kissed the rim, but when he had set it down again he spake once more, And yet now I am sitting honoured and well beloved in the house of my father's, with the holy hearth sparkling and gleaming down there before me, and she that shall bear my children, sitting soft and kind by my side, and the bold lads I shall one day lead in battle, drinking out of my very cup. Now it seems to me, that amidst all this, the dark cold wood, wherein abide but the peace and the foes of God, is bidding me to it and drawing me thither. Narrow is the dale, and the world is wide. I would it were dawn and daylight, that I might be afoot again. And he half rose up from his place, but his father bent his brow on him and said, Kinsman, thou hast a long tongue for a half-trained whelp, nor see I whitherward thy mind is wandering but if it be on the road of a lad's desire to go further and fare worse, hearken then, I will offer thee somewhat. Soon shall the West Country merchants be here with their winter truck. How sayest thou? Hast thou a mind to fare back with them, and look on the plain and its cities, and take and give with the strangers, to whom indeed thou shalt be nothing save a purse with a few lumps of gold in it, or maybe a spear in the stranger's back on the stricken field? or a bow on the wall of an alien city. This is a craft which thou mayst well learn, since thou shalt be a chieftain, a craft good to learn, however grievous it be in the learning. And I myself have been there, for in my youth I desired sore to look on the world beyond the mountains. So I went, and I filled my belly with the fruit of my own desires, and a bitter meat was that, but now it has passed through me, and I yet alive. Belike, I am more of a grown man for having endured its gripe. Even so, may it well be with thee, son. So go if thou wilt, and thou shalt go with my blessing, and with gold, and wares, and wain, and spearmen. Nay, said face of God, I thank thee, for it is well offered, but I will not go, for I have no lust for the plain and its cities. I love the dale well, and all that is round about it. Therein will I live and die. Therewith he fell amusing, and the bride looked at him anxiously, but spake not. Sooth to say, her heart was sinking, as though she foreboded some new thing which had thrust itself into their merry life. But the old man, stone face, took up the word and said, Son, gold mane, it behoveth me to speak, since belike I know the wild wood better than most, and have done for these three score and ten years to my cost. Now I perceive that thou longest for the wood and the innermost of it, and what ye what, this longing will at whiles entangle the sons of our chieftains, though this alderman that now is hath been free therefrom, which is well for him, for time was this longing came over me, and I went whither it led me, over long it were to tell of all that befell me because of it, and how my heart bled thereby. So sorry were the tidings that came of it, that now meseemeth my heart should be of stone, and not my face, had it not been for the love wherewith I have loved the sons of the kindred. Therefore, son, it were not ill if ye went west away with the merchants this winter, and learned the dealings of the cities, and brought us back tales thereof. But Goldmane cried out somewhat angrily, I tell thee, foster father, that I have no mind for the cities and their men, and their fools and their whores and their runnergates. But as for the wood and its wonders, I have done with it, save for hunting there along with others of the folk. So let thy mind be at ease, and for the rest I will do what the alderman commandeth, and what so my father craveth of me. And that is well, son, said Stoneface, if what ye say come to pass, as sore I misdoubt me it will not. But well it were, well it were, for such things are in the wood, yea, and before ye come to its innermost, as may well try the stoutest heart. Therein are cobbles and whites that love not men, 
things unto whom the grief of med is as the sound of the fiddle-bow unto us and there abide the ghosts of those that may not rest and there wander the dwarfs and the mountain dwellers the dealers in marvels the givers of gifts that destroy houses the forgers of the curse that clingeth and the murder that flitteth to and fro there moreover are the lairs of whites in the shapes of women that draw a young man's heart out of his body and fill up the empty place with desire never to be satisfied that they may mock him therewith and waste his manhood and destroy him nor do i say much of the strong thieves that dwell there since thou art a valiant sword or of them who have been made wolves of the holy places or of the murder carls the remnants and offscourings of wicked and wretched folks men who think as much of the life of a man as of the life of a fly yet happiest is the man whom they shall tear in pieces than he who shall live burdened by the curse of the foes of the gods the housemaster looked on his son as the old carl spake and a cloud gathered on his face a while and when stoneface had made an end he spake this is long and evil talk for the end of a merry day o oh, fosterer wilt thou not drink a draught o oh, reedsman and then stand up and set thy fiddle-bow a-dancing and cause it draw some fair words after it for my cousin's face has grown sadder than a young maid should be and my son's eyes gleam with thoughts that are far away from us and abroad in the wildwood seeking marvels then arose a man of middle age from the top of the endlong bench on the east side of the hall a man tall thin and scant haired with a nose like an eagle's neb he reached out his hand for the bowl and when they had given it to him he handled it and raised it aloft and cried here i drink a double health to face of god and the bride and the love that lieth between them and the love betwixt them twain and us he drank therewith and the wine went up and down the hall and all men drank both carls and queens with shouting and great joy then reedsman put down the cup for it had come into his hands again and reached his hand to the wall behind him and took down his fiddle hanging there in its case and drew it out and fell to tuning it while the hall grew silent to hearken then he handled the bow and laid it on the strings till they wailed and chuckled sweetly and when the song was well awake and stirring briskly then he lifted up his voice and sang the minstrel saith oh why on this morning ye maids are ye tripping aloof from the meadows yet fresh with the dew where under the west wind the river is lipping the fragrance of mint the white blooms and the blue for rough is the portway where panting you wander on your feet and your gown hems the dust lieth done come trip through the grass and the meadow sweet yonder and forget neath the willows the sword of the sun the maidens answer though fair are the moon daisies down by the river and soft is the grass and the white clover sweet though twixt us and the rock wall the hot glare doth quiver and the dust of the wheelway is done on our feet yet here on the way shall we walk on this morning though the sun burneth here and sweet cool is the mead for here when in old days the burg gave its warning stood stark under weapons the doughty of deed here came on the aliens their proud words are crying and here on our threshold they stumbled and fell here silent at even the steel-clad were lying and here were our mothers the story to tell here then on the morn of the eve of the wedding we pray to the mighty that we too may bear such war-walls for warding of orchard and steading that the new days be merry as old days were dear therewith he made an end and shouts and glad cries arose all about the hall and an old man arose and cried a cup to the memory of the mighty of the day of the warding of the ways for you must know this song told of a custom of the folk held in memory of a time of bygone battle wherein they had overthrown a great host of aliens on the portway betwixt the river and the cliffs two furlongs from the gate of burgstead so now two weeks before midsummer those maidens who were presently to be wedded went early in the morning to that place clad in a very fair raiment 
swords girt to their sides and spears in their hands and abode there on the highway from morn till even as though they were a guard to it and they made merry there singing songs and telling tales of times past and at the sun setting their grooms came to fetch them away to the feast of the eve of the wedding while the song was a-singing face of god took the bride's hand in his and caressed it and was soft and blithe with her and she reddened and trembled for pleasure and called to mind wedding feasts that had been and fair brides that she had seen thereat and she forgot her fears and her heart was at peace again and old iron face looked well pleased on the two from time to time and smiled but forbore words to them but up and down the hall men talked with one another about things long ago betid for their hearts were high and they desired deeds but in that fair dale so happy were the years from day to day that there was but little to tell of so deepened the night and waned and goldmane and the bride still talked sweetly together and at whiles kindly to the others and by seeming he had clean forgotten the wood and its wonders then at last the alderman called for the cup of good night and men drank thereof and went their ways to bed End of chapter three chapter four of the roots of the mountains by william morris this librivox recording is in the public domain face of god fareth to the wood again when it was the earliest morning and dawn was but just beginning face of god awoke and rose up from his bed and came forth into the hall naked in his shirt and stood by the hearth wherein the piled-up embers were yet red and looked about and could see nothing stirring in the dimness then he fetched water and washed the night tide off him and clad himself in haste and was even as he was yesterday save that he left his bow and quiver in their place and took instead a short casting spear moreover he took a leathern scrip and went therewith to the buttery and set therein bread and flesh and a little gilded beaker and all this he did with but little noise for he would not be questioned lest he should have to answer himself as well as others thus he went quietly out of doors for the door was but latched since no bolts or bars or locks were used in burgstead and through the town gate which stood open save when rumours of war were about he turned his face straight towards wild lake's way walking briskly but at whiles looking back over his shoulder toward the east to note what way was made by the dawning and how the sky lightened above the mountain passes by then he was come to the place where the maiden ward was held in the summer the dawn was so far forward that all things had their due colours and were clear to see in the shadowless day it was a bright morning with an easterly air stirring that drave away the haze and dried the meadows which had otherwise been rimy for it was cold goldmane lingered on the place a little and his eyes fell on the road as dusty yet as in reedsman's song for the autumn had been very dry and the strip of green that edged the outside of the way was worn and dusty also on the edge of it half in the dusty road half on the worn grass was a long twine of bryony red berried and black leaved and right in the midst of the road were two twigs of great leaved sturdy pollard oak as though they had been thrown aside there yesterday by women or children a-sporting and the deep white dust yet held the marks of feet some bare some shod crossing each other here and there face of god smiled as he passed on as a man with a happy thought for his mind showed him a picture of the bride as she would be leading the maiden ward next summer and singing first among the singers and he saw her as clearly as he had often seen her verily and before him was the fashion of her hands and all her body and the little mark on her right wrist and the place where her arm whitened because the sleeve guarded it against the sun which had long been pleasant to him 
and the little hollow in her chin and the lock of red-brown hair waving in the wind above her brow and shining in the sun as brightly as the alderman's cunningest work of golden wire soft and sweet seemed that picture till he almost seemed to hear her sweet voice calling to him and desire of her so took hold of the youth that it stirred him up to go swiftlier as he strode on the day brightening behind him now it was nigh sunrise and he began to meet folk on the way though not many since for most their way lay afield and not towards the burg the first was a woodlander tall and gaunt striding beside his ass whose panniers were laden with charcoal the carl's daughter a little maiden of seven winters was riding on the ass's back betwixt the panniers and prattling to herself in the cold morning for she was pleased with the clear light in the east and the smooth wide turf of the meadows as one who had not often been far from the shadow of the heavy trees of the wood and their dark wall round about the clearing where they dwelt face of god gave the twain the seal of the day in merry fashion as he passed them by and the sober dark-faced man nodded to him but spake no word and the child stayed her prattle to watch him as he went by then came the sound of the rattle of wheels and as he doubled an angle of the rock wall he came upon a wain drawn by four dun kine wherein lay a young woman all muffled up against the cold with furs and cloths beside the yoke beasts went her man a well-knit trim-faced dalesman clad bravely in holiday raiment girt with a goodly sword bearing a bright steel helm on his head in his hand a long spear with a gay red and white shaft done about with copper bands he looked merry and proud of his wainload and the woman was smiling kindly on him from out of her scarlet and fur but now she turned a weary happy face on goldmane for they knew him as did all men of the dale so he stopped when they met for the good man had already stayed his slow beasts and the good wife had risen a little on her cushions to greet him yet slowly and but a little for she was great with child and not far from her time that knew goldmane well and what was toward and why the good man wore his fine clothes and why the wain was decked with oak boughs and the yoke beasts with their best gilded bells and copper adorned harness for it was a custom with many of the kindreds that the good wife should fare to her father's house to lie in with her first babe and the day of her coming home was made a great feast in the house so then face of god cried out hail to thee o warcliff shrewd is the wind this morning and thou dost well to heed it carefully this thine orchard this thy garden this thy fair apple tree to a good hall thou wendest and the wine of increase shall be sweet there this even then smiled warcliff all across his face and the good wife hung her head and reddened said the good man wilt thou not be with us son of the alderman as surely as thy father shall be nay said face of god though i were fain of it my own matters carry me away what matters said warcliff perchance thou art for the cities this autumn face of god answered somewhat stiffly nay i'm not and then more kindly and smiling all roads lead not down to the plain friend what road then farest thou away from us said the good wife the way of my will he answered and what way is that said she take heed lest i get a longing to know for then must thou needs tell me or deal with the carl there beside thee nay good wife said face of god let not that longing take thee for on that matter i am even as wise as thou now good speed to thee and to the newcomer therewith he went close up to the wain and reached out his hand to her and she gave him hers and he kissed it and so went his ways smiling kindly on them then the carl cried to his kine and they bent down their heads to the yoke and presently as he walked on he heard the rumble of the wain mingling with the tinkling of their bells which in a little while became measured and musical and sounded above the creaking of the axles and the rattle of the gear and the roll of the great wheels over the road and so it grew thinner and thinner 
till it all died away behind him. He was now come to where the river turned away from the sheer rock wall, which was not so high there as in most other places, as there had been in old time long screes from the cliff, which had now grown together with the waxing of herbs and the washing down of the earth on to them, and made a steady slope of low hill going down riverward. Over this the road lifted itself above the level of the meadows, keeping a little way from the cliffs, while on the other side its bank was somewhat broken and steep here and there. As face of God came up to one of those broken places, the sun rose over the eastern pass, and the meadows grew golden with its long beams. He lingered and looked back under his hand, and as he did so, heard the voices and laughter of women coming up from the slope below him, and presently a young woman came struggling up the broken bank with hand and knee, and cast herself down on the roadside turf, laughing and panting. She was a long-limbed, light-maid woman, dark-faced and black-haired. Amidst her laughter she looked up and saw Goldmane, who had stopped at once when he saw her. She held out her hands to him, and said lightly, though her face flushed with all, "'Come hither thou, and help the others to climb the bank, for they are well beaten in the race, and now must they do after my will. That was the forfeit.' He went up to her, and took her hands, and kissed them, as was the custom of the dale, and said, "'Hail to thee, long coat. Who be they, and whither away this morning early?' She looked hard at him, and fondly belike, as she answered slowly, "'They be the two maidens of my father's house, whom thou knowest, and our errand, all three of us, is to Burgstead, to the feast of the wine of increase, which shall be drunk this even.' As she spake, came another woman half up the bank, to whom went face of God, and taking her hands, drew her up while she laughed merrily in his face. He saluted her as he had long coat, and then, with a laugh, turned about to wait for the third, who came indeed, but after a little while, for she had abided hearing their voices. Her also Goldmane drew up and kissed her hands, and she lay on the grass by Longcoat, but the second maiden stood up beside the young man. She was white-skinned and golden-haired, a very fair damsel, whereas the last comer was but comely, as were well nigh all the women of the dale said face of god looking on the three how comes it maidens that ye are but in your kirtles this sharp autumn morning or where have ye left your gowns or your cloaks for indeed they were clad but in close-fitting blue kirtles of fine wool embroidered about the hems with gold and coloured threads the last comer laughed and said what ails thee gold main to be so careful of us as if thou wert our mother or our nurse Yet if thou must needs know, there hang our gowns on the thorn-bush down yonder, for we have been running a match and a forfeit, to wit, that she who was the last on the highway should go down again and bring them up all three. And now that is my day's work. But since thou art here, alderman's son, thou shalt go down instead of me and fetch them up. But he laughed merrily and outright, and said, That will I not, for there be but twenty-four hours in the day and what, between eating and drinking and talking to fair maidens, I have enough to do in every one of them. Wasteful are ye women, and simple is your forfeit. Now will I, who am the alderman's son, give forth a doom, and will ordain that one of you fetch up the gowns yourselves, and that Longcoat will be the one, for she is the fleetest-footed and ablest thereto. Will ye take my doom, for later on I shall not be wiser? Yes, said the fair woman, not because thou art the alderman's son, but because thou art the fairest man of the dale, and mayst bid us poor souls what thou wilt. Face of God reddened at her words, and the speaker and the last comer laughed, but Longcoat held her peace. She cast one very sober look on him, and then ran lightly down the bent. He drew near the edge of it, and watched her going, for her light foot slimness was fair to look on. And he noted, that when she was nigh the thorn-bush whereon hung the bright broidered gowns, and deemed belike that she was not seen, she kissed both her hands where he had kissed them erst. Thereat he drew her back, 
and turned away shyly, scarce looking at the other twain who smiled on him with somewhat jeering looks. But he bade them farewell and departed speedily. And if they spoke, it was but softly, for he heard their voices no more. He went on under the sunlight which was now gilding the outstanding stones of the cliffs, and still his mind was set upon the bride, and his meeting with the mother of the yet unborn baby, and with the three women with their freshness and fairness, did somehow turn his thoughts the more upon her, since she was the woman who was to be his amongst all women, for she was far fairer than any one of them, and through all manner of life, and through all kinds of deeds would he be with her, and no more of her fairness and kindness than any other could. And him seemed he could see pictures of her, and of him amidst all these deeds and ways. Now he went very swiftly, for he was eager, though he knew not for what, and he thought but little of the things on which his eyes fell. He met none else on the road till he was come to Wild Lake's Way, though he saw folk enough down in the meadows. He was soon amidst the first of the trees, and without making any stay, set his face east and somewhat north, that is, toward the slopes that led to the great mountains. He said to himself aloud, as he wended the wood, Strange, yester even I thought much of the wood, and I set my mind on not going thither, and this morning I thought nothing of it, and here I am amidst its trees, and wending towards its innermost. His way was easy at first, because the wood for a little space was all of beech, so that there was no undergrowth, and he went lightly betwixt the tall, grey, and smooth boles. Albeit his heart was not so gay as it was in the dale amidst the sunshine. After a while the beech wood grew thinner, and at last gave out altogether, and he came into a space of rough, broken ground, with naught but a few scrubby oaks and thorn-bushes growing thereon, here and there. The sun was high in the heavens now, and shone brightly down on the waste, though there were a few white clouds high up above him. The rabbit scuttled out of the grass before him. Here and there he turned aside from a stone on which lay coiled an adder sunning itself. Now and again, both heart and hind bounded away from before him, or a sounder of wild swine ran grunting away toward closer covert, but naught did he see but the common sights and sounds of the woodland. Nor did he look for aught else, for he knew this part of the woodland indifferent well. He held on over this treeless waste for an hour or more, when the ground began to be less rugged, and he came upon trees again, but thinly scattered, oak and ash and hornbeam not right great, with thickets of holly and blackthorn between them. The set of the ground was still steadily up to the east and northeast, and he followed it as one who wendeth an assured way. At last before him seemed to rise a wall of trees and thicket, but when he drew near to it, lo, an opening in a certain place, and a little path as if men were wont to thread the tangle of the wood thereby, though hitherto he had noted no slot of men, nor any sign of them, since he had plunged into the deep of the beech wood. He took the path as one who needs must, and went his ways, as it led. In sooth it was well nigh blind, but he was a deft woodsman, and by means of it skirted many a close thicket that had otherwise stayed him. So on he went, and though the boughs were close enough overhead, and the sun came through but in flecks, he judged that it was growing weary towards noon, and he wotted well that he was growing a-weary, for he had been long afoot, and the more part of the time on a rough way, or breasting a slope which was at whiles steep enough. At last the track led him, skirting about an exceeding close thicket, into a small clearing, through which ran a little woodland rill, amidst rushes and dead leaves. There was a low mound near the eastern side of this woodlawn, as though there had once been a dwelling of man there, but no other sign or slot of man was there. So face of God made stay in that place, casting himself down beside the rill to rest him, and eat and drink somewhat. 
whatever thoughts had been with him through the wood, and they had been many, concerning his house and his name, and his father and the journey he might make to the cities of the Westland, and what was to befall him when he was wedded, and what war or trouble should be on his hands. All this was now mingled together, and confused by this rest amidst his weariness. He laid down his scrip and drew his meat from it, and ate what he would, and dipping his gilded beaker into the brook, drank water smacking of the damp musty savour of the woodland, and then his head sank back on a little mound in the short turf, and he fell asleep at once. A long dream he had in short space, and therein were blent his thoughts of the morning with the deeds of yesterday, and other matters long forgotten in his waking hours came back to his slumber in unordered confusion, all which made up for him pictures clear, but of little meaning, save that as oft befalls in dreams, whatever he was a-doing he felt himself belated. When he awoke, smiling at something strange in his gone-by dream, he looked up to the heavens, thinking to see signs of the even at hand, for he seemed to have been dreaming so long. The sky was thinly overcast by now, but by his wonted woodcraft he knew the whereabouts of the sun, and that it was scant an hour after noon. He sat there till he was wholly awake, and then drank once more of the woodland water, and he said to himself, but out loud, for he was fain of the sound of a man's voice, though it were but his own, What is mine errand hither? Whither wend I? What shall I have done to-morrow that I have hitherto left undone? Or what manner of man shall I be then, other than I am now? Yet though he said the words, he failed to think the thought, or it left him in a moment of time, and he thought but of the bride and her kindness. Yet that abode with him but a moment, and again he saw himself, and those two women on the highway edge, and long coat, lingering on the slope below, kissing his kisses on her hands, and he was sorry that she desired him overmuch, for she was a fair woman and a friendly. But all that also flowed from him at once, and he had no thought in him, but that he also desired something that he lacked. And this was a burden to him, and he rose up frowning, and said to himself, Am I become a mere sport of dreams, whether I sleep or wake? I will go backward or forward, but will think no more. Then he ordered his gear again, and took the path onward and upward toward the great mountains, and the track was even fainter than before for a while, so that he had to seek his way diligently. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of the Roots of the Mountains」by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Face of God falls in with menfolk on the mountain. Now he plodded on steadily, and for a long time the forest changed but little, and of wild things he saw only a few of those that love the closest covert. The ground still went up and up, though its wilds were hollows and steeper bents out of them again, and the half blind path or slot still led past the close thickets and fallen trees, and he made way without let or hindrance. At last, once more, the wood began to thin, and the trees themselves to be smaller and gnarled and ill-grown. Therewithal the day was waning, and the sky was quite clear again as the afternoon grew into a fair autumn evening. Now the trees failed altogether, and the slope, grown steeper, was covered with heather and ling, and looking up, he saw before him, quite near by seeming, in the clear even, though indeed they were yet far away, the snowy peaks flushed with the sinking sun against the frosty dark grey eastern sky, and below them the dark rock mountains, and below these again, and nigh to him indeed, the fells covered with pine woods, and looking like a wall to the heaths he trod. He stayed a little while and turned his head to look at the way whereby he had come, but that way a swell of the oak forest hid everything but the wood itself, making a wall behind him as the pine wood made a wall before. There came across him then a sharp memory of the boding woods which Stoneface had spoken last night, and he felt as if he were now indeed within the trap. But presently he laughed and said, 
I am a fool. This comes of being alone in the dark wood and the dismal waste, after the merry faces of the dale had swept away my foolish musings of yesterday and the day before. Lo, here I stand, a man of the face, sword and axe by my side. If death come, it can but come once, and if I fear not death, what shall make me afraid? The gods hate me not and will not hurt me, and they are not ugly, but beauteous. Therewith he strode on again, and soon came to a place where the ground sank into a shallow valley, and the ling gave place to grass for a while, and there were tall old pines scattered about, and betwixt them grey rocks. This he passed through, climbing a steep bent out of it, and the pines were all about him now, though growing wide apart, till at last he came to where they thickened into a wood, not very close, where through he went merrily, singing to himself and swinging his spear. He was soon through this wood, and came on to a wide, well-grassed wood lawn, hedged by the wood aforesaid, on three sides, but sloping up slowly towards the black wall of the thicker pine wood, on the fourth side, and about half a furlong over thwart and end long. The sun had set while he was in the last wood, but it was still broad daylight on the wood lawn, and as he stood there, he was ware of a house under the pine wood on the other side, built long and low, much like the houses of the woodland carls, but rougher fashioned and of unhewn trees. He gazed on it and said aloud to himself, as his wont was, Marvellous! Here is a dwelling of man, scarce a day's journey from Burgstead, yet have I never heard tell of it. May happen some of the woodland carls have built it, and are on some errand of hunting peltries up in the mountains, or maybe are seeking copper and tin among the rocks. Well, at least let us go see what manner of men dwell there, and if they are minded for a guest to-night, for fain were I of a bed beneath a roof, and of a board with strong meat and drink on it. Therewith he set forward, not heeding much that the wood he had passed through was hard on his left hand. But he had gone but twenty paces when he saw a red thing at the edge of the wood, and then a glitter and a spear came whistling forth, and smote his own spear so hard close to the steel that it flew out of his hand. Then came a great shout, and a man clad in a scarlet kirtle ran forth on him. Face of God had his axe in his hand in a twinkling, and ran at once to meet his foe, but the man had the hill on his side as he rushed on with a short sword in his hand. Axe and sword clashed together for a moment of time, and then both the men rolled over on the grass together, and face of God, as he fell, deemed that he heard the shrill cry of a woman. Now face of God found that he was the nethermost, for if he was strong, yet was his foe stronger. The axe had flown out of his hand also, while the strange man still kept a hold of his short sword, and presently, though he still struggled all he could, he saw the man draw back his hand to smite with the said sword, and at that nick of time the foeman's knee was on his breast, his left hand was doubled back behind him, and his right wrist was gripped hard in the stranger's left hand. Even therewith his ears, sharpened by the coming death, heard the sound of footsteps and fluttering raiment drawing near. Something dark came between him and the sky. There was the sound of a great stroke, and the big man loosened his grip and fell off him to one side. Face of God leapt up and ran to his axe and got hold of it, but turning round found himself face to face with a tall woman, holding in her hand a stout staff like the limb of a tree. She was calm and smiling, though forsooth it was she who had stricken the stroke and stayed the sword from his throat. His hand and axe dropped down to his side when he saw what it was that faced him, and that the woman was young and fair. So he spake to her and said, What aileth, maiden? Is this man thy foe? Doth he oppress thee? Shall I slay him? She laughed and said, Thou art open-handed in thy proffers. He might have asked the like concerning thee but a minute ago. Yea, yea, said Goldmane, laughing also, but he asked it not of thee. That is sooth, she said, but since thou hast asked me, I will tell thee that if thou slay him, it will be my harm as well as his, and in my country a man that taketh a gift is not wont to break the giver's head with it straightway. The man is my brother, O stranger, and presently, if thou wilt, thou mayst be eaten at the same board with him, and if thou wilt, thou mayst go thy ways unhurt into the wood. But I had liefer of the twain, that thou wert in our house to-night, for thou hast a wrong against us. Her voice was sweet and clear, 
and she spake the last words kindly and drew somewhat nigher to goldmain therewithal the smitten man sat up and put his hand to his head and quoth he angry is my sister good it is to wear the helm abroad when she shaketh the nut trees nay said she it is thy look that thou wert bareheaded else i have been forced to smite thee on the face thou churl since when hath it been our wont to thrust knives into a guest who is come of great kin a man of gentle heart and fair face come hither and hansel him self-doom for thy fool's onset the man rose to his feet and said well sister least said soon is mended a clout on the head is worse than a woman's chiding but since ye have given me one ye may forbear the other therewith he drew near to them he was a very big made man most stalwart with dark red hair and a thin pointed beard his nose was straight and fine his eyes grey and well opened but somewhat fierce withal yet was he in no wise evil looking he seemed some thirty summers old he was clad in a short scarlet kirtle a goodly garment with a hood of like web pulled off his head on to his shoulders he bore a great gold ring on his left arm and a collar of gold came down on to his breast from under his hood as for the woman she was clad in a long white linen smock and over it a short gown of dark blue woollen and she had skin shoes on her feet now the man came up to face of god and took his hand and said i deem thee a foe and i may not have over many foes alive but it seems that thou art to be a friend and that is well and better so herewith i hansel thee self doom in the matter of the onslaught then face of god laughed and said the doom is soon given forth against the tumble on the grass i set the clout on the head there is naught left over to pay to any man's son said the scarlet clad man belike by thine eyes thou art a true man and wilt not bewray me now is there no foreman here but rather may be a friend both now and in time to come therewith he cast his arms about face of god and kissed him but face of god turned about to the woman and said is the peace wholly made she shook her head and said soberly nay thou art too fair for a woman to kiss he flushed red as his wont was when a woman praised him yet was his heart full of pleasure and well liking but she laid her hand on his shoulder and said now it is for thee to choose betwixt the wild wood and the hall and whether thou wilt be a guest or a wayfarer this night as she touched him there took hold of him a sweetness of pleasure he had never felt erst and he answered i will be thy guest and not thy stranger come then she said and took his hand in hers so that he scarce felt the earth under his feet as they went all three together toward the house in the gathering dusk while eastward where the peaks of the great mountains dipped was a light that told of the rising of the moon End of chapter five Chapter six of the Roots of the Mountains by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of Face of God and Those Mountain Dwellers. A yard or two from the threshold, Goldmane hung back a moment, entangled in some such misgiving as a man is wont to feel when he is just about to do some new deed, but is not yet deep into the story. His new friends noted that, for they smiled each in their own way and the woman drew her hand away from his face of god held out his still as though to take hers again and therewithal he changed countenance and said as though he had stayed but to ask that question tell me thy name tall man and thou fair woman tell me thine for how can we talk together else the man laughed outright and said the young chieftain thinks that this house also should be his nay young man i know what is in thy thought be not ashamed that thou art weary, and be assured, which shall hurt thee no more than thou hast been hurt. Now as to my name, the name that was born with me is gone, the name that was given me hath been taken from me. Now I belike must give myself a name, and that shall be wild wearer. But it may be that thou thyself shall one day give me another, and call me guest. His sister gazed at him solemnly as he spoke, and face of God, beholding her the while, deemed that her beauty grew and grew till she seemed as awful as a goddess and into his mind it came that this over-strong man and over-lovely woman 
were naught mortal, and they withal dealing with him as father and mother deal with a wayward child. Then for a moment his heart failed him, and he longed for the peace of Burgdale and even the lonely wood, but therewith she turned to him and let her hand come into his again, and looked kindly on him and said, And as for me, call me the friend, the name is good and will serve for many things. He looked down from her face, and his eyes lighted on her hand, and when he noted even amid the evening dusk how fair and lovely it was fashioned, and yet as though it were deft in the crafts that the daughters of menfolk use, his fear departed, and the pleasure of his longing filled his heart, and he drew her hand to him to kiss it, but she held back. Then he said, It is the custom of the dale to all women. So she let him kiss her hand, heeding the kiss nothing, and said soberly, Then art thou of Burgdale, and if it were lawful to guess, I would say that thy name is Face of God, of the house of the face. Even so it is, said he, but in the dale those that love me do mostly call me Goldmane. It is well named, she said, and seldom wilt thou be called otherwise, for thou wilt be well beloved. But come in now, Goldmane, for night is at hand, and here have we meat and lodging, such as an hungry and weary man might take, though we be broken people, dwellers in the waste. Therewith she led him gently over the threshold into the hall, and it seemed to him as if she were the fairest and the noblest of all the queens of ancient story. When he was in the house he looked and saw that, rough as it was, without, it lacked not fairness within. The floor was of hard-trodden earth strewn with pine twigs, and with here and there brown bearskins laid on it. There was a standing table near the upper end athwart the hall, and a dais beyond that, but no end-long table. Goldmane looked to the shut-beds, and saw that they were large and fair, though there were but a few of them, and at the lower end was a loft for a sleeping chamber, dight very fairly with broidered cloths. The hangings on the walls, though they left some places bare which were hung with fresh boughs, were fairer than any he had ever seen, so that he deemed that they must come from far countries and the city of cities. Therein were images wrought of warriors and fair women of old time, and their dealings with the gods and the giants and wondrous whites, and he deemed that this was the story of some great kindred, and that their token and sign of their banner must needs be the wood-wolf, for everywhere was it wrought in these pictured webs. Perforce he looked long and earnestly at these fair things, for the hall was not dark yet, because the brands on the hearth were flaming their last and when Wildwearer beheld him so gazing, he stood up and looked too for a moment, and then smote his right hand on the hilt of his sword, and turned away, and strode up and down the hall, as one in angry thought. But the woman, even the friend, bestirred herself for the service of the guest, and brought water for his hands and feet, and when she had washed him, bore him the wine of welcome, and drank to him, and bade him drink and he all the while was shamefaced, for it was to him as if one of the ladies of the heavenly burg were doing him service. Then she went away by a door at the lower end of the hall, and Wildwearer came and sat down by Goldmane, and fell a-talking with him about the ways of the dalesmen and their garths, and the pastures and growths thereof, and what temper the carls themselves were of, which were good men, which were ill, which was loved and which scorned no otherwise than if he had been the good man of some neighbouring dale. And Goldmane told him what so he knew, for he saw no harm therein. After a while the outer door opened, and there came in a woman of some five-and-twenty winters, trimly and strongly built. Short-skirted she was, and clad as a hunter, with a bow in her hand and a quiver at her back. She unslung a pouch which she emptied at Wildwearer's feet of a leash of hairs, and two brace of mountain grouse. A face of God she took but little heed. Said Wildwearer, This is good for tomorrow, not for today. The meat is well nigh on the board. Then Goldmane smiled, for he called to his mind his homecoming of yesterday. But the woman said, The fault is not mine. She told me of the coming guest but three hours agone. Aye, said Wildwearer. She looked for a guest then. 
Yea, certs, said the woman. Else why I went aforth this afternoon, as wearied as I was with yesterday. Well, well, said Wildwearer, get to thy due work and go play. I meddle not with meat, and for thee all jests are as bitter earnest. And with thee, chief, she said, it is no otherwise. Surely I am made on thy model. Thy tongue is longer, friend, said he. Now tarry if thou wilt, and if the supper's service craveth thee not. She turned away with one keen look at face of God, and departed through the door at the lower end of the hall. By this time the hall was dusk, for there were no candles there, and the hearth-fire was but smouldering. Wildwearer sat silent and musing now, and face of God spake not, for he was deep in wild and happy dreams. At last the lower door opened, and the fair woman came into the hall, with a torch in either hand, after whom came the huntress, now clad in a dark blue kirtle, and an old woman, yet straight and hale, and these twain bore in the victuals and the table-gear. Then the three fell to dighting the board, and when it was all ready, and Goldmane and Wildwearer were set down to it, and with them the fair woman and the huntress, the old woman threw good store of fresh brands on the hearth, so that the light shone into every corner, and even therewith the outer door opened, and four more men entered, whereof one was old but big and stalwart, the other three young. They were all clad roughly in sheep-brown weed, but had helms upon their heads and spears in their hands, and great swords girt to their sides, and they seemed doughty men and ready for battle. One of the young men cast down by the door the carcass of a big horned mountain sheep, and then they all trooped off to the outpower by the lower door, and came back presently, fairly clad and without their weapons. Wildwearer nodded to them kindly, and they sat at table paying no more heed to face of God than to cast him a nod for salutation. Then said the old woman to them, Well, lads, have you been doing or sleeping? Sleeping, mother, said one of the young men, as was but due after last night was and to-morrow shall be said the huntress hold thy peace woodwise and let thy tongue help thy teeth to deal with thy meat for this is not the talking hour nay bome said another of the swains since here is a new man now is the time to talk to him said the huntress tis thine hands that talk best would want it is not they that shall bring thee to shame spake the third what have we to do with shame here far away from dooms and doomers and elders and wardens and guarded castles. If the new man listeth to speak, let him speak, or to fight, then let him. It shall ever be man to man. Then spake the old woman, Son, wood wicked, hold thy peace and forget the steel that ever eggeth thee on to draw. Therewith she set the last matters on the board, while the three swains sat and eyed Goldmane somewhat fiercely, now that words had stirred them, and he had sat there saying nothing, as one who was better than they, and contemned them. But now spake Wildwearer, Whoso hungereth, let him eat, whoso would slumber, let him to bed, but he would bicker, he must needs be with me. Here is a man of the dale, who hath sought the wood in peace, and hath found us. His hand is ready, and his heart is guileless. If ye fear him, run away to the wood, and come back when he's gone but none shall mock him while I sit by. Now, lads, be merry and blithe with the guest. Then the young men greeted Goldmane, and the old man said, Art thou of Burgstead? Then wilt thou be of the house of the face, and thy name will be face of God, for that man is called the fairest of the dale, and there shall be none fairer than thou. Face of God laughed and said, There be but few mirrors in Burgdale, and I have no mind to journey west of the cities to see what manner of man I be. That were ill husbandry. But now I have heard the names of the three swains. Tell me thy name, father. Spake the huntress. This is my father's brother, and his name is Woodfather, or you shall call him so. And I am called Bome, because I shoot well in the bow. And this old Carline is my Eames wife. And now be like me mother, if I need one. But thou, fair-faced dalesman, little dost thou need a mirror in the dale, so long as women abide there, for their faces shall be instead of mirrors to tell thee whether thou be fair and lovely. 
thereat they all laughed and fell to their victual which was abundant of wood venison and mountain fowl but of bread was no great plenty wine lacked not and that of the best and goldmain noted that the cups and the apparel of the horns and mazers were not of gold nor gilded copper but of silver and he marvelled thereat for in the dale silver was rare so they ate and drank and goldmain looked over on the friend and spake much with her and he deemed her friendly indeed and she seemed most pleased when he spoke best and led him on to do so wildwearer was but of few words and those somewhat harsh yet was he as a man striving to be courteous and blithe but of the others bome was the greatest speaker wildwearer called healths to the sun and the moon and the hosts of heaven to the gods of the earth to the woodwhites and to the guest other healths also he called the meaning of which was dark to goldmain to wit the jaws of the wolf the silver arm the red hand the golden bushel and the ragged sword but when he asked the friend concerning these names what they might signify she shook her head and answered not at last wildwearer cried out now lads the night weareth and the guest is weary therefore whoso of you hath in him any minstrelsy now let him make it for later on it shall be over late then arose woodwont and went to his shut bed and groped therein and took out from it a fiddle in its case and he opened the case and drew from it a very goodly fiddle and he stood on the floor amidst of the hall and bome his cousin with him and he laid his bow on the fiddle and woke up song in it and when it was well awake she fell a singing and he to answering her song and at the last all they of the house sang together and this is the meaning of the words which they sang now is the rain upon the day and every water's wide why busk ye then to wear the way and whither will ye ride our kine are on the eyot still the eddies lap them round all dykes the wind-worn waters fill and waneth grass and ground or ride ye to the river's brim in war we'd fare to see or winter waters will ye swim in hauberks to the knee wild is the day and dim with rain our sheep are warded ill the wood wolves gather for the plain their ravening moors to fill nay what is this and what have ye a hunter's band to bear the banner of our battle glee the skulking wolves to scare or oh, women when we wend our ways to deal with death and dread the banner of our father's days must flap the wind o'er head ah for the maidens that ye leave who now shall save the hay what grooms shall kiss our lips at eve when june hath mastered may the wheat is won the seed is sown here toileth many a maid and here the hay knee-deep hath grown your grooms the grass shall wade then fair befall the mountain side whereon the place shall be and fair befall the summer tide that whoso lives shall see face of god thought the song goodly but to the others it was well known then said woodfather o oh, foster son thy foster brother has sung well for a wood abider but we are deeming that his singing shall be but as a starling to a throstle matched against thy new-come guest therefore dalesman sing us a song of the dale and if ye will let it be of gardens and pleasant houses of stone and fair damsels therein and swains with them who toil not over much for a scant livelihood as do they of the waste whose heads may not be seen in the holy places said goldmain father it is ill to set the words of a lonely man afar from his kin against the song that cometh from the heart of a noble house yet may i not gainsay thee but will sing to thee what i may call to mind and it is called the song of the ford therewith he sang in a sweet and clear voice and this is the meaning of his words in haytide through the day new-born across the meads we come our hauberks brush the blossomed corn a furlong short of home ere yet the gables we behold forth flashes the red sun and smites our fallow helms and cold though all the fights be done in this last mead of mowing grass sweet doth the clover smell crushed neath our feet red with the pass where hell was blent with hell 
and now the willowy stream is nigh down wend we to the ford no shafts across its fishes fly nor flasheth there a sword but lo what gleameth on the bank across the water wan as when our blood the mouse ear drank and red the river ran nay hasten to the ripple clear look at the grass beyond lo ye of the dainty band and dear of maidens fair and fond lo how they needs must take the stream the water hides their feet on fair kind arms the gold doth gleam and midst the ford we meet up through the garden two and two and on the flowers we drip their wet feet kiss the morning dew as lip lies close to lip here now we sing here now we stay by these grey walls we tell the love that lived from out the fray the love that fought and fell when he was done they all said that he had sung well and that the song was sweet yet did wildwearer smile somewhat and bome said outright soft is the song and hath been made by lads and minstrels rather than by warriors nay kinswoman said woodfather thou art hard to please the guest is kind and hath given us what i asked for and i give him all thanks therefore face of god smiled but he heeded little what they said for as he sang he had noted that the friend looked kindly on him and he thought he saw that once or twice she put out her hand as if to touch him but drew it back again each time she spake after a little and said here now hath been a stream of song running betwixt the mountain and the dale even as doth a river and this is good to come between our dreams of what hath been and what shall be then she turned to goldmane and said to him scarce loud enough for all to hear herewith i bid thee good night o dalesman and this other word i have to thee heed not what befalleth in the night but sleep thy best for naught shall be to thy scathe and when thou wakest in the morning if we are yet here it is well but if we are not then abide us no long while but break thy fast on the victual thou wilt find upon the board and so depart and go thy ways home and yet thou mayst look to it to see us again before thou diest therewith she held out her hand to him and he took it and kissed it and she went to her chamber aloft at the lower end of the hall and when she was gone once more he had a deeming of her that she was of the kindred of the gods at her departure him seemed that the hall grew dull and small and smoky and the night seemed long to him and doubtful the coming of the day End of chapter six chapter seven of the roots of the mountains by william morris this librivox recording is in the public domain face of god talketh with the friend on the mountain so now went all men to bed and face of god's shut bed was over against the outer door and toward the lower end of the hall and on the panel about it hung the weapons and shields of men fair was that chamber and roomy and the man was weary despite his eagerness so that he went to sleep as soon as his head touched the pillow but within a while he deemed about two hours after midnight he was awaked by the clattering of the weapons against the panel and the sound of men's hands taking them down and when he was fully awake he heard withal men going up and down the house as if on errands but he called to mind what the friend had said to him and he did not so much as turn himself toward the hall for he said belike these men are outlaws and wolves of the holy places yet by seeming they are good fellows and naught churlish nor have i to do with taking up the feud against them i will abide the morning yet me seemeth that she drew me hither for what cause therewith he fell asleep again and dreamed no more but when he awoke the sun was shining broad upon the hall floor and he sat up and listened but could hear no sound save the moaning of the wind in the pine boughs and the chatter of the starlings about the gables of the house and the place seemed so exceeding lonely to him that he was in a manner feared by that loneliness then he arose and clad himself and went forth into the hall and gazed about him and at first he deemed indeed that there was no one therein but at last he looked and beheld the upper gable and there underneath the most goodly hanging was the glorious shape of a woman 
sitting on a bench covered over with a cloth of gold and silver and he looked and looked to see if the woman might stir and if she were alive and she turned her head toward him and lo it was the friend and his heart rose to his mouth for wonder and fear and desire for now he doubted whether the other folk were aught save shows and shadows and she the goddess who had fashioned them out of nothing for his bewilderment presently to return to nothing yet whatever he might fear or doubt he went up the hall towards her till he was quite nigh to her and there he stood silent wondering at her beauty and desiring her kindness grey-eyed she was like her brother but her hair the colour of red wheat her lips full and red her chin round her nose fine and straight her hands and all her body fashioned exceeding sweetly and delicately yet not as if she were an image of which the like might be found if the craftsman were but deft enough to make a perfect thing but in such a way that there was none like to her for those that had eyes to behold her as she was and none could ever be made like to her even by such a master craftsman as could fashion a body without a blemish she was clad in a white smock whose hems were broidered with gold wire and precious gems of the mountains and over that a gown woven of gold and silver scarce hath the world such another on her head was a fillet of gold and gems and there were wondrous gold rings on her arms her feet lay bare on the dark grey wolf-skin that was stretched before her she smiled kindly upon his solemn and troubled face and her voice sounded strangely familiar to him coming from all that loveliness as she said hail face of god here am i left alone although i deemed last night that i should be gone with the others therefore am i fain to show myself to thee in fairer array than yesternight for though we dwell in the wild wood afar from the solace of folk yet are we not of thralls blood but come now i bid thee break thy fast and talk with me a little while and then shalt thou depart in peace spake face of god and his voice trembled as he spake what art thou last night i deemed at whiles once and again that thou wert of the gods and now that i behold thee thus that it is broad daylight and of those others is no more to be seen than if they had never lived i cannot but deem that it is even so and that thou comest from the city that shall never perish now if thou be a goddess i have naught to pray thee save to slay me speedily if thou hast a mind for my death but if thou art a woman she broke in gold mane stay thy prayer and hold thy peace for this time lest thou repent when repentance availeth not and this i say because i am none of the gods nor akin to them say far off through the generations as art thou also and all men of goodly kindred now i bid thee eat thy meat since tis ill talking betwixt a full man and a fasting and i have dight it myself with mine own hands for bome and the woodmother went away with the rest three hours before dawn come sit and eat as thou hast a hardy heart as forsooth thou shouldest do if i were a very goddess take heed friend lest i take thee for some damsel of the lower dale arrayed in earl's garments she laughed therewith and leaned toward him and put forth her hand to him and he took it and caressed it and the exceeding beauty of her body and of the raiment which was as it were a part of her and her loveliness made her laughter and her friendly words strange to him as if one did not belong to the other as in a dream it might be nevertheless he did as she bade him and sat at the board and ate while she leaned forward on the arm of her chair and spake to him in a friendly wise and he wondered as she spake that she knew so much of him and his and he kept saying to himself she drew me hither wherefore did she so but she said go main how fareth thy father the alderman is he as good a right as ever he told her yea that ever was his hammer on the iron the copper and the gold and that no right in the dale was as deft as he said she would he not have had thee seek to the cities to see the ways of the outer world yea said he she said thou wert wise to nay say that offer thou shalt have enough to do in the dale and round about it in twelve months time art thou foresighted said he folk have called me so she said but i wot not but the brother hallface how fareth he well said he to my deeming he is the sword of our house 
and the warrior of the dale, if the days were ready for him. And Stoneface, that stark ancient, she said, doth he still love the folk of the dale, and hate all other folks? Nay, he said, I know not that, but I know that he loveth us, and above all me and my father. Again she spake, How fareth the bride, the fair maid to whom thou art affianced? As she spake, it was to him as if his heart was stricken cold, but he put a force upon himself, and neither reddened nor whitened, nor changed countenance in any way. So he answered, She was well the eve of yesterday. Then he remembered what she was, and her beauty and valour, and he constrained himself to say, Each day she groweth fairer. There is no man's son and no daughter of woman that does not love her. Yea, the very beasts of the field and fold love her. The friend looked at him steadily and spake no word, but a red flush mounted to her cheeks and brow, and changed her face, and he marvelled thereat, for still he misdoubted that she was a goddess. But it passed away in a moment, and she smiled and said, Guest, thou seemest to wonder that I know concerning thee and the dale and thy kindred, but now shalt thou wot that I have been in the dale once and again, and my brother oftener still and that I have seen thee before yesterday. That is marvellous, quoth he, for sure am I that I have not seen thee. Yet thou hast seen me, she said, yet not altogether as I am now. And therewith she smiled on him friendly. How is this? said he. Art thou a skin-changer? Yea, in a fashion, she said. Hearken, dost thou perchance remember a day of last summer when there was a market holden in Burgstead? and there stood in the way over against the house of the face a tall old carl who was trucking deerskins for diverse gear and with him was a queen tall and dark-skinned somewhat well liking her hair bound up in a white quaff so that none of it could be seen by the token that she had a large stone of mountain blue set in silver stuck in the said quaff as she spoke she set her hand to her bosom and drew something from it and held forth her hand to Goldmane, and lo, amidst the palm, the great blue stone set in silver. Wondrous as a dream is this, said Face of God, for these twain I remember well, and what followed. She said, I will tell thee that. There came a man of the shepherd folk, drunk or foolish, or both, who began to chaffer with the big carl. But ever on the queen were his eyes set, and presently he put forth his hand to clip her whereon the big carl hove up his fist and smote him so that he fell to earth nosling then ran the folk together to hale off the stranger and help the shepherd and it was like that the stranger should be mishandled then there thrust through the press a young man with yellow hair and grey eyes who cried out fellows let be the stranger had the right of it this is no matter to make a quarrel or a court case of let the market go on the man had made a true folk so when the folk heard the young man and his bidding, they forbore, and let the carl and the queen be, and the shepherd went his ways a little hurt. Now then, who was this young man? Quoth Goldmane, It was even I, and, me seemeth, it was no great deed to do. Yea, she said, and the big carl was my brother, and the tall queen, it was myself. How then, said he, for she was as dark-skinned as a dwarf, and thou so bright and fair. She said, Well, if the woods are good for nothing else, yet are they good for the growing of herbs, and I know the craft of simpling. And with one of these herbs had I stained my skin and my brother's also, and it showed the darker beneath the white quaff. Yea, said he, but why must ye needs fare in feigned shapes? Ye would have been welcome guests in the dale, howsoever ye had come. I may not tell thee hereof as now, said she, said Goldmane, yet thou mayst belike tell me wherefore it was that thy brother desired to slay me yesterday, if he knew me, who I was. Goldmane, she said, thou art not slain, so little story need be made of that. For the rest, belike he knew thee not at that moment. So it falls with us, that we look to see foes rather than friends in the wild woods. Many uncouth things are therein. Moreover, I must tell thee of my brother that whiles he is as the stalled bull late let loose, and nothing is good to him save battle and onset, and then he is blind, and knows not friend from foe. Said Face of God, 
thou hast asked of me and mine wilt thou not tell me of thee and thine nay she said not as now thou must betake thee to the way whither wert thou wending when thou happenst upon us he said i know not i was seeking something but i knew not what meseemeth that now i have found it art thou for the great mountains seeking gems she said ye go not thither to-day for who knoweth what thou shalt meet there that shall be thy foe he said nay nay i have naught to do but to abide here as long as i may looking upon thee and hearkening to thy voice her eyes were upon his but yet she did not seem to see him and for a while she answered not and still he wondered that mere word should come from so fair a thing for whether she moved foot or hand or knee or turned this way or that each time she stirred it was a caress to his very heart he spake again may i not abide here a while what scathe may be in that it is not so she said thou must depart and that straightway lo there lieth thy spear with which the wood mother hath brought in from the waste take thy gear to thee and wend thy ways have patience i will lead thee to the place where we first met and there give thee farewell therewith she arose and he also perforce and when they came to the doorway she stepped across the threshold and then turned back and gave him her hand and so led him forth the sun flashing back from her golden raiment together they went over the short grey grass of that hillside till they came to the place where he had arisen from that wrestle with her brother there she stayed him and said this is the place here we must part but his heart failed him and he faltered in his speech as he said when shall i see thee again wilt thou slay me if i seek to thee hither once more hearken she said autumn is now a dying into winter let winter and its snows go past nor seek to me hither for me thou shouldst not find but thy death thou mightest well fall in with and i would not that thou shouldst die when winter is gone and spring is on the land if thou hast not forgotten us thou shalt meet us again yet shalt thou go further than this woodland hall in shadowy vale shalt thou seek to me then and there will i talk with thee and where said he is shadowy vale for thereof i have never heard tell she said the token when it cometh to thee shall show thee thereof and the way thither art thou a babbler gold mane he said i have won no prize for babbling hitherto she said if thou listest to babble concerning what hath befallen thee on the mountain so do and repent it once only that is thy life long why should i say any word thereof said he dost thou not know the sweetness of such a tale untold he spake as one who is somewhat wrathful and she answered humbly and kindly well is that bide thou the token that shall lead thee to shadowy vale farewell now she drew her hand from his and turned and went her way swiftly to the house he could not choose but gaze on her as she went glittering bright and fair in that great place of the mountains till the dark doorway swallowed up her beauty then he turned away and took the path through the pine woods muttering to himself as he went what things have i done now that hitherto i had not done what manner of man am i to-day other than the man i was yesterday End of chapter 7chapter eight of the roots of the mountains by william morris this librivox recording is in the public domain face of god cometh home again to burgstead face of god went back through the wood by the way he had come paying little heed to the things about him for whatever he thought of strayed not one whit from the image of the fair woman of the mountain side he went through the wood swiftlier than yesterday and made no stay for noon or aught else nor did he linger on the road when he was come into the dale either to speak to any or to note what they did so he came to the house of the face about dusk and found no man within the hall either carl or queen so he cried out on the folk and there came in a damsel of the house whom he greeted kindly and she him again he bade her bring the washing-water and she did so and washed his feet and his hands 
She was a fair maid enough, as were most in the dale, but he heeded her little, and when she was done he kissed not her cheek for her pains, as his wont was, but let her go her ways unthanked. But he went to his shut-bed, and opened his chest, and drew fair raiment from it, and did off his wood-gear, and did on him a goodly scarlet kirtle fairly broidered, and a collar with gems of price therein, and other braveries. And when he was so attired, he came out into the hall, and there was old Stoneface standing by the hearth, which was blazing brightly with fresh brands, so that things were clear to see. Stoneface noted Goldmane's gay raiment, for he was not wont to wear such attire, save on the feasts and high days when he behoved to. So the old man smiled and said, Welcome back from the wood, but what is it? Hast thou been wedded there? Or who hath made thee earl and king? Said Face of God, Foster father, sooth it is that I have been to the wood, but there have I seen naught of manfolk worse than myself. Now as to my raiment, needs must I keep it from the moth, and I am weary withal, and this kirtle is light and easy to me. Moreover, I look to see the bride here again, and I would pleasure her with the sight of gay raiment upon me. Nay, said Stoneface, hast thou not seen some woman in the wood arrayed like the image of a god? And hath she not bidden thee thus to worship her to-night? For I know that such whites be in the wood, and that such is their want. Said Goldmane, I worship naught save the gods and the fathers, nor saw I in the wood any such as thou sayest. Therewith Stoneface shook his head, but after a while he said, Art thou for the wood to-morrow? Nay, said Goldmane angrily, knitting his brows. The morrow of to-morrow, said Stoneface, is the day when we look to see the Westland merchants. After all, wilt thou not go hence with them when they wend their ways back before the first snows fall? Nay, said he, I have no mind to it, Fosterer. Cease egging me on here too. Then Stoneface shook his head again, and looked on him long and muttered, To the wood wilt thou go to-morrow or next day, or some day when doomed is thine undoing. Therewith entered the service and torches, and presently after came the alderman with Hallface, and Ironface greeted his son, and said to him, Thou hast not hit the time to do on thy gay raiment, for the bride will not be here to-night. She bideth still at the feast at the apple-tree house. Or wilt thou be there, son? Nay, said Face of God, I am over-weary, and as for my raiment, it is well. It is for thine honour and the honour of the name. So to table they went, and Iron Face asked his son of his ways again, and whether he was quite fixed in his mind not to go down to the plain and the cities. For, said he, the morrow of to-morrow shall the merchants be here, and this were great news for them if the son of the alderman should be their faring fellow back. But Face of God answered without any haste or heat, Nay, father, it may not be. Fear not, thou shalt see that I have a good will to work and live in the dale. And in good sooth, though he was a young man and loved mirth and the ways of his own will, he was a stalwart workman, and few could mow a match with him in the hay-month and win it, or fell trees as certainly and swiftly, or drive as straight and clean a furrow through the stiff land of the lower dale, and in other matters also was he deft and sturdy. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of the Roots of the Mountains by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Those brethren fare to the yew wood with the bride. Next morning, face of God dight himself for work and took his axe, for his brother Hallface had bidden him go down with him to the yew wood and cut timber there, since he of all men knew where to go straight to the sticks that would quarter best for bow staves whereas the older man had the right of hewing in that wood. So they went forth, those brethren, from the house of the face, but when they were gotten to the gate, who should be there but the bride awaiting them, and she with an ass, duly saddled for bearing the yew sticks because Hallface had told her that he and belike Goldmane were going to hew in the wood, and she thought it good to be of the company, 
as oft had befallen erst. When they met, she greeted face of God, and kissed him as her wont was, and he looked upon her, and saw how fair she was, and how kind and friendly were her eyes that beheld him, and how her whole face was eager for him, as their lips parted. Then his heart failed him, when he knew that he no longer desired her, as she did him, and he said within himself, Would that she had been of our nighest kindred! Would that I had had a sister, and that this was she! So the three went along the highway down the dale, and Hallface and the bride talked merrily together and laughed, for she was happy, since she knew that Goldmane had been to the wood, and was back safe, and much as he had been before. So indeed it seemed of him, for though at first he was moody and of few words, yet presently he cursed himself for a marsport, and so fell into the talk, and enforced himself to be merry, and soon he was so indeed, for he thought, she drew me thither, she had a deed for me to do, I shall do the deed and have my reward, soon will the springtide be here, and I shall be a young man yet when it comes. So came they to the place where he had met the three maidens yesterday, there they also turned from the highway, and as they went down the bents, Goldmane could not but turn his eyes on the beauty of the bride, and the lovely ways of her body, but presently, he remembered all that had betid, and turned away again, as one who is noting what it behoves him not to note. And he said to himself, Where art thou, Goldmane? Whose art thou? Yea, even if that had been but a dream that I have dreamed, yet would that this fair woman were my sister. So came they to the yew-wood, and the brethren fell to work, and the bride with them, for she was deft with the axe, and strong with all but at midday they rested on the green slope without the yew-wood and they ate bread and flesh and onions and apples and drank red wine of the dale and while they were resting after their meat the bride sang to them and her song was a lay of time past and here ye have somewhat of it tis over the hill and over the dale men ride from the city fast and far if they may have a soothfast tale true tidings of the host of war and first they hap on men-at-arms all clad in steel from head to foot now tell true tale of the new-come harms and gathered hosts of the mountain root fair sirs from murder carls we flee whose fashion is as the mountain trolls no man can tell how many they be and the voice of their host as the thunder rolls they were weary men at the ending of day but they spurred nor stayed for longer word now ye o merchants whither away what do ye there with the helm and the sword oh we must fight for life and gear for our beasts are spent and our wains are stayed and the host of the mountain men draws near that maketh all the world afraid they left the chapman on the hill and rode through the eve and through the night they rode to have true tidings still and were there on the way when the dawn was bright O oh, damsels fair, what do ye then, to loiter thus upon the way, and have no fear of the mountain men, the host of the carls that strip and slay? O oh, riders weary with the road, come eat and drink on the grass hereby, and lay you down in a fair abode, till the midday sun is broad and high. Then unto you shall we come aback, and lead you forth to the mountain men, to note their plenty and their lack, and have true tidings there and then. "'Tis over the hill and over the dale "'they ride from the mountain fast and far, "'and now have they learned a soothfast tale, "'true tidings of the host of war. "'It was summer-tide and the month of hay, "'and men and maids must fare afield. "'But we saw the place where the bow-staves lay, "'and the hall was hung with spear and shield. "'When the moon was high, we drank in the hall, "'and they drank to the guests and were kind and blithe, "'and they said, Come back when the chestnuts fall, and the wine-carts wend across the hithe. Come oft and o'er again, they said, wander your ways, but we abide, for all the world in the little stead, for wise are we, though the world be wide. Yea, come in arms if ye will, they said, and despite your host shall we abide, for life or death in the little stead, for wise are we, though the world be wide. So she made an end, and looked at the fairness of the dale spreading wide before her, 
and a robin came nigh from out of a thorn bush and sung his song also the sweet herald of coming winter and the lapwings wheeled about black and white above the meadow by the river sending forth their wheedling pipe as they hung above the soft turf she felt the brothers near her and knew their friendliness from of old and she was happy nor had she looked closer at goldmane would she have noted any change in him belike for the meat and the good wine and the fair sunny time and the bride's sweet voice and the ancient song softened his heart while it fed the desire therein so in a while they arose from their rest and did what was left of them of their work and so went back to burgstead through the fair afternoon by seeming all three in all content but yet goldmane as from time to time he looked upon the bride kept saying to himself oh if she had been but my sister sweet had the kinship been End of chapter 9chapter 10 of the roots of the mountains by william morris this librivox recording is in the public domain new tidings in the dale it was three days thereafter that goldmane leading an ass went along the highway to fetch home certain fleeces which were needed for the house from a stead a little west of wild lake but he had gone scant half a mile ere he fell in with a throng of folk going to burgstead they were of the shepherds they had weapons with them and some were clad in coats of fence they went along making a great noise for they were all talking each to each at the same time and seemed very hot and eager to talk about some matter when they saw goldmane and i they stopped and the throng opened as if to let him into their midmost so he mingled with them and they stood in a ring about him and an old man more ill-favoured than it was the wont of the dalesman to be for he was long stooping gaunt and spindle-shanked his hands big and crippled with gout his cheeks were red after an old man's fashion covered with a crimson network like a pippin his lips thin and not well hiding his few teeth his nose long like a snipe's neb in short a shame and a laughing-stock to the folk and a man whom the kindreds had in small esteem and that for good reasons face of god knew him at once for a notable close-fist and starvald fool of the shepherds and his name was now become pennythumb the lean whatever it might once have been so face of god greeted all men and they him again and he said what aileth you neighbours your weapons are bare but i see not that they be bloody what is it good man pennythumb pennythumb did but groan for all answer but a stout carl who stood by with a broad grin on his face answered and said face of god evil tidings be abroad the strong thieves of the wood are astir and some deem that the woodwhites be helping them yea and what is the deed they have done said goldmane said the carl thou knowest penny thumbs aboard yea surely said face of god fair are the water meadows about it great gain of cheese can be gotten thence hast thou been within the house said the carl nay said goldmane then spake pennythumb within is scant gear we gather for others to scatter we make meat for others mouths the carl laughed sooth is that said he that there is little gear therein now for the strong thieves have voided both all and bower and byre and when was that said face of god the night before last said the carl the door was smitten on and when none answered it was broken down yea quoth pennythumb a host entered and they in arms no host was within said the carl naught but pennythumb and his sister and his sister's son and three carls that work for him and one of them rusty to wit was the worst man of the hill country these then the host whereof the good man telleth bound but without doing them any scathe and they ransacked the house and took away much gear yet left some thou liest said pennythumb they took little and left none thereat all men laughed for this seemed to them good game and another man said well neighbour pennythumb if it was so little thou hast done unneighbourly in giving us such a heap of trouble about it 
and they laughed again but the first carl said true is it good man that thou wert exceeding eager to raise the hue and cry after that little when we happed upon thee and the housemates bound in your chairs yesterday morning well alderman's son short is the tale to tell we could not fail to follow the gear and the slot led us into the wood and ill is the going there for us shepherds who are used to the bare downs save rusty who was a good woodsman and lifted the slot for us so he outwent us all and ran out of sight of us so presently we came upon him dead slain with a manslayer's spear in his breast what then could we do but turn back again for now was the wood blind now rusty was dead and we knew not whither to follow the fray and the man himself was but little loss so back we turned and told good man pennythum of all this for we had left him alone in his hall lamenting his gear so we bided to day's morn and have come out now with our neighbour and the spear and the dead corpse of rusty stand aside neighbours and let the alderman's son see it they did so and there was the corpse of a thin-faced tall wiry man somewhat foxy of aspect lying on a hand bier covered with black cloth yea face of god said the carl he is not good to see now he is dead yet alive was he worser but look ye though the man was no good man yet was he of our people and the feud is with us so we would see the alderman and do him wit of the tidings that he may call the neighbours together to seek a blood white for rusty and atonement for the ransacking o what sayest thou have ye the spear that ye found in rusty quoth goldmane yea verily said the carl hither with it neighbours give it to the alderman's son so the spear came into his hand and he looked at it and said this is no spear of the smith's work of the dale as my father will tell you we take but little keep of the forging of spearheads here so that they be well tempered and made so as to ride well on the shaft but this head daintily it is wrought the blood trench as clean and trim as though it were an old sword see you with all this inlaying of runes on the steel it is done with no tin or copper but with very silver and these bands about the shaft be of silver also it is a fair weapon and the owner hath the loss of it greater than his gain in the slaying of rusty and he will have left it in the wound so that he might be known hereafter and that he might be said not to have murdered rusty but to have slain him for how think ye they all said that this seemed like to be but that if the man who had slain rusty were one of the ransackers they might have a blood white of him if they could find him goldmane said that so it was and therewithal he gave the shepherds good speed and went on his way but they came to burgstead and found the alderman and in due time was a court held and a finding uttered and outlawry given forth for the manslaying and the ransacking against certain men unknown as for the spear it was laid up in the house of the face but face of god pondered these matters in his mind for such ransackings there had been none of in late years and he said to himself that his friends of the mountain must have other folk of which the dalesmen knew naught whose gear they could lift or how could they live in that place and he marvelled that they should risk drawing the dalesmen's wrath upon them whereas they of the dale were strong men not easily daunted albeit peaceable enough if not stirred to wrath for in good sooth he had no doubt concerning that spear whose it was and whence it came for that very weapon had been leaning against the panel of his shut-bed the night he slept on the mountain and all the other spears that he saw there were more or less of the same fashion and adorned with silver albeit all that he knew and all that he thought of he kept in his own heart and said nothing of it so wore the autumn into early winter and the westland merchants came in due time and departed without face of god though his father made him that offer one last time he went to and fro about his work in the dale and seemed to most men's eyes nought changed from what he had been but the bride noted that he saw her less often than his wont was and abode with her a lesser space when he met her and she could not think what this might mean nor had she heart to ask him thereof though she was sorry and grieved but rather withdrew her company from him somewhat and when she perceived that he noted it not and made no question of it 
then was she the sorrier but the first winter snow came on with a great storm of wind from the north-east so that no man stirred abroad who was not compelled thereto and those who went abroad risked life and limb thereby next morning all was calm again and the snow was deep but it did not endure long for the wind shifted to the south-west and the thaw came and three days after when folk could fare easily again up and down the dale came tidings to burgstead and the alderman from the lower dale how a house called green tofts had been ransacked there and none knew by whom now the good man of green tofts was little loved of the neighbours he was grasping and overbearing and had often cowed others out of their due he was very cross-grained both at home and abroad his wife had fled from his hand neither did his sons find it good to abide with him therewithal he was wealthy of goods a strong man and a deft man at arms when his sons and his wife departed from him and none other of the dalesmen cared to abide with him he went down into the plain and got thence men to be with him for hire men who were not well seen to in their own land these to the number of twelve abode with him and did his bidding when so it pleased them two more had he who had been slain by good men of the dale for their masterful ways and no blood white had been paid for them because of their ill doings though they had not been made outlaws this man of green tofts was called heartsbane after his father who was a great hunter now the full tidings of the ransacking were these the storm began two hours before sunset and an hour thereafter when it was quite dark for without none could see because the wind was at its height and the drift of snow was hard and full the hall door flew open and at first men thought it had been the wind until they saw in the dimness for all lights but the fire on the hearth had been quenched certain things tumbling in which at first they deemed were wolves but when they took swords and staves against them lo they were met by swords and axes and they saw that the seeming wolves were men with wolf-skins drawn over them so the newcomers cowed them that they threw down their weapons and were bound in their places but when they were bound and had had time to note who the ransackers were they saw that there were but six of them all told who had cowed and bound heartsbane and his twelve masterful men and this they deemed a great shaming to them as might well be so then the stead was ransacked and those wolves took away what they would and went their ways through the fierce storm and none could tell whether they had lived or died in it but at least neither the men nor their prey were seen again nor did they leave any slot for next morning the snow lay deep over everything no doubt had goldmane but that these ransackers were his friends of the mountain but he held his peace abiding till the winter should be over End of chapter 10。Chapter 11 of the Roots of the Mountains by William Morris。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Men make oath at Bergstead on the Holy Boar。A week after the ransacking at Greentoffs, the snow and the winter came on in earnest, and all the dale lay in snow and men went on skids when they fared up and down the dale or on the mountain all was now tidingless till yule over and in burgstead was there feasting and joyance enough and especially at the house of the face was high tide holden and the alderman and his sons and stoneface and all the kindred and all their men sat in glorious attire within the hall and many others were there of the best of the kindreds of burgstead who had been bidden face of god sat between his father and stone face and he looked up and down the tables and the hall and saw not the bride and his heart misgave him because she was not there and he wondered what had befallen and if she were sick of sorrow but iron face beheld him how he gazed about and he laughed for he was exceeding merry that night and fared as a young man then he said to his son whom seekest thou son is there some one lacking face of god reddened as one who lies unused to it and said yea kinsman so it is that i was seeking the bride my kinswoman 
Nay, said Iron Face, call her not kinswoman. There is ill luck, lest it seem that thou art to wed one too nigh thine own blood. Call her the bride only. To thee and to me the name is good. Well, son, desirest thou sorely to see her? Yea, yea, surely, said Face of God. But his eyes went all about the hall still, as though his mind strayed from the place and that home of his. Said Iron Face, Have patience, son. Thou shalt see her anon, and that in such guise as shall please thee. Therewithal came the maidens with the ewers of wine, and they filled all the horns and beakers, then stood by the endlong tables on either side, laughing and talking with the carls and the older women, and the hall was a fair sight to see, for the many candles burned bright, and the fire on the hearth flared up, and those maids were clad in fair raiment, and there was none of them but was comely, and some were fair, and some very fair. The walls also were hung with goodly pictured cloths, and the image of the god of the face looked down smiling terribly from the gable end above the high seat. Thus as they sat, they heard the sound of a horn winded close outside the hall door, and the door was smitten on. Then rose Iron Face, smiling merrily, and cried out, Enter ye, whether ye be friends or foes, for if ye be foemen, yet shall ye keep the holy peace of Yule, unless ye be the foes of all kindreds and nations, and then shall we slay you. Thereat some who knew what was toward laughed, but Goldmane, who had been away from Burgstead some days past, marvelled and knit his brows, and let his right hand fall on his sword-hilt, for this folk, who were of merry ways, were wont to deal diversely with the yuletide customs in the manner of shows, and he knew not that this was one of them. Now was the outer door thrown open, and there entered seven men, whereof two were all armed in bright war-gear, and two bore slug-horns, and two bore up somewhat on a dish, covered over with a piece of red cloth, and the seventh stood before them, all wrapped up in a dark fur mantle. Thus they stood a moment, and when he saw their number, back to Goldmane's heart came the thought of those folk on the mountain, for indeed he was somewhat out of himself for doubt and longing, else would he have deemed that all this was but a yuletide play. Now the men with the slughorns set them to their mouths, and blew a long blast, while the first of the newcomers set hand to the clasps of the fur cloak, and let it fall to the ground, and lo, a woman, exceeding beauteous, clad in glistering raiment of gold and fine web, her hair wreathed with bay, and in her hand a naked sword, with goodly wrought golden hilt, and polished blue gleaming blade. Face of God started up in his seat, and stared like a man new wakened from a strange dream, because for one moment he deemed verily that it was the woman of the mountain, arrayed as he had last seen her, and he cried aloud, The friend, the friend! His father brake out into loud laughter thereat, and clapped his son on the shoulder, and said, Yea, yea, lad, thou mayst well say the friend, for this is thine old playmate, whom thou hast been looking round the hall for, arrayed this eve in such fashion as is meet for her goodliness and her worthiness. Yea, this is the friend indeed. Then waxed face of God as red as blood for shame, and he sat him down in his place again, for now he wotted what was toward, and saw that this fair woman was the bride, but Stoneface from the other side looked keenly on him. Then blew the horn again, and the bride stepped daintily up the hall, and the sweet odour of her raiment went from her about the fire-warm dwelling, and her beauty moved all hearts with love. So stood she at the high table, and those two who bore the burden set it down thereon, and drew off the covering. And lo, there was the holy boar of Yule, on which men were wont to make oath of deeds that they would do in the coming year, according to the custom of their forefathers. Then the bride laid the goodly sword beside the dish, and then went round the table, and sat down betwixt face of God and stone face, and turned kindly to Goldmane, and was glad for now was his fair face as its wont was to be. He in turn smiled upon her, for she was fair and kind, and his fellow for many a day. 
Now the men-at-arms stood each aside the boar, and out from them on each side stood the two hornsmen. Then these blew up again, whereon the alderman stood up and cried, Ye sons of the brave, who have any deed that ye may be desirous of doing, come up, come lay your hand on the sword, and the point of the sword to the holy beast, and swear the oath that lieth on your hearts. Therewith he sat down, and there strode a man up the hall, strong-built and sturdy, but short of stature, black-haired, red-bearded, and ruddy-faced, and he stood on the dais, and took up the sword, and laid its point on the boar, and said, I am Bristler, son of Brightling, a man of the shepherds. Here, by the holy boar, I swear to follow up the ransackers of Pennythum and the slayers of Rusty, and I take this feud upon me, although they be no good men, because I am of the kin, and it falleth to me, since others forbear. And when the court was hallowed hereon, I was away out of the dale and the downs. So help me the warrior and the god of the earth. Then the alderman nodded his head to him kindly, and reached him out a cup of wine, and as he drank, there went up a rumour of praise from the hall, and men said that his oath was manly, and that he was like to keep it, for he was a good man-at-arms, and a stout heart. Then came up three men of the shepherds, and two of the dale, and swore to help Bristler in his feud, and men thought it well sworn. After that came a braggart, a man very gay of his raiment, and swore with many words that if he lived the year through, he would be a captain over men of the plain, and would come back again with many gifts for his friends in the dale. This men deemed foolishly sworn, for they knew the man, so they jeered at him and laughed as he went back to his place, ashamed. Then swore three others oaths not hard to be kept, and men laughed and were merry. At last uprose the alderman, and said, Kinsmen, and good fellows, good days and peaceable are in the dale as now, and of such days little is the story, and little it availeth to swear a deed of daring do. Yet three things I swear by this beast, and first, to gainsay no man's asking if I may perform it, and next, to set right above law, and mercy above custom, and lastly, if the days change, and war cometh to us, or we go out to meet it, I will be no backwarder in the onset than three fathoms behind the foremost. So help me the warrior and the god of the face and the holy earth. Therewith he sat down, and all men shouted for joy of him, and said that it was most like that he would keep his oath. Last of all uprose face of God, and took up the sword and looked at it, and so bright was the blade, that he saw in it the image of the golden braveries which the bride bore, and even some broken image of her face. Then he handled the hilt, and laid the point on the boar, and cried, Hereby I swear to wed the fairest woman of the earth before the year is worn to an end, and that whether the dalesmen gainsay me, or the men beyond the dale. So help me the warrior and the god of the face and the holy earth, Therewith he sat down, and once more men shouted for the love of him and of the bride, and they said he had sworn well and like a chieftain. But the bride noted him that neither were his eyes nor his voice like to their wont as he swore, for she knew him well, and thereat was she ill at ease, for now whatever was new in him was to her a threat of evil to come. Stoneface also noted him, and he knew the young man better than all others save the bride, and he saw withal that she was ill-pleased, and he said to himself, I will speak to my fosterling to-morrow, if I may find him alone. So came the swearing to an end, and they fell on to their meat, and feasted on the boar of atonement, after they had duly given the gods their due share, and the wine went about the hall, and men were merry till they drank the parting cup, and fared to rest in the shut-beds, and where so else they might in the hall and the house, for there were many men there. End of chapter 11「Chapter 12 of the Roots of the Mountains » by William Morris This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Stoneface telleth concerning the woodwhites. Early on the morrow, Goldmane arose and clad himself and went out a doors and over the trodden snow on to the bridge over the weltering water and there betook himself into one of the coins of safety built over the upstream piles there he leaned against the wall and turned his face to the thorpe and fell to pondering on his case and first he thought about his oath and how that he had sworn to wed the mountain woman although his kindred and her kindred should gainsay him yea and herself also great seemed that oath to him yet at the moment he wished he had made it greater and made all the kindred yea and the bride herself sure of the meaning of the words of it and he deemed himself a dastard that he had not done so then he looked round him and beheld the winter and he fell into mere longing that the spring were come and the token from the mountain things seemed too hard for him to deal with and he between a mighty folk and two wayward women and he went nigh to wish that he had taken his father's offer and gone down to the cities and even had he met his bane well were that and as young folk will he set to work making a picture of his deeds there had he been there he showed himself the stricken fight in the plain and the press and the struggle and the breaking of the serried band and himself amidst the ring of foemen doing most valiantly and falling there at last his shield o'er heavy with the weight of foemen's spears for a man to uphold it then the victory of his folk and the lamentation and praise over the slain man of the mountain dales and the burial of the valiant warrior the praising weeping folk meeting him at the city gate laid stark and cold in his arms on the gold-hung garlanded bier there ended his dream and he laughed aloud and said i am a fool all this were good and sweet if i should see it myself and forsooth that is how i am thinking of it as if i still alive should see myself dead and famous then he turned a little and looked at the houses of the thorpe lying dark about the snowy ways under the starlit heavens of the winter morning dark they were indeed and grey save where here and there the half-burned yule fire reddened the windows of a hall or where as in one place the candle of some early waker shone white in a chamber window there was scarce a man astir he deemed and no sound reached him save the crowing of the cocks muffled by their houses and a faint sound of beasts in the byres thus he stood a while his thoughts wandering now till presently he heard footsteps coming his way down the street and turned toward them and lo it was the old man stone face he had seen goldmane go out and had risen and followed him that he might talk with him apart goldmane greeted him kindly though sooth to say he was but half content to see him since he doubted what was verily the case that his foster-father would give him many words counselling him to refrain from going to the wood and this was loathsome to him but he spake and said meseems father that the eastern sky is brightening toward dawn yea quoth stoneface it will be light in an hour said face of god even so said stoneface and a fair day for the morrow of yule said the swain yea said stoneface and what wilt thou do with the fair day wilt thou to the wood maybe father said goldmane hallface and some of the swains are talking of elks up the fells which may be trapped in the drifts and if they go a-hunting them i may go in their company ah son quoth stoneface thou wilt look to see other kind of beasts than elks things may ye fall in with there who may not be impounded in the snow like to elks but can go lightfoot on the top of the soft drift from one place to another said goldmane father fear me not i shall either refrain me from the wood or if i go i shall go to hunt the wood deer with the other hunters but since thou hast come to me tell me more about the wood for thy tales thereof are fair yea said stoneface fair tales of foul things as oft it befalleth in the world hearken now if thou deemest that what thou seekest shall come readier to thy hand because of the winter and the snow thou errest 
for the whites that waylay the bodies and souls of the mighty in the wildwood heed such matters nothing yea and at yuletide are they most abroad and most armed for the fray even such an one have i seen time agone when the snow was deep and the wind was rough and it was in the likeness of a woman clad in such raiment as the bride bore last night and she trod in the snow light foot in thin raiment where it would scarce bear the skids of a deft snow-runner even so she stood before me the icy wind blew her raiment round about her and drifted the hair from her garlanded head toward me and she as fair and fresh as in the midsummer days up the fell she fared sweetest of all things to look on and beckoned on me to follow on me the warrior the stout heart and i followed and between us grief was born but i it was that fostered that child and not she always when she would be was she merry and lovely and even so is she now for she is one of those that be long lived and i wot that thou hast seen even such a one tell me more of thy tales foster father said goldmane and fear not for me ah son he said mayst thou have no such tales to tell to those that shall be young when thou art old yet hearken we sat in the hall together and there was no third and methought that the birds sang and the flowers bloomed and sweet was their savour though it was midwinter a rose wreath was on her head grapes were on the board and fair unwrinkled summer apples on the day that we feasted together when was the feast sayest thou long ago what was the hall thou sayest wherein ye feasted i know not if it were on the earth or under it or if we rode the clouds that even but on the morrow what was there but the stark wood and the drift of the snow and the iron wind howling through the branches and a lonely man a wanderer rising from the ground a wanderer through the wood and up the fell and up the high mountain and up and up to the edges of the ice river and the green caves of the ice hills a wanderer in spring in summer autumn and winter with an empty heart and a burning never satisfied desire who hath seen in the uncouth places many an evil unmanly shape many a foul hag and changing ugly semblance who hath suffered hunger and thirst and wounding and fever and hath seen many things but hath never again seen that fair woman or that lovely feast hall all praise and honour to the house of the face and the bounteous valiant men thereof and the like praise and honour to the fair women whom they wed of the valiant and goodly house of the steer even so say i quoth goldmane calmly but now when we are back to the house for it is morning indeed and folk will be stirring there so they turned from the bridge together and stoneface was kind and fatherly and was telling his foster son many wise things concerning the life of a chieftain and the giving out of dooms and the gathering for battle to all of which talk face of god seemed to hearken gladly but indeed hearken not at all for verily his eyes were beholding that snowy waste and the fair woman upon it even such an one as stoneface had told of End of chapter twelve Chapter thirteen of the Roots of the Mountains by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. They fare to the hunting of the elk. When they came into the hall, the hearth fire had been quickened, and the sleepers on the floor had been wakened, and all folk were astir. So the old man sat down by the hearth, while Goldmane busied himself in fetching wood and water and in sweeping out the hall and other such works of the early morning in a little while while hallface and the other men and warriors were afoot duly clad and the alderman came from his chamber and greeted all men kindly soon meat was set upon the boards and men broke their fast and day dawned while they were about it and ere it was all done the sun rose clear and golden so that all men knew that the day would be fair for the frost seemed hard and enduring then the eager young men and the hunters and those who knew the mountain best drew together about the hearth and fell to talking of the hunting of the elk and there were three there 
who knew both the woods and also the fells right up to the ice rivers better than any other and these said that they who were fain of the hunting of the elk would have no likelier time than that day for a year to come short was the reed betwixt them for they said they would go to the work at once and make the most of the short winter daylight so they went each to his place and some outside that house to their father's houses to fetch each man his gear face of god for his part went to his shut-bed and stood by his chest and opened it and drew out of it a fine hauberk of ring-mail which his father had made for him for though face of god was a deft right he was not by a long way so deft as his father who was the deftest of all men of that time and country so that the alien merchants would give him what he would for his hauberks and helms when so he would chaffer with them which was but seldom so face of god did on this hauberk above his kirtle and over it he cast his foul weather weed so that none might see it he girt a strong war-sword to his side cast his quiver over his shoulder and took his bow in his hand although he had little lust to shoot elks that day even as stoneface had said therewithal he took his skids and went forth of the hall to the gate of the burg where two gathered the whole company of twenty-three and goldmain the twenty-fourth and each man there had his skids and his bow and quiver and whatso other weapon a short sword or wood knife or axe seemed good to him so they went out a gates and clomb the stairway in the cliff which led to the ancient watch-tower for it was on the lower slopes of the fells which lay near to the weltering water that they looked to find the elks and this was the nighest road thereto when they had gotten to the top they lost no time but went their ways nearly due east making way easily where there were but scattered trees close to the lip of the sheer cliffs they went merrily on their skids over the close-lying snow and were soon up on the great shoulders of the fells that went up from the bank of the weltering water at noon they came into a little dale wherein were a few trees and there they abided to eat their meat and were very merry making for themselves tables and benches of the drifted snow and piling it up to windward as a defence against the wind which had now arisen little but bitter from the south-east so that some and they the wisest began to look for foul weather wherefore they tarried the shorter while in the said dale or hollow but they were scarcely on their way again before the aforesaid south-east wind began to grow bigger and at last blew a gale and brought up with it a drift of fine snow through which they yet made their way but slowly till the drift grew so thick that they could not see each other five paces apart then perforce they made stay and gathered together under a bent which by good luck they happened upon where they were sheltered from the worst of the drift there they abode till in less than an hour's space the drift abated and the wind fell and in a little while after it was quite clear with the sun shining brightly and the young waxing moon white and high up in the heavens and the frost was harder than ever this seemed good to them but now that they could see each other's faces they fell to telling over their company and there was none missing save face of god they were somewhat dismayed thereat but knew not what to do and they deemed he might not be far off either a little behind or a little ahead and hallface said there is no need to make this to do about my brother he can take good care of himself neither does a warrior of the face die because of a little cold and frost and snowdrift withal goldmain is a wilful man and of late days hath been wilful beyond his wont let us now find the elks so they went on their ways hoping to fall in with him again no long story need be made of their hunting for not very far from where they had taken shelter they came upon the elks many of them impounded by the drifts pretty much where the deft hunters looked to find them there was then a battle between the elks and the men till the beasts were all slain and only one man hurt then they made them sleighs from wood which they found in the hollows thereby and they laid the carcasses thereon and so turned their faces homeward dragging their prey with them but they met not face of god either there or on the way home and hallface said maybe goldmain will lie on the fell to-night and i would i were with him 
for adventures oft befall such folk when they abide in the wilds. Now it was late at night by then they reached Burgstead, so laden as they were with the dead beasts. But they heeded the night little, for the moon was well nigh as bright as day for them, but when they came to the gate of the thorpe, they were assembled the good men and swains to meet them with torches and wine in their honour. There also was Goldmain come back before them, yea, for these two hours, and he stood clad in his holiday raiment and smiled on them. Then there was some jeering at him that he was come back empty-handed from the hunting, and that he was not able to abide the wind and the drift. But he laughed thereat, for all this was but game and play, since men knew him for a keen hunter and a stout woodsman, and they had deemed it a heavy loss of him if he had been cast away, as some feared he had been. And his brother Hallface embraced him and kissed him, and said to him, Now the next time that thou farest to the wood, will I be with thee foot to foot, and never leave thee, and then meseemeth I shall wot of the tale that hath befallen thee, and belike it shall be no sorry one. Face of God laughed and answered but little, and they all betook them to the house of the face, and held high feast therein, for as late as the night was, in honour of this hunting of the elk. No man cared to question face of God closely as to how or where he had strayed from the hunt, for he had told his own tale at once as soon as he came home, to wit, that his right foot skid-strap had broken, and even while he stopped to mend it, came on that drift and weather, and that he could not move from that place without losing his way, and that when it had cleared he knew not whither they had gone, because the snow had covered their slot. So he deemed it not unlike that they had gone back, and that he might come up with one or two on the way, and that in any case he wotted well that they could look after themselves. So he turned back, not going very swiftly. All this seemed like enough, and a little matter except to jest about, so no man made any question concerning it. Only old Stoneface said to himself, Now were I fain to have a true tale out of him, but it is little likely that anything shall come of my much questioning, and it is ill forcing a young man to tell lies. So he held his peace, and the feast went on merrily and blithely. End of chapter 13「Chapter fourteen of the Roots of the Mountains by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Concerning Face of God and the Mountain. But it must be told of Goldmain that what had befallen him was in this wise. His skid strap brake in good sooth, and he stayed to mend it, but when he had done what was needful, he looked up and saw no man nigh. What for the drift? and that they had gone on somewhat. So he rose to his feet, and without more delay, instead of keeping on toward the elk ground, and the way his face had been set, he turned himself north and by east, and went his ways swiftly towards that ert, because he deemed that it might lead him to the mountain hall where he had guested. He abode not for the storm to clear, but swept off through the thick of it, and indeed the wind was somewhat at his back, so that he went the swiftlier. But when the drift was gotten to its very worst, he sheltered himself for a little in a hollow behind a thorn-bush he stumbled upon. As soon as it began to abate, he went on again, and at last, when it was quite clear, and the sun shone out, he found himself on a long slope of the fells, covered deep with smooth white snow, and at the higher end, a great crag rising bare fifty feet above the snow, and more rocks, but none so great, and broken ground as he judged, the snow being deep about it on the hither side, and on the further three great pine-trees, all bent down and mingled together by their load of snow. Thitherward he made as a man might, seeing nothing else to note before him, but he had not made many strides, when forth from behind the crag by the pine-trees came a man, and at first face of God thought it might be one of his hunting-fellows gone astray, and he hailed him in a loud voice. But as he looked, he saw the sun flash back from a bright helm on the newcomer's head. Albeit he kept on his way, till there was but a space of two hundred yards between them, when, lo, the helm-bearer notched a shaft to his bent bow, and loosed at face of God, 
and the arrow came whistling and passed six inches by his right ear. Then Face of God stopped, perplexed with his case, for he was on the deep snow in his skids with his bow unbent, and he knew not how to bend it speedily. He was loath to turn his back and flee, and indeed he scarce deemed that it would help him. Meanwhile, of his tarrying, the archer loosed again at him, and this time the shaft flew close to his left ear. Then Face of God thought to cast himself down into the snow, but he was ashamed, till there came a third shaft which flew over his head, amidmost and close to it. "'Good shooting on the mountain,' muttered he. "'The next shaft will be amidst my breast, and who knows whether the alderman's handiwork will keep it out.' So he cried aloud, "'Thou shootest well, brother, but art thou a foe? If thou art, I have a sword by my side, and so hast thou. Come hither to me, and let us fight it out, friendly, if we must needs fight.' A laugh came down the wind to him, clear but somewhat shrill, and the archer came swiftly towards him on his skids, with no weapon in his hand save his bow, so that face of God did not draw his sword, but stood wondering. As they drew nearer, he beheld the face of the newcomer, and deemed that he had seen it before, and soon, for all that it was hooded close by the ill-weather raiment, he perceived it to be the face of Bowmay, ruddy and smiling. She laughed out loud again, as she stopped herself within three feet of him, and said, "'Yea, friend yellow hair, we heard of the elks, and looked to see thee hereabouts, and I knew thee at once when I came out from behind the crag, and saw thee stand bewildered.' Said Goldmane, "'Hail to thee, Bowmay, and glad am I to see thee, but thou liest in saying that thou knewest me, else why didst thou shoot those three shafts at me? Surely thou art not so quick as that with all thy friends.' These be sharp greetings of you mountain folk. Thou lad with the sweet mouth, she said, I like to see thee and hear thee talk, but now must I hasten thy departure. So stand we here no longer. Let us get down into the wood where we can do off our skids and sit down, and then will I tell thee the tidings. Come on. And she caught his hand in hers, and they went speedily down the slopes toward the great oak wood, the wind whistling past their ears. "'Whither are we going?' said he. Said she, "'I am to show thee the way back home, which thou wilt not know surely amidst this snow. Come, no words. Thou shalt not have my tale for me till we are in the wood. So the sooner we are there, the sooner shalt thou be pleased.' So face of God held his peace, and they went on swiftly, side by side. But it was not Beaumay's want to be silent for long. So presently she said, "'Thou art good to do as I bid thee, but see thou, sweet playmate, for all thou art a chieftain's son, thou wert but feather brain to ask me why I shot at thee. I shoot at thee? That were a fine tale to tell her this even. Or dost thou think that I could shoot at a big man on the snow at two hundred paces, and miss him three times? Unless I aim to miss. Yea, Bowmay, said he, art thou so deaf to Bowmay? Thou shalt be in my company when so I fare to battle. Indeed, she said, therein thou sayest but the bare truth nowhere else shall i be and thou shalt find my bow no worse than a good shield he laughed somewhat lightly but she looked on him soberly and said laugh in that fashion on the day of battle and we shall be very well content with thee so on they sped very swiftly for their way was mostly downhill so that they were soon amongst the outskirting trees of the wood and presently after reached the edge of the thicket beyond which the ground was but thinly covered with snow. There they took off their skids, and went into the thick wood, and sat down under a hornbeam tree, and ere Goldmane could open his mouth to speak, Bowmay began and said, Well, it was that I fell in with thee, Dalesman, else had there been murders of men to tell of. But ever she ordereth all things wisely, though unwisely hast thou done to seek her. Hearken, Dost thou think that thou hast done well that thou hast me here with my tale? Well hast thou busied thyself with the slaying of elks, and with sitting quietly at home. Yet shouldest thou have heard my tale, and thou shouldest have seen me in Burgstead in a day or two, to tell thee concerning the flitting of the token. And ill it is that I have missed it, for fain had I been to behold the house of the face, and to have seen thee sitting there in thy dignity amidst the kindred of chieftains. 
and she sighed therewith. But he said, Hold up thine heart, Beaumay. On the word of a true man, that shall befall thee one day. But come, playmate, give me my tale. Yes, she said, I must now tell thee in the wild wood what else I had told thee in the hall. Hearken closely, for this is the message. Seek not to me again till thou hast the token, else assuredly wilt thou be slain, and I shall be sorry for many a day. Thereof, as now I may not tell thee more. Now as to the token, when March is worn two weeks, fail not to go to and fro on the place of the maiden ward, for an hour before sunrise every day, till thou bear tidings. Now, quoth Bome, hast thou hearkened and understood? Yea, said he. She said, Then tell me the words of my message concerning the token. And he did so, word for word. Then she said, It is well there's no more to say. Now must I lead thee till thou knowest the wood, and then mayst thou get on to the smooth snow again, and so home merrily. Yet thou grey-eyed fellow, I will have my pay of thee before I do that last work. Therewith she turned about to him, and took his head between her hands, and kissed him, well favouredly, both cheeks and mouth. And she laughed, albeit the tears stood in her eyes as she said, Now smelleth the wood sweeter, and summer will come back again and even thus will I do once more when we stand side by side in battle array. He smiled kindly on her and nodded as they both rose up from the earth. She had taken off her foul weather gloves while they spake, and he kissed her hand, which was shapely of fashion, albeit somewhat brown and hard of palm, and he said in a friendly wise, Thou art a merry faring fellow, Bome, and belike shall be with all a true fighting fellow. Come now, thou shalt be my sister, and I thy brother, in despite of those three shafts across the snow. He laughed therewith. She laughed not, but seemed glad, and said soberly, Yes, I may well be thy sister, for belike I also am of the people of the gods, who have come into these dales by many far ways. I am of the house of the ragged sword of the kindred of the wolf. Come, brother, let us walk toward Wild Lake's way. Therewith she went before him, and led through the thicket by an assured and wanted path, and he followed hard at heel, but his thought went from her for a while, for those words of brother and sister that he had spoken called to his mind the bride, and their kindness of little children, and the days when they seemed to have naught to do but to make the sun brighter, and the flowers fairer, and the grass greener, and the birds happier, each for the other and a hard and evil thing it seemed to him, that now he should be making all these things naught and dreary to her, now when he had become a man and deeds lay before him. Yet again was he solaced by what Bome had said concerning battle to come, for he deemed that she must have had this from the friend's foreseeing, and he longed sore for deeds to do, wherein all these things might be cleared up and washed and clean as it were. So passed they through the wood a long way, and it was getting dark therein, and Goldmane said, Hold now, Bome, for I am at home here. She looked around and said, Yes, so it is. I was thinking of many things. Farewell and live merrily till March comes, and the token. Therewith she turned and went her ways, and was soon out of sight, and he went lightly through the wood, and then on skids over the hard snow along the dale's edge, till he was come to the watch-tower, when the moon was bright in heaven. Thus was he at Burgstead and the house of the face betimes, and before the hunters were gotten back. End of chapter 14「Chapter 15 of the Roots of the Mountains by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Murder amongst the folk of the woodlanders. So wore away midwinter tidingless. Stoneface spake no more to face of God about the wood and its whites, when he saw that the young man had come back hale and merry, and seemed not to crave overmuch to go back thither. As for the bride, she was sad, and more than misdoubted all, but dauntless as she was in matters that try men's hardihood, 
she yet lacked heart to ask of face of god what had befallen him since the autumn tide or where he was with her so she put a force upon herself not to look sad or craving when she was in his company as full oft she was for he rather sought her than shunned her for when he saw her thus he deemed things were changing with her as they had changed with him and he bethought him of what he had spoken to Bome, and deemed that even so he might speak with the bride when the time came and that she would not be grieved beyond measure and all would be well now came on the thaw and the snow went and the grass grew all up and down the dale and all waters were big and about this time arose rumours of strange men in the wood uncouth vile and murderous and many of the feebler sorts were made timorous thereby but a little before march was born came new tidings from the woodlanders to wit there came on a time to the house of a woodland carl a worthy goodman well renowned of all two wayfarers in the first watch of the night and these men said that they were wending down to the plain from a far away dale rosedale to it which all men had heard of and that they had strayed from the way and were exceeding weary and they craved a meal's meat and lodging for the night this the good man might nowise gainsay and he saw no harm in it wherefore he bade them abide and be merry these men said they who told the tidings were outlanders and no man had seen any like them before they were armed and bore short bows made of horn and round targets and coats of fence done over with horn scales they had crooked swords girt to their sides and axes of steel forged all in one piece right good weapons they were clad in scarlet and had much silver on their raiment and about their weapons and great rings of the same on their arms and all this silver seemed brand new now the woodland carl gave them of such things as he had and was kind and blithe to them there were in his house besides himself five men of his sons and kindred and his wife and three daughters and two other maids so they feasted after the woodlanders fashion and went to bed a little before midnight two hours after the carl awoke and heard a little stir and he looked and saw the guests on their feet amidst the hall clad in all their war gear and they had betwixt them his two youngest daughters maids of fifteen and twelve winters and had bound their hands and done clouts over their mouths so that they might not cry out and they were just at point to carry them off thereat the good man naked as he was caught up his sword and made at these murder carls and or ever they were ware of him he had hewn down one and turned to face the other who smote at him with his steel axe and gave him a great wound on the shoulder and therewithal fled out at the open door and forth into the wood the woodlander made no stay to raise the cry there was no need for the hall was astir now from end to end and men getting to their weapons but ran out after the felon even as he was and in spite of his grievous hurt overran him no long way from the house before he had gotten into the thicket but the man was nimble and strong and the good man unsteady from his wound and by then the others of the household came up with the hue and cry he had gotten two more sore wounds and was just making an end of throttling the felon with his bare hands so he fell into their arms fainting from weakness and for all they could do he died in two hours time from that axe wound in his shoulder and another on the side of the head and a knife thrust in his side and he was a man of sixty winters but the stranger he had slain outright and the one whom he had smitten in the hall died before the dawn thrusting all help aside and making no sound of speech when these tidings came to burgstead they seemed great to all men and to goldmain more than all so he and many others took their weapons and fared up to wild lake's way and so came to the woodland carls but the woodlanders had borne out the carcasses of those felons and laid them on the green before woodgray's door for that was the name of the dead good man and they were saying that they would not bury such accursed folk but would bear them a little way so that they should not be vexed with the stink of them and cast them into the thickets for the wolf and the wild cat and the stoat to deal with and they should lie there weapons and silver and all and they deemed it base to strip such wretches for who would wear their raiment or bear their weapons after them 
there was a great ring of folk round about them when they of Burkstead drew near, and they shouted for joy to see their neighbours, and made way before them. Then the dalesmen cursed these murderers who had slain so good a man, and they all praised his manliness, whereas he ran out into the night, naked and wounded after his foe, and had fallen like his folk of old time. It was a bright spring afternoon in that clearing of the wood, and they looked at the two dead men closely. And Goldmane, who had been somewhat silent and moody till then, became merry and wordy, for he beheld the men and saw that they were utterly strange to him. They were short of stature, crooked-legged, long-armed, very strong for their size, with small blue eyes, snub-nosed, wide-mouthed, thin-lipped, very swarthy of skin, exceedingly foul of favour. He and all others wondered who they were, and whence they came, for never had they seen their like. And the woodlanders, who often guested outlanders strayed from the way of diverse kindreds and nations, said also that none such had they ever seen. But Stoneface, who stood by Goldmane, shook his head, and quoth he, The wild wood holdeth many marvels, and these be of them. The spawn of evil whites quickeneth therein, and as other whiles it melteth away again like the snow. So may it be with these carcasses. And some of the older folk of the woodlanders who stood by hearkened what he said, and deemed his words wise, for they remembered their ancient lore, and many a tale of old time. Thereafter they of Burkstead went into Woodgrace Hall, or as many of them as might, for it was but a poor place and not right great. There they saw the good man laid out on the dais in all his war-gear, under the last tie-beam of his hall, whereon was carved, amidst much goodly work of knots and flowers and twining stems, the image of the wolf of the waste, his jaws open and gaping. The wife and daughters of the good man and other women of the folk stood about the bier, singing some old song in a low voice, and some sobbing therewithal, for the man was very much beloved and much people of the woodlanders was in the hall, and it was somewhat dusk within. So the Burgstead men greeted that folk kindly and humbly, and again they fell to praising the dead man, saying how his deed should long be remembered in the dale and wide about, and they called him a fearless man and of great worth, and the women hearkened and ceased their crooning and their sobbing, and stood up proudly and raised their heads with gleaming eyes and as the words of the Burgstead men ended, they lifted up their voices, and sang loudly and clearly, standing together in a row, ten of them, on the dais of that poor hall, facing the gable and the wolf-adorned tie-beam, heeding naught as they sang what was about or behind them, and this is some of what they sang. Why sit ye bare in the spinning-room? Why weave ye naked at the loom? Bare and white as the moon we be, that the earth and the drifting night may see. Now what is the worst of all your work? What curse amidst the web shall lurk? The worst of the work our hands shall win is rack and ruin round the kin. Shall the woollen yarn and the flaxen thread be gear for living men or dead? The woollen yarn and the flaxen thread shall flare twixt living men and dead. Oh, what is the ending of your day? When shall ye rise and wend away? Our day shall end to-morrow morn, when we hear the voice of the battle-horn. Where first shall eyes of men behold this weaving of the moonlight cold? There, where the alien host abides, the gathering on the mountain sides. How long aloft shall the fair web fly, when the bows are bent and the spears draw nigh? From eve to morn, and morn till eve, aloft shall fly the work we weave. What then is this, the web ye win? What wood-beast waxeth stark therein? We weave the wolf and the gift of war From the men that were to the men that are. So sang they, and much were all men moved at their singing, And there was none but called to mind the old days of the fathers, And the years when their banner went wide in the world. But the woodlanders feasted them of Burgstead what they might, And then went the dalesmen back to their houses. But on the morrow's morrow they fared thither again, and wood grey was laid in mound amidst a great assemblage of the folk. Many men said that there was no doubt that these two felons were of the company of those who had ransacked the steads of Pennytham and Hartsbane, 
and so at first deemed Bristler the son of Brightling. But after a while, when he had had time to think of it, he changed his mind, for he said that such men as these would have slain first and ransacked afterwards. And some who loved neither Pennythumb nor Heartsbane said that they would not have been at the pains to choose for ransacking the two worst men about the dale, whose loss was no loss to any but themselves. As for Goldmane, he knew not what to think, except that his friends of the mountain had naught to do with it. So wore the days a while. End of chapter 15《Chapter Sixteen of the Roots of the Mountains by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Bride Speaketh with Face of God. February had died into March, and March was now twelve days old, on a fair and sunny day, an hour before noon. And Face of God was in a meadow, a scant mile down the dale from Bergstead. He had been driving a bull into a good man's byre nearby and had had to spend toil and patience, both in getting him out of the fields and into the byre, for the beast was hot with the spring days and the new grass. So now he was resting himself in happy mood in an exceeding pleasant place, a little meadow to wit, on one side whereof was a great orchard or grove of sweet chestnuts, which went right up to the feet of the southern cliffs. Across the meadow ran a clear brook towards the weltering water, free from big stones, in some places dammed up for the flooding of the deep pasture meadow, and with the grass growing on its lips down to the very water. There was a low bank just outside the chestnut trees, as if someone had raised a dyke about them when they were young, which had been trodden low, and spreading through the lapse of years by the faring of many men and beasts. The primroses bloomed thick upon it now, and here and there along it, was a low blackthorn bush in full blossom. From the mid-meadow and right down to the lip of the brook was the grass well-nigh hidden by the blossoms of the meadow saffron, with daffodils sprinkled about amongst them, and in the trees and bushes the birds, and chiefly the blackbirds, were singing their loudest. There sat face of God on the bank, resting after his toil, and happy was his mood, since in two days wearing he should be pacing the maiden ward, awaiting the token that was to lead him to shadowy vale. So he sat calling to mind the friend as he had last seen her, and striving as it were to set her image standing on the flowery grass before him, till all the beauty of the meadow seemed bare and empty to him without her. Then it fell into his mind that this had been a beloved trysting place betwixt him and the bride, and often when they were little would they come to gather chestnuts in the grove, and thereafter sit and prattle on the old dyke, or in spring when the season was warm would they go barefoot into the brook, seeking its treasures of troutlets and flowers and clean-washed agate pebbles. Yea, and time not long ago had they met here to talk as lovers, and sat on that very bank in all the kindness of good days, without a blemish and both he and she had loved the place well for its wealth of blossoms and deep grass and goodly trees and clear-running stream. As he thought of all this, and how often there he had praised to himself her beauty, which he scarce dared to praise to her, he frowned and slowly rose to his feet, and turned toward the chestnut grove, as though he would go thence that way. But or ever he stepped down from the dyke, he turned about again, and even therewith, like the very image and ghost of his thought, lo, the bride herself coming up from out the brook, and wending toward him, her wet naked feet gleaming in the sun as they trod down the tender meadow saffron, and brushed past the tufts of daffodils. He stood staring at her discomfited, for on that day he had much to think of that seemed happy to him, and he deemed that she would now question him, and his mind pondered diverse ways of answering her, and none seemed good to him. She drew near, and let her skirts fall over her feet, and came to him, her gown hem dragging over the flowers. Then she stood straight up before him and greeted him, but reached not forth her hand to him, 
nor touched him. Her face was paler than its wont, and her voice trembled as she spake to him and said, Face of God, I would ask thee a gift. All gifts, he said, that thou mayest ask, and I may give, lie open to thee. She said, If I be alive when the time comes, this gift thou mayest well give me. Sweet kinswoman, said he, tell me what it is that thou wouldest have of me. And he was ill at ease as he waited for her answer. She said, Ah, kinsman, kinsman, woe on the day that maketh kinship accursed to me, because thou desirest it. He held his peace and was exceeding sorry, and she said, This is the gift that I ask of thee, that in the days to come, when thou art wedded, thou wilt give me the second man-child whom thou begettest. He said, This shalt thou have, and would that I might give thee much more. Would that we were little children together once again, as when we played here in other days. She said, I would have a token of thee, that thou shalt show to the god, and swear on it to give me the gift, for the times change. What token wilt thou have? said he. She said, When next thou farest to the wood, thou shalt bring me back. It may be a flower from the bank ye sit upon, or a splinter from the dais of the hall wherein ye feast, or may be a ring or some matter that the strangers are wont to wear. That shall be the token. She spoke slowly, hanging her head adown, but she lifted it presently, and looked into his face, and said, Woe is me, woe is me, gold mane! How evil is this day, when bewailing me, I may not bewail thee also! For I know that thine heart is glad. All through the winter have I kept this hidden in my heart, and durst not speak to thee. But now the springtide hath driven me to it. Let summer come, and who shall say? Great was his grief, and his shame kept him silent, and he had no word to say. And again she said, Tell me, Goldmane, when goest thou thither? He said, I know not, surely. May happen in two days, may happen in ten. Why askest thou? Oh, friend, she said, is it a new thing that I should ask thee whither thou goest and whence thou comest, and the times of thy coming and going? Farewell to-day, forget not the token. Woe's me that I may not kiss thy fair face. She spread her arms abroad, and lifted up her face, as one who waileth, but no sound came from her lips. Then she turned about and went away as she had come. But as for him, he stood there after she was gone, in all confusion, as if he were undone, for he felt his manhood lessened, that he should thus and so sorely have hurt a friend, and in a manner against his will. And yet he was somewhat wroth with her, that she had come upon him so suddenly, and spoken to him with such mastery, and in so few words, and he with none to make answer to her, and that she had so marred his pleasure, and his hope of that fair day. Then he sat him down again on the flowery bank, and little by little his heart softened, and he once more called to mind many a time when they had been there before, and the plays and the games they had had together there, when they were little. And he bethought him of the days that were long to him then, and now seemed short to him, and as if they were all grown together into one story, and that a sweet one. Then his breast heaved with a sob, and the tears rose to his eyes, and burned and stung him, and he fell a-weeping for that sweet tale, and wept as he had wept once before on that old dyke when there had been some child's quarrel between them, and she had gone away and left him. Then, after a while, he ceased his weeping, and looked about him, lest any one might be coming, and then he arose and went to and fro in the chestnut grove for a good while, and afterwards went his ways from that meadow, saying to himself, Yet remaineth to me the morrow of to-morrow, and that is the first of the days of the watching for the token. But all that day he was slow to meet the eyes of men, and in the hall that eve he was silent and moody, for from time to time it came over him that some of his manhood had departed from him. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of the Roots of the Mountains by William Morris. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The token cometh from the mountain. The next day wore away tidingless, and the day after face of God arose betimes, for it was the first day of his watch, and he was at the maiden ward before the time appointed on a very fair and bright morning and he went to and fro on that place and had no tidings so he came away somewhat cast down and said within himself is it but a lie and a mocking when all is said on the morrow he went thither again and the morn was wild and stormy with drift of rain and low clouds hurrying over the earth though for the sunrise they lifted a little in the east and the sun came over the passes amidst the red and angry rack of clouds this morn also gave him no tidings of the token and he was wroth and perturbed in spirit but towards evening he said it is well ten days she gave me so that she might be able to send without fail on one of them she will not fail me so again on the morrow he was there betimes and the morn was windy as on the day before but the clouds higher and a better promise for the day face of god walked to and fro on the maiden ward and as he turned toward burgstead for the tenth time he heard as he deemed a bowstring twang afar off and even therewith came a shaft flying heavily like a winged bird which smote a great standing stone on the other side of the way whereof some chieftain had been buried and fell to earth at its foot he went up to it and handled it and saw that there was a piece of thin parchment wrapped about it which indeed he was eager to unwrap at once but forbore because he was on the highway and people were already astir and even then passed by him a good man of the dale with a man of his going afield together and they gave him the seal of the day so he went along the highway a little till he came to a place where was a footbridge over into the meadow he crossed thereby and went swiftly till he reached a rising ground grown over with hazel trees there he sat down among the rabbit holes the primrose and the wild garlic blooming about him and three blackbirds answering one another from the edges of the coppice straightway when he had looked and seen none coming he broke the threads that were wound about the scroll and the arrow and unrolled the parchment and there was writing thereon in black ink of small letters but very fair and this is what he read therein come thou to the mountain hall by the path which thou knowest of on the morrow of the day whereon thou readest this rise betimes and come armed for there are other men than we in the wood to whom thy death should be again when thou art come to the hall thou shalt find no man therein but a great hound only tied to a bench nigh the dais call him by his name sure foot to wit and give him to eat from the meat upon the board and give him water to drink if the day is then far spent as it is like to be abide thou with the hound in the hall through the night and eat of what thou shalt find there but see that the hound fares not abroad till the morrow's morn then lead him out and bring him to the north-east corner of the hall and he shall lift the slot for thee that leadeth to the shadowy vale follow him and all good go with thee now when he had read this earth seemed fair indeed about him and he scarce knew whither to turn or what to do to make the most of his joy he presently went back to burgstead and into the house of the face where all men were astir now and the day was clearing he hid the shaft under his kirtle for he would not that any should see it so he went to his shut-bed and laid it up in his chest wherein he kept his chiefest treasures but the writing on the scroll he set in his bosom and so hid it he went joyfully and proudly as one who knoweth more tidings and better than those around him but stoneface beheld him and said foster son thou art happy is it that the spring tide is in thy blood and maketh thee blithe with all things or hast thou some new tidings nay i would not have an answer out of thee but here is a good read when next thou goest into the wood it were naught so ill for thee to have a valiant old carl by thy side one that loveth thee and would die for thee if need were one who might watch when thou wert seeking or else beware for there are evil things abroad in the wood 
and moreover the brethren of those two felons who were slain at Carlstead. Then Goldmane constrained himself to answer the old Carl softly, and he thanked him kindly for his offer, and said, So it should be before long. So the talk between them fell, and Stoneface went away, somewhat well pleased. And now was face of God become wary, and he would not draw men's eyes and speech on him. So he went afield with Hallface to deal with the lambs and the ewes, and did like other men. No less wary was he in the hall that even, and neither spake much nor little, and when his father spake to him concerning the bride, and made game of him as a somewhat sluggish groom, he did not change countenance, but answered lightly what came to hand. On the morrow, ere the earliest dawn he was afoot, and he clad himself and did on his hauberk, his father's work, which was fine wrought and a stout defence, and reached down to his knees, and over that he did on a goodly green kirtle, well embroidered. He girt his war-sword to his side, and it was the work of his father's father, and a very good sword. Its name was Dale Warden. He did a good helm on his head, and slung a targe at his back, and took two spears in his hand, short but strong shaft, and well steeled. Thus arrayed he left Burgstead before the dawn, and came to Wild Lake's way, and betook him to the woodland. He made no stop or stay on the path, but ate his meat standing by an oak tree, close by the half-blind track. When he came to the little woodlawn, where there was the toft of the ancient house, he looked all round about him, for he deemed that a likely place for those ugly woodwhites to set on him. But naught befell him, though he stooped and drank of the woodland rill warily enough. So he passed on, and there were other places also where he fared warily, because they seemed like to hold lurking felons, though forsooth the whole wood might well serve their turn. But no evil befell him, and at last, when it yet lacked an hour to sunset, he came to the woodlawn where Wildwearer had made his onset that other eve. He went straight up to the house, his heart beating, and he scarce believing, but that he should find the friend abiding him there. But when he pushed the door, it gave way before him at once, and he entered and found no man therein, and the walls stripped bare, and no shield or weapon hanging on to the panels. But the hound he saw tied to a bench nigh the dais, and the bristles on the beast's neck arose, and he snarled on face of God, and strained his leathern leash. Then face of God went up to him, and called him by his name, Shorefoot, and gave him his hand to lick, and he brought him water, and fed him with flesh from the meat on the board. So the beast became friendly, and wagged his tail, and whined and slobbered his hand. Then he went all about the house, and saw and heard no living thing therein, save the mice in the panels, and sure foot. So he came back to the dais, and sat him down at the board, and ate his fill, and thought concerning his case. And it came into his mind that the woman of the mountain had some deed for him to do, which would try his manliness and exalt his fame, and his heart rose high, and he was glad, and he saw himself sitting beside her on the dais of a very fair hall, beloved and honoured of all the folk, and none had aught to say against him, or owed him any grudge. Thus he pleased himself in thinking of the good days to come, sitting there till the hall grew dusk and dark, and the night wind moaned about it. Then, after a while, he arose and raked together the brands on the hearth, and made light in the hall, and looked to the door, and he found there were bolts and bars thereto, so he shot the bolts and drew the bars into their places, and made all as sure as might be. Then he brought Shorefoot down from the dais, and tied him up so that he might lie down athwart the door, and then lay down in his hauberk with his naked sword ready to his hand, and slept a long while. When he awoke it was darker than when he had lain him down, for the moon had set yet he deemed that the day was at the point of breaking. So he fetched water, and washed the night off him, 
and saw a little glimmer of the dawn. Then he ate somewhat of the meat on the board, and did on his helm and his other gear, and unbarred the door, and led Shorefoot without, and brought him to the north-east corner of the house. And in a little while he lifted the slot, and they departed, the man and the hound, just as dawn broke from over the mountains. Shorefoot led right into the heart of the pine wood, and it was dark enough therein, with naught but a feeble glimmer for some while, and long was the way therethrough. But in two hours' space there was something of a break, and they came to the shore of a dark deep tarn, on whose windless and green waters the daylight shone fully. The hound skirted the water, and led on unchecked, till the trees began to grow smaller, and the air colder, for all that the sun was higher, for they had been going up and up all the way. So at last, after a six hours journey, they came clean out of the pine wood, and before them lay the black wilderness of the bare mountains, and beyond them, looking quite near now, the great ice peaks, the wall of the world. It was but an hour short of noon by this time, and the high sun shone down on a barren boggy moss which lay betwixt them and the rocky waste. Shorefoot made no stay, but threaded the ways that went betwixt the quagmires, and in another hour led face of God into a winding valley, blinded by great rocks, and everywhere stony and rough, with a trickle of water running amidst of it. The hound fared on up the dale, to where the water was bridged by a great fallen stone, and so over it and up a steep bent on the further side, on to a marvellously rough mountain neck, whiles mere black sand cumbered with scattered rocks and stones, whiles beset with mires grown over with the cottony mire-grass, here and there a little scanty grass growing, otherwhere naught but dwarf willow, ever dying, ever growing, mingled with moss or red blossom sengreen, and all blending together into mere desolation. Few living things they saw there. Upon the neck a few sheep were grazing the scanty grass, but there was none to tend them. Yet face of God deemed the sight of them good, for there must be men and I who owned them. For the rest, the wimbrel laughed across the mires. High up in heaven a great eagle was hanging. Once and again a grey fox leapt up before them, and the heath-fowl whirred up from under face of God's feet. A raven who was sitting croaking on a rock in that first dale stirred uneasily on his perch as he saw them, and when they were past, flapped his wings and flew after them, croaking still. Now they fared over that neck somewhat east, making but slow way, because the ground was so broken and rocky, and in another hour's space, Shorefoot led downhill, due east to where the stony neck sank into another desolate miry heath still falling toward the east but whose further side was walled by a rampart of crags cleft at their tops into marvellous shapes coal-black ungrassed and unmossed thitherward the hound led straight and goldmain followed wondering as he drew near them he saw that they were not very high the tallest peak scant fifty feet from the face of the heath. They made their way through the scattered rocks at the foot of these crags, till, just where the rock wall seemed the closest, the way through the stones turned into a path going through it skew-wise, and it was now so clear a path that belike it had been bettered by men's hands. Down thereby face of God followed the hound, deeming that he was come to the gates of the shadowy vale. Path went down steeply and swiftly, but when he had gone down a while, the rocks on his right hand sank lower for a space, so that he could look over and see what lay beneath. There lay below him a long, narrow vale, quite plain at the bottom, walled on the further side, as on the hither, by sheer rocks of black stone. The plain was grown over with grass, but he could see no tree therein. A deep river, dark and green, ran through the vale, sometimes through its midmost, sometimes lapping the further rock wall, and he thought, indeed, that on many a day in the year 
the sun would never shine on that valley. Thus much he saw, and then the rocks rose again and shut it from his sight, and at last they drew so close together overhead that he was in a way going through a cave with little daylight coming from above, and in the end he was in a cave indeed, and mere darkness. But with the last feeble glimmer of light, he thought he saw carved on a smooth space of the living rock at his left hand, the image of a wolf. This cave lasted but a little way, and soon the hound and the man were going once more between sheer black rocks, and the path grew steeper yet, and was cut into steps. At last there was a sharp turn, and they stood on the top of a long stony scree, down which Shorefoot bounded eagerly, giving tongue as he went. But face of God stood still and looked, for now the whole dale lay open before him. That river ran from north to south, and at the south end the cliffs drew so close to it that looking thence no outgate could be seen. But at the north end there was, as it were, a dreary street of rocks, the river flowing amidmost and leaving little foothold on either side, somewhat as it was with the pass leading from the mountains into Burgdale. Amidmost of the dale, a little toward the north end, he saw a doom-ring of black stones, and hard by it an ancient hall, builded of the same black stone, both wall and roof, and thitherward was Shorefoot now running. Face of God looked up and down the dale, and could see no break in the wall of sheer rock. Toward the southern end he saw a few booths and cots, built roughly of stone and thatched with turf. Thereabout he saw a few folk moving about, the most of whom seemed to be women and children. There were some sheep and lambs near these cots, and a herd of fifty or so of somewhat goodly mountain kine were feeding higher up the valley. He could look down into the river from where he stood, and he saw that it ran between rocky banks going straight down from the face of the meadow, which was rather high above the water, so that it seemed little likely that the water should rise over its banks, either in summer or winter, and in summer was it like to be highest, because the vale was so near to the high mountains and their snows. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of The Roots of the Mountain by William Morris This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Face of God talketh with the friend in shadowy vale. It was now about two hours after noon, and a broad band of sunlight lay upon the grass of the vale below Goldmain's feet. He went lightly down the scree, and strode forward over the level grass toward the doom ring his helm and war-gear glittering bright in the sun. He must needs go through the doom-ring to come to the hall, and as he stepped out from behind the last of the big upright stones, he saw a woman, standing on the threshold of the hall-door, which was but some score of paces from him, and knew her at once for the friend. She was clad like himself in a green kirtle, gaily embroidered and fitting close to her body and had no gown or cloak over it. She had a golden fillet on her head, beset with blue mountain stones, and her hair hung loose behind her. Her beauty was so exceeding, and so far beyond all memory of her, that his mind had held, that once more fear of her fell upon face of God, and he stood still with beating heart till she should speak to him. But she came forward swiftly, with both her hands held out, smiling and happy-faced, and looking very kindly on him, and she took his hands and said to him, Now, welcome, Goldmane, welcome, face of God, and twice welcome art thou, and threefold. Lo, this is the day that thou hast asked for. Art thou happy in it? He lifted her hands to his lips, and kissed them timorously, but said naught, and therewithal Shorefoot came running forth from the hall, and fell to bounding round about them, barking noisily after the manner of dogs who have met their masters again, and still she held his hands and beheld him kindly. Then she called the hound to her, and patted him on the neck and quieted him, 
and then turned to face of God, and laughed happily, and said, I did not bid thee hold thy peace, yet thou sayest naught. Is it well with thee? Yea, he said, and more than well. Thou seemest to me a goodly warrior, she said. Hast thou met any foemen yesterday or this morning? Nay, said he, none hindered me. Thou hast made the ways easy to me. She said soberly, such as I might do, I did. But we may not wield everything, for our foes are many, and I feared for thee. But come thou into our house, which is ours, and far more ours than the booth before the pine wood. She took his hand again and led him toward the door, but face of God looked up, and above the lintel he saw carved on the dark stone that image of the wolf, even as he had seen it carved on wood grey's tie beam, and therewith such thoughts came into his mind that he stopped to look, pressing the friend's hand hard as though bidding her note it. The stone wherein the image was carved was darker than the other building stones, and might be called black. The jaws of the wood-beast were open and gaping, and had been painted with cinnabar, but wind and weather had worn away the most of the colour. Spake the friend, So it is, thou beholdest the token of the god and father of our fathers, that telleth the tale of so many days, that the days which now pass by us be to them, but as the drop in the sea of waters. Thou beholdest the sign of our sorrow, the memory of our wrong, yet it is also the token of our hope, maybe it shall lead thee far. Whither? said he, but she answered not a great while, and he looked at her as she stood a-gazing on the image, and saw how the tears stole out of her eyes, and ran adown her cheeks. Then again came the thought to him of Woodgrace Hall, and the women of the kindred standing before the wolf, and singing of him, and though there was little comeliness in them, and she was so exceeding beauteous, he could not but deem that they were akin to her. But after a while she wiped the tears from her face, and turned to him, and said, My friend, the wolf shall lead thee no whither, but where I also shall be, whatsoever peril or grief may beset the road, or lurk at the ending thereof. Thou shalt be no thrall, to labour while I look on, his heart swelled within him as she spoke, and he was at point to beseech her love that moment. But now her face had grown gay and bright again, and she said, while he was gathering words to speak withal, Come in, gold mane, come into our house, for I have many things to say to thee, and moreover thou art so hushed and so fearsome in thy mail, that I think thou yet deemest me to be a white of the waste, such a stone face thy fosterer told thee tales of, and forewarn thee. So would I eat before thee, and sign the meat with the sign of the earth god's hammer, to show thee that he is in error concerning me, and that I am a very woman, flesh and fell, as my kindred were before me. He laughed, and was exceeding glad, and said, Tell me now, kind friend, dost thou deem that Stoneface's tales are mere mockery of his dreams, and that he is beguiled by empty semblances or less? There are there such whites in the waste? Nay, she said, the man is a true man, and of these things are there many ancient tales which we may not doubt. Yet so it is that such whites have I never seen yet, nor ought to scare me, save evil men. Belike it is that I have been overmuch busied in dealing with sorrow and ruin to look after them. Or it may be that they feared me and the wrath-breeding grief of the kindred. He looked at her earnestly, and the wisdom of her heart seemed to enter into his. But she said, It is of men we must talk, and of me and thee. Come with me, my friend. And she stepped lightly over the threshold and drew him in. The hall was stern and grim, and somewhat dusky, for its windows were but small. It was all of stone, both walls and roof. There was no timber work therein save the benches and chairs, and a little about the doors at the lower end that led to the buttery and outbowers, and this seemed to have been wrought of late years. Yea, the chairs against the gable on the dais were of stone built into the wall, adorned with carving somewhat sparingly, the image of the wolf being done over the midmost of them. He looked up and down the hall, and deemed it some seventy feet over all from end to end, and he could see in the dimness 
those same goodly hangings on the wall which he had seen in the woodland booth she led him up to the dais and stood there leaning up against the arm of one of those stone seats silent for a while then she turned and looked at him and said yea thou lookest a goodly warrior yet am i glad that thou camest hither without battle tell me gold maid she said taking one of his spears from his hand art thou deft with the spear i have been called so said he she looked at him sweetly and said canst thou show me the feat of spear throwing in this hall or shall we wend outside presently that i may see thee throw the hall sufficeth he said shall i set this steel in the lintel of the buttery door yonder yea if thou canst she said he smiled and took the spear from her and poised it and shook it till it quivered again then suddenly drew back his arm and cast and the shaft sped whistling down the dim hall and smote the aforesaid door lintel and stuck there quivering then he sprang down from the dais and ran down the hall and put forth his hand and pulled it forth from the wood and was on the dais again in a trice and cast again and the second time set the spear in the same place and then took his other spear from the board and cast it and there stood the two staves in the wood side by side then he went soberly down the hall and drew them both out of the wood and came back to her while she stood watching him her cheek flushed her lips a little parted she said good spear cast him forsooth and far above what our folk can do who be no great throwers of the spear goldmain laughed sooth is that said he a hardly were i here to teach thee spear throwing wilt thou never be paid for that simple onslaught she said have i been paid then said he she reddened for she remembered her word to him on the mountain and he put his hand on her shoulder and kissed her cheek but timorously nor did she withstand him or shrink her back but said soberly good indeed is thy spear throwing and meseems my brother will love thee when he hath seen thee strike a stroke or two in wrath but fair warrior there be no foemen here so get thee to the lower end of the hall and in the bower beyond shalt thou find fresh water there wash the waist from off thee and do off thine helm and hauberk and come back speedily and eat with me for i hunger and so dost thou he did as she bade him and came back presently bearing in his hand both helm and hauberk and he looked light-limbed and trim and lissom an exceedingly goodly man End of chapter eighteen Chapter nineteen of the Roots of the Mountains by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The fair woman telleth face of God of her kindred. When he came back to the dais, he saw that there was meat upon the board, and the friend said to him, Now art thou gold mane indeed, but come now, sit by me and eat, though the woodwoman giveth thee but a sorry banquet, O guest but from the dale it is and we be too far now from the dwellings of men to have delicate meat on the board though to-night when they come back thy cheer shall be better yet even then thou shalt have no such dainties as stone-face hath imagined for thee at the hands of the wood-white she laughed therewith and he no less and in sooth the meat was but simple of curds and new cheese meat of the herdsman but face of god said gaily sweet it shall be to me good is all that the friend giveth then she raised her hand and made the sign of the hammer over the board and looked up at him and said hath the earth god changed my face gold mane to what i verily am he held his face close to hers and looked into it and him seemed it was as pure as the waters of a mountain lake and as fine and well wrought every deal of it as when his father had wrought in his stithy many days and fashioned a small piece of great mastery he was ashamed to kiss her again but he said to himself this is the fairest woman of the world whom i have sworn to wed this year then he spake aloud and said i see the face of the friend and it will not change to me again she reddened a little 
and the happy look in her face seemed to grow yet sweeter and he was bewildered with longing and delight but she stood up and went to an ambry in the wall and brought forth a horn shod and lipped with silver of ancient fashion and she poured wine into it and held it forth and said o oh, guest from the dale i pledge thee and when thou hast drunk to me in turn we will talk of weighty matters for indeed i bear hopes in my hands too heavy for the daughters of men to bear and thou art a chieftain's son and mayst well help me to bear them so let us talk simply and without guile as folk that trust one another so she drank and held out the horn to him and he took the horn and her hand both and he kissed her hand and said here in this hall i drink to the sons of the wolf whosoever they be therewith he drank and he said simply and guilelessly indeed will i talk with thee for i am weary of lies and for thy sake have i told a many thou shalt tell no more she said and as for the health thou hast drunk it is good and shall profit thee now sit we here in these ancient seats and let us talk so they sat them down while the sun was westering in the march afternoon and she said tell me first what tidings have been in the dale so he told her of the ransackings and of the murder at carlstead she said these tidings have we heard before and some deal of them we know better than ye do or can for we were the ransackers of pennythum and hartsbane thereof will i say more presently what other tidings hast thou to tell of what oaths were sworn upon the boar last yule so he told her of the oath of bristler the son of brightling she smiled and said he shall keep his oath and yet redden no blade then he told of his father's oath and she said it is good but even so would he do and no oath sworn all men may trust i am face and thou my friend what oath didst thou swear his face grew somewhat troubled as he said i swore to wed the fairest woman in the world though the dalesmen gainsaid me and they beyond the dale yes she said and there is no need to ask thee whom thou didst mean by thy fairest woman for i have seen that thou deemest me fair enough my friend maybe thy kindred will be against it and the kindred of the bride and it might be that my kindred would have gainsaid it if things were not as they are but though all men gainsay it yet will not i it is meet and right that we twain wed she spake very soberly and quietly but when she had spoken there was nothing in his heart but joy and gladness yet shame of her loveliness refrained him and he cast down his eyes before hers then she said in a kind voice i know thee how glad thou art of this word of mine because thou lookest on me with eyes of love and thinkest of me as better than i am though i am no ill woman and no beguiler but this is not all that i have to say to thee though it be much for there are more folk in the world than thou and i only but i told thee this first that thou mightest trust me in all things so my friend if thou canst refrain thy joy and thy longing a little and hearken to what concerneth thee and me and thy people and mine fair woman and sweet friend he said thou knowest of a gladness which is hard to bear if one must lay it aside for a while and of a longing which is hard to refrain if it mingle with another longing knowest thou not yea she said i know it yet yeah, said face of god i will forbear as thou biddest me tell me then what were the felons who were slain at carlstead knowest thou of them over well she said they are our foes this many a year and since we met last autumn they have become foes of you dalesmen also soon shall you have tidings of them and it was against them that i bade thee arm yesterday said face of god is it against them that thou wouldst have us do battle along with thy folk so it is she said no other foreman have we and now goldmane thou art to become a friend of the wolf and shalt before long be of affinity with our house that other day thou didst ask me to tell thee of me and mine and now will i do according to thine asking short shall my tale be because maybe thou shalt hear it told again and in goodly wise before thine whole folk as thou wottest we be now outlaws and wolves heads and whiles we lift the gear of men but ever if we may of ill men and not of good there is no worthy good man of the dale 
from whom we would take one hoof or a skin of wine or a cake of wax wherefore are we outlaws because we have been driven from our own and we bore away our lives and our weapons and little else and for our lands thou seest this vale in the howling wilderness and how narrow and poor it is though it hath been the nurse of warriors in time past hearken time long ago came the kindred of the wolf to these mountains of the world and they were in a pass in the stony maze and the utter wildness of the mountains and the foe was behind them in numbers not to be borne up against and so it befell that the pass forked and there were two ways before our folk and one part of them would take the way to the north and the other the way to the south and they could not agree which way the whole folk should take so they sundered into two companies and one took one way and one another now as to those who fared by the southern road we knew not what befell them nor for long and long had we any tale of them but we who took the northern road we happened on this vale amidst the wilderness and we were weary of fleeing from the overmastering foe and the dale seemed enough and a refuge and a place to dwell in and no man was there before us and few were like to find it and we were but a few so we dwelt here in this vale for as wild as it is the place where the sun shineth never in the winter and scant is the summer sunshine therein here we raised a doom ring and builded us a hall wherein thou now sittest beside me o friend and we dwelt here many seasons we had a few sheep in the wilderness and a few neat fed down the grass of the vale and we found gems and copper in the rocks about us wherewith at whiles to chaffer with the aliens and fish we drew from our river the shivering flood also it is not to be hidden that in those days we did not spare to lift the goods of men yea whiles would our warriors fare down unto the edges of the plain and lie in wait there till the time served and then drive the spoil from under the very walls of the cities our men were not little-hearted nor did our women lament the death of warriors overmuch for they were there to bear more warriors to the folk but the seasons passed and the folk multiplied in shadowy vale and livelihood seemed like to fail them and needs must they seek wider lands so by ways which thou wilt one day wot of we came into a valley that lieth north-west of shadowy vale a land like thine of burgdale or better wide it was plenteous of grass and trees well watered full of all things that man can desire were there men before us in this dale sayest thou yea but not very many and they feeble in battle weak of heart though strong of body these when they saw the sons of the wolf with weapons in their hands felt themselves puny before us and their hearts failed them and they came to us with gifts and offered to share the dale between them and us for they said there was enough for both folks so we took their offer and became their friends and some of our houses wedded wives of the strangers and gave them their women to wife therein they did amiss for the blended folk as the generations passed became softer than our blood and many were untrusty and greedy and tyrannous and the days of the whoredom fell upon us and when we deemed ourselves the mightiest then were we the nearest to our fall but the house whereof i am would never wed with these westlanders and other houses there were who had affinity with us who chiefly wedded with us of the wolf and their fathers had come with ours into that fruitful dale and these were called the red hand and the silver arm and the golden bushel and the ragged sword thou hast heard these names once before friend yea he said and as he spoke the picture of that other day came back to him and he called to mind all that he had said and his happiness of that hour seemed the more and the sweeter for that memory she went on fair and goodly is that dale as mine own eyes have seen and plentiful of all things and up in its mountains to the east are caves and pits when silver is digged abundantly therefore is the dale called silver dale hast thou heard thereof my friend nay said face of god though i have marvelled when she gat such fulson of silver he looked on her and marvelled for now she seemed as if it were another woman her eyes were gleaming bright her lips were parted 
there was a bright red flush on the pommels of her two cheeks as she spake again and said happy live the folk in silverdale for many and many winters and summers the seasons were good and no lack was there little sickness there was and less war and all seemed better than well it is strange that ye dalesmen have not heard of silverdale nay said he but i have not of rosedale i have heard as a land very far away but no further do we know of toward that airt lieth silverdale anywhere nigh to rosedale she said it is the next dale to it yet is it a far journey betwixt the two for the ice sea pusheth a horn in betwixt them and even below the ice the mountain neck is passable to none save a bold crag climber and to him only bearing his life in his hands but my friend i am but lingering over my tale because it grieveth me sore to have to tell it hearken then in the days when i had seen but ten summers and my brother was a very young man but exceeding strong and as beautiful as thou art now war fell on us without rumour or warning for there swarmed into silverdale though not by the ways whereby we had entered it a host of aliens short of stature crooked of limb foul of aspect but fierce warriors and armed full well they were men having no country to go back to though they had no women or children with them as we had when we were young in these lands but used all women whom they took as their beastly lust bade them making them their thralls if they slew them not soon we found that these foemen asked no more of us than all we had and therewithal our lives to be cast away or used for their service as beasts of burden or pleasure there then we gathered our fighting men and withstood them and if we had been all of the kindreds of the wolf and the fruit of the wives of warriors we should have driven back these felons and saved the dale though it may be more than half ruined but the most part of us were of that mingled blood that of the generations of the dalesmen whom we had conquered long ago and stout as they were of body their hearts failed them and they gave themselves up to the aliens to be as their oxen and asses why make a long tale of it we who were left and could brook death but not thraldom fought it out together women as well as men till the sweetness of life and a happy chance for escape bid us flee vanquished but free men for at the end of three days flight we had been driven up to the easternmost end of the dale and up a nigh to the jaws of the pass whereby the folk had first come into silverdale and we had those with us who knew every cranny of that way while to strangers who knew it not it was utterly impassable night was coming on also and even those murder carls were weary with slaying and moreover on this last day when they saw that they had won all they were fighting to keep and not to slay and a few stubborn carls and queens of what use would they be or where was the gain of risking life to win them so they forbore us and night came on moonless and dark and it was the early spring season when the days are not yet long and so by night and cloud we fled away and back again to shadowy vale forsooth we were but a few for when we were gotten into this vale this strip of grass and water in the wilderness and had told up our company we were but two hundred and thirty-five of men and women and children for there were a hundred and thirty and three grown men of all ages and of women grown seventy and five and one score and seven children whereof i was one for as thou mayst deem it was easier for grown men with weapons in their hands to escape from that slaughter than for women and children there sat we in yonder doom ring and took counsel and to some it seemed good that we should all dwell together in shadowy vale and beset the skirts of the foemen till the days should better but others deemed that there was little avail therein and there was a mighty man of the kindred stonewolf by name a man of middle age and he said that late in life had he tasted of war and though the banquet was made bitter with defeat yet did the meat seem wholesome to him come down with me to the cities of the plain said he all you who are stout warriors and leave we here the old men and the swains and the women and children hateful are the folk there and full of malice but soft withal and dastardly let us go down thither and make ourselves strong amongst them 
and sell our valour for their wealth till we come to rule them and they make us their kings and we establish the folk of the wolf amongst the aliens then will we come back hither and bring away that which we have left so he spake and the more part of the warriors yea said his reed and they went with him to the west land and amongst these was my brother folk might for that is his name in the kindred and i sorrowed at his departure for he had borne me thither out of the flames and the clash of swords and the press of battle and to me had he ever been kind and loving albeit he hath had the words of hard and froward used on him full oft so in this vale abode we that were left and the seasons passed some of the elders died and some of the children also but more children were born for amongst us were men and women to whom it was lawful to wed with each other even with this scanty remnant was left some of the life of the kindred of old days and after we had been here but a little while the young men yea and the old also and even some of the women would steal through the passes that we and we only knew of and would fall upon the aliens in silverdale as occasion served and lift their goods both live and dead and this became both a craft and a pastime amongst us nor may i hide that we sometimes went lifting otherwhere for in the summer and autumn we would fare west a little and abide in the woods the season through and hunt the deer thereof and whiles would we drive the spoil from the scattered folk not far from your shepherd folk but with the shepherds themselves and with you dalesmen we meddle not now that little wood lawn with the toft of an ancient dwelling in it wherein saith bome thou didst once rest was one of our summer abodes and later on we built the hall under the pine wood that thou knowest thus then grew up our young men and our maids were little softer e'en such as bome is and kind is she withal and it seemed in very sooth as if the spirit of the wolf was with us and the roughness of the waste made us fierce and law we had not and he did not though love was amongst us she stopped a while and fell amusing and her face softened and she turned to him with that sweet happy look upon it and said desolate and dreary as the dale thou deemest friend and yet for me i love it and its dark green water and it is to me as if the fathers of the kindred visit it and hold converse with us and there i grew up when i was little before i knew what a woman was and strange communings had i with the wilderness friend when we are wedded and thou art a great chieftain as thou wilt be i shall ask of thee the boon to suffer me to abide here at whiles that i may remember the days when i was little and the love of the kindred waxed in me this is but a little thing to ask said face of god i would thou hast asked me more fear not she said i shall ask thee for much and many things and some of them belike thou shalt deny me he shook his head but she smiled in his face and said yea so it is friend but hearken the seasons passed and six years wore and i was grown a tall slim maiden fleet of foot and able to endure toil enough though i never bore weapons nor have done so on a fair even of midsummer when we were together the most of us round about this hall and the doom ring we saw a tall man in bright war gear come forth into the dale by the path that thou camest and then another and another till there were two score and seven men at arms standing on the grass below the scree yonder by that time had we gotten some weapons in our hands and we stood together to meet the newcomers but they drew no sword and notched no shaft but came towards us laughing and joyous and lo it was my brother folk might and his men those that were left of them come back to us from the west land glad indeed was i to behold him and for him when he had taken me in his arms and looked up and down the dale he cried out in many fair places and many rich dwellings have i been but this is the hour that i have looked for now when we asked him concerning stonewolf and the others who were missing for ten tenths of stalwart men had fared to the westland he swept out his hand towards the west and said with a solemn face there they lie and grass groweth over their bones and we who have come aback and ye who have abided these are now the children of the wolf there are no more now on the earth 
let be it was a fair even and high was the feast in the hall that night and sweet was the converse with our folk come back a glad man was my brother folk might when he heard that for years past we had been lifting the gear of men and chiefly of the aliens in silverdale and he himself was become learned in war and a deft leader of men so the days passed and the seasons and we lived on as we might but with folk might's return there began to grow up in all our hearts what had long been flourishing in mine and that was the hope of one day winning back our own again and dying amidst the dear groves of silverdale within these years we had increased somewhat in number for if we had lost those warriors in the westland and some old men who had died in the dale yet our children had grown up i have now seen twenty and one summers and more were growing up moreover after the first year from the time when we began to fall upon the dusky men of silverdale from time to time they who went on such adventures set free such thralls of our blood as they could fall in with and whom they could trust in and they dwelt and yet dwell with us in the dale first and last we have taken in three score and twelve of such men and a score of women thralls withal now during those seasons and not very long ago after i was a woman grown the thought came to me and to folk might also that there were kindreds of the people dwelling anear us whom we might so deal with that they should become our friends and brothers in arms and that through them we might win back silverdale of rosedale we wotted already that the folk were naught of our blood feeble in the field cowed by the dusky men and at last made thralls to them so naught was to do there but folk might went to and fro to gather tidings at whiles i with him at whiles one or more of woodfather's children who with their father and mother and bome have abided in the vale ever since the great undoing soon he fell in with thy folk and first of all with the woodlanders and that was a joy to him for what ye what he got to know that these men were the children of those of our folk who had sundered from us in the mountain passes time long and long ago and he loved them for he saw that they were hardy and trusty and warriors at heart then he went amongst the shepherd folk and he deemed them good men easily stirred and deemed that they might soon be won to friendship and he knew that they were mostly come from the houses of the woodlanders so that they also were of the kindred and last he came into burgdale and found there a merry and happy folk little want to war but stout-hearted and nowise puny either of body or soul he went there often and learned much about them and deemed that they would not be hard to win to fellowship and he found that the house of the face was the chiefest house there and that the alderman and his sons were well beloved of all the folk and that they were the men to be won first since through them should all others be won i also went to burgstead with him twice as i told thee erst and i saw thee and i deemed that thou wouldst lightly become our friend and it came into my mind that i myself might wed thee and that the house of the face thereby might have affinity thenceforth with the children of the wolf he said why didst thou deem thus of me o friend she laughed and said dost thou long to hear me say the words when thou knowest my thought well so be it i saw thee both young and fair and i knew thee to be the son of a noble worthy guileless man and of a beauteous woman of great wits and good read and i found thee to be kind and open-handed and simple like thy father and like thy mother wiser than thou thyself knew of thyself and that thou wert desirous of deeds and fain of women she was silent for a while and he also then he said didst thou draw me to the woods and to thee she reddened and said i am no spell wife but true it is that wood mother made a waxen image of thee and thrust through the heart thereof the pin of my girdle buckle and stroked it every morning with an oak bough over which she has sung spells but dost thou not remember gold mane how that one day last haymonth as ye were resting in the meadows in the cool of the evening there came to you a minstrel that played to you on the fiddle and therewith sang a song that melted all your hearts and that this song told of the wildwood and what was therein of desire and peril and beguiling and death 
and love unto death itself dost thou remember friend yes he said and how when the minstrel was done stoneface fell to telling us more tales yet of the woodland and the minstrel sang again and yet again till his tales had entered into my very heart yea she said and that minstrel was wood once and i sent him to sing to thee and thine deeming that if thou didst hearken thou wouldst see the woodland and happen upon us he laughed and said thou didst not doubt but that if we met thou mightest do with me as thou wouldest so it is she said that i doubted it little therein wert thou wise said face of god but now that we are talking without guile to each other mightest thou tell me wherefore it was that folk might made that onslaught upon me for certain it is that he was minded to slay me she said it was sooth what i told thee that whiles he groweth so battle-eager that what so edge-tool he beareth must needs come out of the scabbard but there was more in it than that which i could not tell thee erst two days before thy coming he had been down to burgstead in the guise of an old carl such as thou sawest him with me in the market-place there was he guested in your hall and once more saw thee and the bride together and he saw the eyes of love wherewith she looked on thee for so much he told me and deemed that thou didst take her love but lightly and he himself looked on her with such love and this he told me not that he deemed naught good enough for her and would have had thee give thyself up wholly to her for my brother is a generous man my friend so when i told him on the morn of that day whereon we met that we looked to see thee that eve for indeed i am somewhat foreseeing he said look thou sunbeam if he cometh it is not unlike that i shall drive a spear through him wherefore said i can he serve our turn when he is dead said he i care little mine own turn will i serve thou sayest wherefore i tell thee this stripling beguileth to her torment the fairest woman that is in the world such an one as is meet to be the mother of chieftains and to stand by warriors in their day of peril i have seen her and thus have i seen her then said i greatly forsooth shalt thou pleasure her by slaying him and he answered i shall pleasure myself and one day she shall thank me when she taketh my hand in hers and we go together to the bride-bed therewith came over me a clear foresight of the hours to come and i said to him yea folk might cast the spear and draw the sword but him thou shalt not slay and thou shalt one day see him standing with us before the shafts of the dusky men so i spake but he looked fiercely at me and departed and shunned me all that day and by good hap i was hard at hand when thou drewest nigh our abode nay gold mane what wouldst thou with thy sword why art thou so red and wrathful wouldst thou fight with my brother because he loveth thy friend thine old playmate thy kinswoman and thinketh pity of her sorrow he said with knit brow and gleaming eyes would the man take her away from me perforce my friend she said thou art not yet so wise as not to be a fool at whiles is it not so that she herself hath taken herself from thee since she hath come to know that thou hast given thyself to another hath she noted naught of thee this winter and spring is she well pleased with the ways of thee he said thou hast spoken simply with me and i will do no less with thee it was but four days agone that she did me to wit that she knew of me how i sought my love on the mountain and she put me to sore shame and afterwards i wept for her sorrow therewith he told her all that the bride had said to him as he well might for he had forgotten no word of it then said the friend she shall have the token that she craveth and it is i that shall give it to her therewith she took from her finger a ring wherein was set a very fair changeful mountain stone and gave it to him and said thou shalt give her this and tell her whence thou hast it and tell her that i bid her remember that to-morrow is a new day End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of the roots of the mountains by william morris this librivox recording is in the public domain those two together hold the ring of the earth god 
and now they fell silent both of them and sat hearkening the sounds of the dale from the whistle of the plover down by the waterside to the far-off voices of the children and maidens about the kine in the lower meadows at last goldmain took up the word and said sweet friend tell me the uttermost of what thou wouldst have of me is it not that i should stand by thee and thine in the folk-moat of the dalesmen and speak for you when ye pray us for help against your foemen and then again that i do my best when ye and we are arrayed for battle against the dusky men this is easy to do and great is the reward thou offerest me i look for this service of thee she said and none other and when i go down to the battle said he shalt thou be sorry for our sundering she said there shall be no sundering i shall wend with thee said he and if i was slain in the battle wouldst thou lament me thou shalt not be slain she said again there was silence betwixt them till at last he said this then is why thou didst draw me to thee in the wildwood yea said she for a while no word was spoken and face of god looked on her till she cast her eyes down before him then at last he spake and the colour came and went in his face as he said tell me thy name what it is she said i am called the sunbeam then he said and his voice trembled therewith o sunbeam i have been seeking pleasant and cunning words and can find none such but tell me this if thou wilt dost thou desire me as i desire thee or is it that thou wilt suffer me to wed thee and bed thee at last as mere payment for the help that i shall give to thee and thine nay doubt it not that i will take the payment if this is what thou wilt give me and naught else yet tell me her face grew troubled and she said gold mane maybe that thou hast now asked me one question too many for this is no fair game to be played between us for thee as i deem there are this day but two people in the world and that is thou and i and the earth is for us two alone but my friend though i have seen but twenty and one summers it is no wise so with me and to me there are many in the world and chiefly the folk of the wolf amidst whose very heart i have grown up moreover i can think of her whom i have supplanted the bride to wit and i know her and how bitter and empty her days shall be for a while and how vain all our reeds for her shall seem to her yea i know her sorrow and see it and grieve for it and so canst not thou unless thou verily see her before thee her face unhappy and her voice changed and hard well i will tell thee what thou askest when i drew thee to me on the mountain i thought but of the friendship and brotherhood to be knitted up between our two folks nor did i anywise desire thy love of a young man but when i saw thee on the heath and in the hall that day it pleased me to think that a man so fair and chieftain-like should one day lie by my side and again when i saw that the love of me had taken hold of thee i would not have thee grieved because of me but would have thee happy and now what shall i say i know not i cannot tell yet am i the friend as erst i called myself and goldmain i have seen hitherto but the outward show and image of thee and though that be goodly how would it be if thou didst shame me with little-heartedness and evil deeds let me see thee in the folk-moat and the battle and then may i answer thee then she held her peace and he answered nothing and she turned her face from him and said out on it have i beguiled myself as well as thee these are but empty words i have been saying if thou wilt drag the truth out of me this is the very truth that to-day is happy to me as it is to thee and that i have longed sore for its coming o oh, gold mane o oh, speech friend if thou wert to pray me or command me that i lie in thine arms to-night i should know not how to gainsay thee yet i beseech thee to forbear lest thy death and mine come of it and why should we die o oh friend when we are so young and the world lies so fair before us and the happy days are at hand when the children of the wolf and the kindreds of the dale shall deliver the folk and all days shall be good and all years they had both risen up as she spake and now he put forth his hands to her and took her in his arms wondering the while as he drew her to him 
how much slenderer and smaller and weaker she seemed in his embrace than he had thought of her and when their lips met he felt that she kissed him as he her then he held her by the shoulders at arm's length from him and beheld her face how her eyes were closed and her lips quivering but before him in a moment of time passed a picture of the life to be in the fair dale and all she would give him there and the days good and lovely from morn to eve and eve to morn and though in that moment it was hard for him to speak at last he spoke in a voice hoarse at first and said thou sayest sooth o friend we will not die but live i will not drag our deaths upon us both nor put a sword in the hands of folk might who loves me not then he kissed her on the brow and said now shalt thou take me by the hand and lead me forth from the hall for the day is waxing old and here me seemeth in this dim hall there are words crossing in the air about us words spoken in days long ago and tales of old time that keep egging me on to do my will and die because that is all that the world hath for a valiant man and to such words i would not hearken for in this hour i have no will to die nor can i think of death she took his hand and led him forth without more words and they went hand in hand and paced slowly round the doom ring the light air breathing upon them till their faces were as calm and quiet as their wont was and hers especially as bright and happy as when he had first seen her that day the sun was sinking now and only sent one golden ray into the valley through a cleft in the western rock wall but the sky overhead was bright and clear from the meadows came the sound of the lowing of kine and the voices of children a-sporting and it seemed to goldmain that they were drawing nigher both the children and the kine and somewhat he begrudged that he should not be alone with the friend now when they had made half the circuit of the doom ring the sunbeam stopped him and then led him through the ring of stones and brought him up to the altar which was amidst of it and the altar was a great black stone hewn smooth and clean and with the image of the wolf carven on the front thereof and on its face lay the gold ring which the priest or captain of the folk bore on his arm between the god and the people at all folk motes so she said this is the altar of the god of earth and often hath it been reddened by mighty men and thereon lieth the ring of the sons of the wolf and now it were well that we swore troth on that ring before my brother cometh for now he will soon be here then goldmain took the ring and thrust his right hand through it and took her right hand in his so that the ring lay on both their hands and therewith he spake aloud i am face of god of the house of the face and i do thee to wit o god of the earth that i pledge my troth to this woman the sunbeam of the kindred of the wolf to beget my offspring on her and to live with her and to die with her so help me thou god of the earth and warrior and the god of the face then spake the sunbeam i the sunbeam of the children of the wolf pledge my troth to face of god to lie in his bed and to bear his children and none others and to be his speech friend till i die so help me the wolf and the warrior and the god of the earth then they laid the ring on the altar again and they kissed each other long and sweetly and then turned away from the altar and departed from the doom ring going hand in hand together down the meadow and as they went the noise of the kine and the children grew nearer and nearer and presently came the whole company of them round a ness of the rock wall there were some thirty little lads and lasses driving on the milch kine with half a score of older maids and grown women one of whom was Bomay, who was lightly and scantily clad as one who heeds not the weather or deems all months midsummer the children came running up merrily when they saw the sunbeam but stopped short shyly when they noted the tall fair stranger with her they were all strong and sturdy children and some very fair but brown with the weather if not with the sun Bomay came up to goldmain and took his hand and greeted him kindly and said so here thou art at last in shadowy vale and i hope that thou art content therewith and as happy as i would wish thee to be well 
this is the first time and when thou comest the second time it may well be that the world shall be growing better she held the distaff which she bore in her hand for she had been spinning as if it were a spear her limbs were goodly and shapely and she trod the thick grass of the vale with a kind of wary firmness as though foemen might be lurking near by the sunbeam smiled upon her kindly and said that shall not fail to be bome ye have won a new friend to-day but tell me when dost thou look to see the men here for i was down by the water when they went away yesterday they shall come to the dale a little after sunset said bome shall i abide them my friend said goldmane turning to the sunbeam yea she said for what else art thou come hither or art thou so pressed to depart from us last time we met thou wert not so hasty to sunder they smiled on each other and bome looked on them and laughed outright then a flush showed in her cheeks through the tan of them and she turned toward the children and the other women who were busied about the milking of the kine but those two sat down together on a bank amidst the plain meadow facing the river and the eastern rock wall and the sunbeam said i am fain to speak to thee and see thine eyes watching me while i speak and now my friend i will tell thee something unasked which has to do with what e'en now thou didst ask me for i would have thee trust me wholly and know me for what i am time was i schemed and planned for this day of betrothal but now i tell thee it has become no longer needful for bringing to pass our fellowship in arms with thy people yea yesterday ere he went on a hunt whereof he shall tell thee folk might was against it in words at least and yet as one who would have it done if he might have no part in it so in good sooth this hand that lieth in thine is the hand of a wilful woman who desireth a man and would keep him for her speech friend now art thou fond and happy yet bear in mind that there are deeds to be done and the troth we have just plighted must be paid for so hearken i bid thee dost thou care to know why the wheedling of thee is no longer needful to us he said a little while ago i should have said yea if thy lips say the words but now o friend it seemeth as if thine heart were already become a part of mine and i feel as if the chieftain were growing up in me and the longing for deeds so i say tell me for i were fain to hear what toucheth the welfare of thy folk and their fellowship with my folk for on that also have i set my heart she said gravely and with solemn eyes what thou sayest is good full glad am i that i have not plighted my troth to a mere goodly lad but rather to a chieftain and a warrior now then hearken since i saw thee first in the autumn this hath happened that the dusky men increasing both in numbers and insolence have it in their hearts to win more than silverdale and it is years since they have fallen upon rosedale and conquered it rather by murder than by battle and made all men thralls there for feeble were the folk thereof and doubt it not but that they will look into burgdale before long they are already abroad in the woods and were it not for the fear of the wolf they would be thicker therein and faring wider for we have slain many of them coming upon them unawares and they know not where we dwell nor who we be so they fear to spread about over much and pry into unknown places lest the wolf howl upon them yet beware for they will gather in numbers that we may not meet and then will they swarm into the dale and if ye would live your happy life that ye love so well ye must now fight for it and in that battle must ye needs join yourselves to us that we may help each other herein have ye naught to choose for now with you it is no longer a thing to talk of whether ye will help certain strangers and guests and thereby win some gain to yourselves but whether ye have the hearts to fight for yourselves and the wits to be the fellows of tall men and stout warriors who have pledged their lives to win or die for it she was silent a little and then turned and looked fondly on face of god and said therefore gold mane we need thee no longer for thou must needs fight in our battle i have no longer aught to do to wheedle thee to love me yet if thou wilt love me then i am a glad woman he said thou wottest well that thou hast all my love neither will i fail thee in the battle 
I am not little-hearted, though I would have given myself to thee for no reward. It is well, said the sunbeam, naught is undone by that which I have done. Moreover, it is good that we have plighted troth to-day, for folk might will presently hear thereof, and he must needs abide the thing which is done. Hearken, he cometh. For as she spoke there came a glad cry from the women and children, and those two stood up and turned toward the west, and beheld the warriors of the wolf coming down into the dale by the way that Goldmane had come. Come, said the sunbeam, here are your brethren in arms. Let us go greet them. They will rejoice in thee. So they went thither, and there stood eighty and seven men on the grass below the scree, and folk might their captain, and besides some valiant women, and a few carls who were on watch on the waste, and a half-score who had been left in the dale. These were all the warriors of the wolf. They were clad in no holiday raiment, not even folk might, but were in sheep-brown gear of the coarsest, like to husbandmen late come from the plough, but armed well and goodly. But when the twain drew near, the men clashed their spears on their shields, and cried out for joy of them, for they all knew what face of God's presence there betokened of fellowship with the kindreds. But folk might came forward, and took face of God's hand, and greeted him, and said, Hail, son of the alderman, here hast thou come into the ancient abode of chieftains and warriors, and belike deeds await thee also. Yet his brow was knitted as he said these words, and he spake slowly, as one that constraineth himself. But presently his face cleared somewhat, and he said, Dalesman, it be over thy people to bestir them if ye would live and see good days. Hath my sister told thee what is toward? Or what sayest thou? Hail to thee, son of the wolf, said face of God. Thy sister hath told me all, and even if these dusky felons were not our foemen also, yet could I have my way, we should have given thee all help, and should have brought back peace and good days to thy folk. Then folk might, flushed red and spake, as he cast out his hand towards the warriors, and up and down towards the dale. These be my folk, and these only, and as to peace, only those of us know of it, who are old men. Yet is it well, and if we and ye together be strong enough to bring back good days to the feeble men whom the dusky ones torment in Silverdale, it shall be better yet. Then he turned about to his sister, and looked keenly into her eyes, till she reddened, and took her hand, and looked at the wrist, and said, O oh, sister, see I not the mark on thy wrist of the ring of the god of the earth? Have not oaths been sworn since yesterday? True it is, she said, that this man and I have plighted troth together at the altar of the doom ring. Said folk might, Thou wilt have thy will, and I may not amend it. Therewith he turned about to face of God, and said, Thou must look to it to keep this oath, whatever other one thou hast failed in, said face of God, somewhat wrathfully, I shall keep it, whether thou biddest me to keep it or break it. That is well, said folk might, and then, for all that hath gone before, thou mayest in a manner pay, if thou art dauntless before the foe. I look to be no blencher in the battle, said face of God, that is not the fashion of our kindred, whosoever may be before us, yea, and even were it thy blade, O mighty warrior of the wolf, I would do my best to meet it in manly fashion. As he spake, he half drew forth Dale Warden from his sheath, looking steadily into the eyes of Folk Might, and the sunbeam looked upon him happily. But Folk Might laughed and said, Thy sword is good, and I deem that thine heart will not fail thee. But it is by my side and not in the face of me that thou shalt redden the good blade. I see not the day when we twain shall hew at each other. Then in a while he spake again. Thou must pardon us if our words are rough, for we have stood in rough places, where we had to speak both short and loud, whereas there was much to do. But now will we twain talk of matters that concern chieftains who are going on a hard adventure. And ye women, do ye dight the hall for the evening feast, which shall be the feast of the troth plight for you twain. This indeed we owe the O guest, 
for little shall be thine heritage which thou shalt have with my sister over and above that thy sword winneth for thee but the sunbeam said hast thou any to-night yea he said spear god how many was it there came forward a tall man bearing an axe in his right hand and carrying over his shoulder by his left hand a bundle of silver arm-rings just such as goldmain had seen on the felons who were slain by woodgrey's house the carl cast them on the ground and then knelt down and fell to telling them over and then looked up and said twelve yesterday in the wood where the battle was going on and this morning seven by the tarn in the pine wood and six near this eastern edge of the wood one score and five all told but folk might they are coming nigh to shadowy vale sooth is that said folk might but it shall be luke to come now apart with me face of god so the others went their ways toward the hall while folk might led the burgdaler to a sheltered nook under the sheer rocks and there they sat down to talk and folk might asked goldmain closely of the muster of the dalesmen and the shepherds and the woodland carls and he was well pleased when face of god told him of how many could march to a stricken field and of their archery and of their weapons and their goodness all this took some time in the telling and now night was coming on apace and folk might said now will it be time to go to the hall but keep in thy mind that these dusky men will overrun ye unless ye deal with them betimes these are of a kind that ye must cast fear into their hearts by falling on them for if ye abide till they fall upon you they are like winter wolves that swarm on and on how many soever ye slay and this above all things shall help you that we shall bring you whereas ye shall fall on them unawares and destroy them as boys do with a wasp's nest yet shall many a mother's son bite the dust is it not so that in four weeks time is your spring feast and market at burgstead and thereafter the great folk moat so it is said goldmain thither shall i come then said folk might and give myself out for the slayer of rusty and the ransacker of heartsbane and pennythumb and therefore shall i offer good blood white and theft white and thy father shall take that for he is a just man then shall i tell my tale yet it may be thou shalt see us before if battle be tied and now fair befall this new year for soon shall the scabbards be empty and the white swords be dancing in the air and spears and axes shall be the growth of this springtide and he leapt up from his seat and walked to and fro before goldmain and now was it grown quite dark then folk might turn to face of god and said come guest the windows of the hall are yellow let us to the feast to-morrow shalt thou get thee to the beginning of this work i hope of thee that thou art a good sword else have i done a folly and my sister a worse one but now forget that and feast goldmain arose not very well at ease for the man seemed overbearing yet how might he fall upon the sunbeam's kindred and the captain of these new brethren in arms so he spake not but folk might said to him yet i would not have thee forget that i was wroth with thee when i saw thee to-day and had it not been for the coming battle i had drawn sword upon thee then face of god's wrath was stirred and he said there is yet time for that but why art thou wroth with me and i shall tell thee that there is little manliness in thy chiding for how may i fight with thee thou the brother of my plighted speech friend and my captain in this battle therein thou sayest sooth said folk might but hard it was to see you two standing together and thou canst not give the bride to me as i give my sister to thee for i have seen her and i have seen her looking at thee and i know that she will not have it so then they went on together toward the hall and face of god was silent and somewhat troubled and as they drew near to the hall folk might spake again yet time may amend it and if not there is the battle and maybe the end now we be merry so they went into the hall together and there was the sunbeam gloriously arrayed as erst in the woodland bower and face of god sat on the dais beside her and the uttermost sweetness of desire entered into his soul as he noted her eyes and her mouth that were grown so kind to him and her hand that strayed toward his the hall was full of folk 
and all those warriors were there with Woodfather and his sons, and Woodmother, and Bowmay, and many other women, and Goldmane looked down the hall, and deemed that he had never seen such stalwart bodies of men, or so bold and meet for battle. But as for the women, he had seen fairer in Burgdale, but these were fair of their own fashion, shapely and well-knit, and strong-armed and large-limbed, yet sweet-voiced and gentle withal. Nay, the very lads of fifteen winters or so, whereof a few were there, seemed bold and bright-eyed and keen of wit, and it seemed like that, if the warriors fared afield, these would be with them. So wore the feast, and folk might, as aforetime, amongst the healths, called on men to drink to the jaws of the wolf, and the red hand, and the silver arm, and the golden bushel, and the ragged sword. But now had face of God no need to ask what these meant, since he knew that they were the names of the kindreds of the wolf. They drank also to the troth plight, and to those twain, and shouted aloud over the health, and clashed their weapons. And Goldmane wondered what echo of that shout would reach to Burgstead. Then sang men songs of old time, and amongst them Woodwant stood with his fiddle amidst the hall, and Bowmay beside him, and they sang in turn to it sweetly and clearly, and this is some of what they sang. Wild is the waste, and long leagues over, whither then wend ye spear and sword, where naught shall see your helms but the plover, far and far from the dear dale's sward. Many a league shall we wend together, with helm and spear and bended bow. Hark, how the wind blows up for weather, dark shall the night be whither we go. Dark shall the night be round the byre, and dark as we drive the brindled kine. Dark and dark round the beacon fire, dark down in the pass round our wavering line. Turn on thy path, O fair foot maiden, and come our ways by the pathless road. Look how the clouds hang low and laden over the walls of the old abode. Bare are my feet for the rough waste wending, wild is the wind, and my kirtle's thin. Faint shall I be ere the long ways ending, drops down to the dale and the grief therein. Do on the brogues of the wild wood rover, do on the burnies ring close mail. Take thou the staff that the barbs hang over, o'er the wind and the waste and the way to prevail. Come, for how from thee shall I sunder? Come, that a tale may arise in the land. Come, that the night may be held for a wonder, when the wolf was led by a maiden's hand. Now will I fare as ye are faring, and wend no way but the way ye wend, and bear but the burdens ye are bearing, and end the day as ye shall end. And many an eve, when the clouds are drifting, down through the dale till they dim the roof, Shall they tell in the hall of the maiden's lifting, Of how we drave the spoil aloof? Over the moss, through the wind and the weather, Through the morn and the eve and the death of the day, When we man and maid together, For out of the waste is born the fray. Then the sunbeam spake to Goldmane softly, And told him how this song was made by a minstrel Concerning a foray in the early days Of their first abode in shadowy vale and how in good sooth a maiden led the fray and was the captain of the warriors erst she said this was counted as a wonder but now we are so few that it is no wonder though the women will do whatsoever they may so they talked and goldmane was very happy but ere the good knight's cup was drunk folk might spake to face of god and said it were well that ye rose betimes in the morning but thou shalt not go back by the way thou camest would wise and another shall go with thee and show thee a way across the necks and the heaths which is rough enough as far as toil goes but where thy life shall be safer and thereby shalt thou hit the grill of the weltering water and so come down safely into burgdale now that we are friends and fellows it is no hurt for thee to know the shortest way to shadowy vale what thou shalt tell concerning us in burgdale i'll leave the tale thereof to thee yet belike Thou wilt not tell everything till I come to Burgstead at the spring market tide. Now must I presently to bed, for before daylight to-morrow must I be following the hunt along with two score good men of ours. What beast is afield then? said Goldmane. Said Folkmite, 
the beasts that beset our lives, the dusky men. In these days, we've learned how to find companies of them, and forsooth, every week they draw nigher to this dale, and some day they should happen upon us if we were not to look to it, and then would there be a murder great and grim. Therefore, we scour the heaths round about, and the skirts of the woodland, and we fall upon these felons in diverse guises, so that they may not know us for the same men. Whiles are we clad in homespun, as to-day, and seem like to field-working carls. Whiles in scarlet and gold, like the knights of the Westland. Whiles in wolf-skins. Whiles in white glittering gear, like the whites of the waste. And in all guises, these felons, for all their fierce hearts, fear us, and flee from us. And we follow and slay them, and so minish their numbers somewhat, against the great day of battle. Tell me, said Goldmaid, when we fall upon Silverdale, shall their thralls, the old dale-dwellers, fight for them or for us? Said folk might, the dusky men will not dare to put weapons into the hands of their thralls. Nay, the thralls shall help us, for though they have but small stomach for the fight, yet joyfully when the fight is over shall they cut their master's throats. How is it with these thralls? said Goldmaid. I have never seen a thrall. But I, said Folk Might, have seen many down in the cities, and there were thralls who were the tyrants of thralls, and held the whip over them, and of the others there were some who were not very hardly entreated. But with these it is otherwise, and they all bear grievous pains daily, for the dusky men are as hogs in a garden of lilies. Whatsoever is fair, they have defiled and deflowered, and they wallow in our fair halls, as swine strayed from the dunghill. No delight in life, no sweet days do they have for themselves, and they begrudge the delight of others therein. Therefore their thralls know no rest or solace, their reward of toil is many stripes, and the healing of their stripes grievous toil. To many have they appointed to dig and mine in the silver-yielding cliffs, and of all the tasks is that the sorest, and there do stripes abound the most. Such thralls art thou happy not to behold, till thou hast set them free, as we shall do. Tell me again, said Face of God, is there no mixed folk between these dusky men and the dalesmen, since they have no women of their own, but lie with the women of the dale? Moreover, do not the poor folk of the dale beget and bear children, so that there are thralls born of thralls? Wisely thou askest this, said Folk Might, but thereof shall I tell thee, that when a dusky carl mingles with a woman of the dale, the child which she beareth shall oftenest favour his race and not hers, or else shall it be witless, a fool natural. But as for the children of these poor thralls, yea, the masters cause them to breed, if so their masterships will, and when the children are born, they keep them, or slay them as they will, as they would with whelps or calves. To be short, Year by year these vile wretches grow fiercer and more beastly, and their thralls more hapless and downtrodden. And now at last is come the time either to do or to die, as ye men of Burgdale shall speedily find out. But now I must go sleep, if I am to be where I look to be at sunrise to-morrow. Therewith he called for the sleeping cup, and it was drunk, and all men fared to bed. But the sunbeam took Goldmane's hand, ere they parted, and said, I shall arise betimes on the morrow, so I say not farewell to-night. Yea, and after to-morrow, it shall not be long ere we meet again. So Goldmane lay down in that ancient hall, and it seemed to him, ere he slept, as if his own kindred were slipping away from him, and he were becoming a child of the wolf. And yet, said he to himself, I am become a man, for my friend, now she no longer telleth me to do or forbear, and I tremble. Nay, rather she is fain to take the word from me, and this great warrior and right man, he talketh with me as if I were a chieftain meet for converse with chieftains. Even so it is, and shall be. And soon thereafter he fell asleep in the hall in shadowy vale. End of chapter 20「Chapter 21 of The Roots of the Mountain by William Morris 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Face of God looketh on the dusky men. When he awoke again, he saw a man standing over him, and knew him for Woodwise. He was clad in his war gear, and had his quiver at his back, and his bow in his hand, for Woodfather's children were all good bowmen, though not so sure as bow may. He spake to face of God, Dawn is in the sky, Dalesman. There is yet time for thee to wash the night off thee in our bath of the shivering flood, and to put thy mouth to the milk bowl. But time for naught else, for I and Bowmay are appointed thy fellows for the road, and it were well that we were back home speedily. So face of God leapt up, and went forth from the hall, and Woodwise led to where was a pool in the river, with steps cut down to it in the rocky bank. This, said Woodwise, is the Carl's bath, but the Queen's is lower down, where the water is wider, and shallower below the little Middale force. So Goldmane stripped off his raiment and leapt into the ice-cold pool, and they had brought his weapons and war-gear with them, so when he came out, he clad and armed himself for the road, and then turned with Woodwise toward the outgate of the dale, and soon they saw two men coming from lower down the water, in such wise that they would presently cross their path, and as yet it was little more than twilight, so that they saw not at first who they were. But as they drew nearer, they knew them for the sunbeam and bowmay. The sunbeam was clad but in her white linen smock and blue gown as he had first seen her. Her hair was wet and dripping with the river, her face fresh and rosy. She carried in her two hands a great bowl of milk, and stepped delicately, lest she should spill it. But Bome was clad in her war gear, with helm and burney, and a quiver at her back, and bended bow in her hand. So they greeted each other kindly, and the sunbeam gave the bowl to face of God, and said, Drink, guest, for thou hast a long and thirsty robe before thee. So face of God drank, and gave her the bowl back again, and she smiled on him and drank, and the others after her, till the bowl was empty. Then Bowmay put her hand on Woodwise's shoulder, and they led on toward the outgate, while those twain followed them hand in hand. But the sunbeam said, This is the new day I spoke of, and lo, it bringeth our sundering with it. Yet shall it be no longer than a day when all is said, a new day shall follow after. And now, my friend, I shall see thee no later than the April market, for doubt not that I shall go thither with folk might, whether he will or not. Also, as I led thee out of the house when we last met, so shall I lead thee out of the dale to-day, and I will go with thee a little way on the waste, and therefore am I shod this morning, as thou seest, for the ways on the waste are rough, and now I bid thee have courage while my hand holdeth thine, for afterwards I need not bid thee anything, for thou wilt have enough to do when thou comest to thy folk, and must needs think more of warriors than of maidens. He looked at her and longed for her, but said soberly, Thou art kind, O friend, and thinkest kindly of me ever. But methinks it were not well done for thee to wend with me over a deal of the waste, and come back by thyself alone, when ye have so many foemen nearby. Nay, she said, they be not so near as that yet and I wot that folk might hath gone forth toward the north-west, where he looketh to fall in with a company of the four men. His battle shall be a guard unto us. I pray thee turn back at the top of the outgate, said he, and be not venturesome. Thou wottest that the pitcher is not broken the first time it goeth to the well, nor maybe the twentieth, but at last it cometh not back. She said, Nevertheless I shall have my will herein and it is but a little way I will wend with thee. Therewith they come to the scree, and talk fell down between them as they clomb it. But when they were in the darksome passage of the rocks, and could scarce see one another, face of God said, Where then is another outgate from the dale? Is it not up the water? Yea, she said, and there is none other. At the lower end the rocks rise sheer from out the water, and a little further down, is a great force thundering betwixt them, so that by no boat or raft may ye come out of the dale. But the outgate up the water is called the Road of War, as this is named the Path of Peace, but now are always ways of war. 
There is peace in my heart, said Goldmane. She answered not for a while, but pressed his hand, and he felt her breath on his cheek, and even therewithal they came out of the dark, and Goldmane saw that her cheek was flushed, and now she spake. One thing would I say to thee, my friend, thou hast seen me amongst men of war, amongst outlaws who seek violence. Thou hast heard me bid my brother to count the slain, and I shrinking not. Thou knowest, for I have told thee, how I have schemed and schemed for victorious battle. Yet I would not have thee think of me as a chooser of the slain, a warrior maiden, or as of one who hath no joy, save in a battle, whereto she biddeth others. O oh, friend, the many peaceful hours that I have had on the grass down yonder, sitting with my rock and spindle in hand, the children round about my knees, hearkening to some old story so well remembered by me, or the milking of the kine in the dewy summer even, when all was still but for the voice of the water and the cries of the happy children, and there round about me were the dear and beauteous maidens with whom I had grown up, happy amidst all our troubles, since their life was free and they knew no guile. In such times my heart was at peace, indeed, and it seemed to me as if we had won all we needed, as if war and turmoil were over after they had brought about peace and good days for our little folk. And as for the days that be, are they not as that rugged pass, full of bitter winds and the voice of hurrying waters, that leadeth yonder to Silverdale, as thou hast divined? And there is naught good in it save that the breath of life is therein, and that it leadeth to pleasant places, and the peace and plenty of the fair dale. Sweet friend, he said, what thou sayest is better than well, for time shall be, if we come alive out of this pass of battle and bitter strife, when I shall lead thee into Burgdale to dwell there. And thou wottest of our people, that there is little strife and grudging amongst them, and that they are merry and fair to look on, both men and women, and no man there lacketh what the earth may give us and it is a saying amongst us that there may a man have that which he desireth save the sun and moon in his hands to play with and of this gladness which is made up of many little matters what story may be told yet amongst it shall i live and thou with me and ill indeed it were if it wearied thee and thou wert ever longing for some day of victorious strife and to behold me coming back from battle high raised on the shields of men and crowned with bay if thine ears must ever be tickled with the talk of men and their songs concerning my warrior deeds. For thus it shall not be. When I drive the herds it shall be at the neighbour's bidding, whereso they will. Not necks of men shall I smite, but the stalks of the tall wheat, and the bowls of the timber-trees which the wood-reeve hath marked for felling. The stilts of the plough rather than the hilts of the sword shall harden my hands. My shafts shall be for the deer, and my spears for the wood bore, till war and sorrow fall upon us, and I fight for the ceasing of war and trouble. And though I be called a chief and of the blood of chiefs, yet shall I not be masterful to the good man of the dale, but rather to my hound. For my chieftainship shall be, that I shall be well beloved and trusted, and that no man shall grudge against me. Canst thou learn to love such a life which to me seemeth lovely? And thou, of whom I say that thou art as if thou wert come down from the golden chairs of the burg of the gods. They were well nigh out of the steep path by now, and the daylight was bright about them. There she stayed her feet a moment, and turned to him and said, All this should I love even now, if the grief of our folk were but healed, and hereafter shall I learn yet more of thy well-beloved face. Therewith she laid her face to his, and kissed him fondly, and put his hand to her side, and held it there, saying, Soon shall we be one, in body and in soul. And he laughed with joy and pride of life, and took her hand, and led her on again, and said, Yet feel the cold rings of my hauberk, my friend. Look at the spears that cumber my hand, and at Dalewarden hanging by my side. Thou shalt yet see me as the slain's chooser would see her speech, friend. For there is much to do ere we win wheat harvest in Burgdale. Therewith they stepped together on to the level ground of the waste, and saw Bome sitting on a stone hard by, 
and Woodwise standing beside her, bending his bow. Bowmay smiled on Goldmane and rose up, and they all went on together, turning so that they went nearly alongside the wall of the vale, but westering a little. Then the sunbeam said, Many a time have I trodden this heath alongside our rock wall, for if ye wend a little further, as our faces are turned, ye come to the crags over the place where the shivering flood goeth out of shadowy vale. There, when ye have clomb a little, mayst thou stand on the edge of the rock wall, and look down, and behold the flood swirling and eddying in the black gorge of the rocks, and see presently the reek of the force go up, and hear the thunder of the waters as they pour over it. And all this about us now is as the garden of our house. Is it not so, Beaumay? Yea, said she, and there are goodly cluster berries to be gotten here about in the autumn. Many a time of the sunbeam and I reddened our lips with them. Yet it is best to be wary when war is abroad and hot with all. Yea, said the sunbeam, and all this place comes into the story of our house. Lo, Goldmain, two score paces before us, a little on our right hand, those five grey stones. They are called the rocks of the elders, for there in the first days of our abiding in shadowy vale, the elders were wont to come together to talk privily upon our matters. Face of God looked thither as she spoke, but therewith saw Bome, who went on the left hand of the sunbeam as face of God on her right hand, notch a shaft on her bent bow, and Woodwise, who was on his right hand, saw it also, and did the like. And therewithal, face of God got his target on to his arm, and even as he did so, Bome cried out suddenly, Yea, yea, cast thyself to the ground, sunbeam, go, main, targe and spear, targe and spear, for I see steel gleaming yonder out from behind the elder's rocks. Scarce were the words out of her mouth, ere three shafts came flying, and the bowstrings twanged. Goldmane felt that one smote his helm and glanced from it. Therewithal he saw the sunbeam fall to earth, though he knew not if she had but cast herself down as Bome bade. Bome's string twanged at once, and a yell came from the foemen, but Woodwise loosed not, but set his hand to his mouth, and gave a loud, wild cry. Ha-ha! Ha-ha! How-wow-wow! ending in a long and exceeding great whoop like naught but the wolf's howl. Now Goldmane, thinking swiftly in a moment of time, as war-meat men do, judged that if the sunbeam were hurt, and she had made no cry, it were yet wiser to fall on the foe before turning to tend her, or else all might be lost. So he rushed forward, spear in hand, and target on arm, and saw as he opened up the flank of the elder's rocks, six men, whereof one leaned aback on the rock with Bome's shaft in his shoulder, and two others were just in the act of loosing at him. In a moment, as he rushed at them, one shaft went whistling by him, and the other glanced from off his target. He cast a spear as he bounded on, and saw it smite one of the shooters full in the naked face, and saw the blood spout out and change his face, and the man roll over, and then, in another moment, four men were hewing at him with their short steel axes. He thrust out his target against them, and then let the weight of his body come on his other spear, and drave it through the second shooter's throat, and even therewith was smitten on the helm so hard that, though the alderman's work held out, he fell to his knees, holding his target over his head, and striving to draw forth Dale Warden. In the nick of time, a shaft whistled close by his ear, and as he rose to his feet again, he saw his foeman rolling over and over, clutching at the ling with both hands. Then rang out again the terrible wolf-whoop from Woodwise's mouth, and both he and Bome loosed a shaft, for the two other foes had turned their backs and were fleeing fast. Again Bome hit the clout, and the dusky man fell dead at once, but Woodwise's arrow flew over the felon's shoulder as he ran. Then in a trice was Goldmane bounding after him, like the hare just roused from her form, for it came into his head that these felons had beheld them coming out of the vale, and that if even this one man escaped, he would bring his company down upon the vale-dwellers. 
strong and light foot as any was face of god and though he was cumbered with his hauberk yet was iron face's handiwork far lighter than the war coat of the dusky man and the race was soon over the felon turned breathless to meet goldmane who drave his target against him and cast him to earth and as he strove to rise smote off his head at one stroke for dale warden was a good sword and the dalesman as fierce of mood as might be there he let the felon lie and turning walked back swiftly toward the elder's rocks and found there woodwise and the dead foemen for the carl had slain the wounded and he was now drawing the silver arm-rings off the slain men for all these dusky felons bore silver arm-rings but Bome was walking towards the sunbeam, and thitherward followed Goldmane speedily. He found her sitting on a tussock of grass, close by where she had fallen, her face pale, her eyes eager and gleaming. She looked up at him as he drew nigher, and said, Friend, art thou hurt? Nay, he said, and thou, thou art pale. I am not hurt, she said. Then she smiled and said again, Did I not tell thee? that i am no warrior like bome here such deeds make maidens pale said bome if you will have the truth goldmane she is not wont to grow pale when battle is nigh her look you she hath the gift of a new delight and findeth it sweeter and softer than she had any thought of and now hath she feared lest it should be taken from her bome saith but the sooth said sunbeam simply and kind it is of her to say it i saw thee bome and good was thy shooting, and I love thee for it, said Bome. I never shoot otherwise than well, but these idle shooters of the dusky ones, whereabouts nigh to thee went their shafts, said the sunbeam. One just lifted the hair by my left ear, and that was not so ill-aimed. As for the other, it pierced my raiment by my right knee, and pinned me to the earth, so that I tottered and fell, and my gown and smock are grievously wounded, both of them and she took the folds of the garments in her hands to show the rents therein and her colour was come again and she was glad what were best to do now she said said face of god let us tarry a little for some of thy carls shall surely come up from the vale because they will have heard woodwise's whoop since the wind sets that way yea they will come said the sunbeam good is that said face of god for they shall take the dead felons and cast them where they be not seen if perchance any more stray hereby for if they win them they may well happen on the path down to the vale also my friend it were well if thou wert to bid a good few of the carls that are in the vale to keep watch and ward about here lest there be more foemen wandering about the waste she said thou art wise in war gold mane i will do as thou biddest me but soothly this is a perilous thing that the dusky men are gotten so close to the vale said face of god this will folk might look to when he cometh home and it is most like that he will deem it good to fall on them somewhere a good way aloof so as to draw them off from wandering over the waste also i will do my best to busy them when i am home in burgdale therewith came up woodwise and fell to talk with them and his mind it was that these foemen were but a band of strayers and had no inkling of shadowy vale till they had heard them talking together as they came up the path from the vale and that then they had made that ambush behind the elders rocks so that they might slay the men and then bear off the woman he said withal that it would be best to carry their corpses further on so that they might be cast over the cliffs into the fierce stream of the shivering flood amidst all this talk came up men from the vale a score of them well armed and they ran to meet the wayfarers and when they heard what had befallen they rejoiced exceedingly and were above all glad that face of god had shown himself doughty and deft and they deemed his reed wise to set a watch thereabouts till folk might came home and said that they would do even so then spake the sunbeam and said now must ye wayfarers depart for the road is but rough and the day not over long then she turned to face of god and put her hand on his shoulder and brought her face close to his and spake to him softly doth this second parting seem at all strange to thee and that i am now so familiar to thee 
i whom thou didst once deem to be a very goddess and now thou hast seen me redden before thine eyes because of thee and thou hast seen me grow pale with fear because of thee and thou hast felt my caresses which i might not refrain even as if i were altogether such a maiden as ye warriors hang about for a nine days wonder and then all is over save an aching heart wilt thou do so with me tell me have i not belittled myself before thee as if i asked thee to scorn me for thus desire dealeth both with maid and man he said in all this there is but one thing for me to say and that is that i love thee and surely none the less but rather the more because thou lovest me and art of my kind and mayest share in my deeds and think well of them now is my heart full of joy and one thing only weigheth on it and that is that my kinswoman the bride begrudgeth our love together for this is the thing that of all things most misliketh me that any should bear a grudge against me she said forget not the token and my message to her i will not forget it said he and now i bid thee to kiss me even before all these that are looking on for there is naught to be little as therein since we be troth plight and indeed those folks stood all around them gazing on them but a little aloof that they might not hear their words if they were minded to talk privily for they had long loved the sunbeam and now the love of face of god had begun to spring up in their hearts so the twain embraced and kissed one another and made no haste thereover and those men deemed that but meet and right and clashed their weapons on their shields in token of their joy then face of god turned about and strode out of the ring of men with bome and woodwise beside him and they went on their journey over the necks towards burgstead but the sunbeam turned slowly from that place toward the vale and two of the stoutest carls went along with her to guard her from harm and she went down into the vale pondering all these things in her heart then the other carls dragged off the corpses of the dusky men till they had brought them to the sheer rocks above the shivering flood and there they tossed them over into the boiling cauldron of the force and so departed taking with them the silver armrings of the slain to add to the tale but when they came back into the vale the sunbeam duly ordered that watch and ward to keep the ingate thereto and note all that should befall till folk might came home End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of the roots of the mountains by william morris this librivox recording is in the public domain face of god cometh home to burgstead but face of god with bome and woodwise fared over the waste going at first alongside the cliffs of the shivering flood and then afterwards turning somewhat to the west they soon had to climb a very high and steep bent going up to the mountain neck and the way over the neck was rough indeed when they were on it and they toiled out of it into a barren valley and out of the valley again on to a rough neck and such like was their journey the day long for they were going athwart all those great dykes that went from the ice mountains toward the lower dales like the outspread fingers of a hand or the roots of a great tree and the ice mountains they had on their left hands and whiles at their backs they went very warily with their bows bended and spear in hand but saw no man good or bad and but few living things at noon they rested in a valley where there was a stream but no grass nought but stones and sand but where they were at least sheltered from the wind which was mostly very great in these high wastes and there bome drew meat and wine from a wallet she bore and they ate and drank and were merry enough and bome said i would i were going all the way with thee gold mane for i long sore to let my eyes rest awhile on the land where i shall one day live yea said face of god art thou minded to dwell there we shall be glad of that whither are thy wits straying said she whether i'm minded to it or not i shall dwell there and woodwise nodded a yea to her but face of god said good will be thy dwelling but wherefore must it be so then woodwise laughed and said i shall tell thee in fewer words than she will and time presses now 
Would father and would mother, and I and my two brethren, and this woman, have ever been about and anigh the sunbeam, and we deem that war and other troubles have made us of closer kin to her than we were born, whether ye call it brotherhood or what not, and never shall we sunder from her in life or in death. So when thou goest to Burgdale with her, there shall we be. Then was face of God glad when he found that they deemed his wedding so settled and sure. But Woodwise fell to making ready for the road, and face of God said to him, Tell me one thing, Woodwise, that whoop that thou gavest forth when we were at handy strokes e'en now, is it but a cry of thine own, or is it of thy folk, and shall I hear it again? Thou mayst look to hear it many a time, said Woodwise, for it is the cry of the wolf. Seldom indeed hath battle been joined where men of our blood are, but that cry is given forth. Come now to the road. So they went their ways, and the road worsened upon them, and toilsome was the climbing up steep bents, and the scaling of doubtful paths in the cliff-sides, so that the journey, though the distance of it were not so long to the foul flying, was much eked out for them, and it was not till near nightfall that they came on the gill of the weltering water, some six miles above Burgstead. Forsooth, Woodwise said that the way might be made less toilsome, though far longer, by turning back eastward a little, past the vale where they had rested at midday, and that seemed good to Goldmain, in case they should be wending hereafter in a great company between Burgdale and Shadowy Vale. But now those two went with face of God down a path in the side of the cliff, whereby him seemed he had gone before, and they came down into the gill, and sat down together on a stone by the waterside, and face of God spake to them kindly, for he deemed them good and trusty faring fellows. Bome, said he, thou saidst a while ago that thou wouldst be fain to look on Burgdale, and indeed it is fair and lovely, and ye may soon be in it if ye will. Ye shall both be more than welcome to the house of my father, and heartily I bid you thither, for night is on us, and the way back is long and toilsome and beset with peril. Sister Bome, thou wottest that it would be a sore grief to me if thou camest to any harm and thou also, fellow Woodwise. Daylight is a good faring fellow over the waste, said Bome. Thou art kind, Goldmane, and that is thy want, I know, and fain were I to-night of the candles in thine hall. But we may not tarry, for thou wottest how busy we be at home, and sunbeam needeth me, if it were only to make us sure that no dusky man is bearing off thine head by its lovely locks. Neither shall we journey in the murk night, for look you, the moon yonder, well, said Face of God, parting is ill at the best, and I would I could give you twain a gift, and especially to thee, my sister Bome, said Woodwise. Thou mayst well do that, or at least promise the gift, and that is all one as if we held it in our hands. Yea, said Bome, Woodwise and I have been thinking in one way belike, and I was at point to ask a gift of thee. What is it? said Goldmane. Surely it is thine, if it were but a guerdon for thy good shooting. She laughed and handled the skirts of his hauberk as she said, Show us the dint in thine helm that the steel axe made this morning. There is no such great dint, said he. My father forged that helm, and his work is better than good. Yea, said Bome, and were I to have hauberk and helm of his handiwork, and woodwise a good sword of the same, then were I a glad woman, and this man a happy carl. Said Goldmane, I am well pleased at thine asking, and so shall Iron Face be when he heareth of thine archery, and how that Hall Face were now his only son, but for thy close shooting. But now must I to the way, for my heart tells me that there may have been tidings in Burgstead this while I have been aloof. So they rose all three, and Bome said, Thou art a kind brother, and soon we shall meet again, and that will be well. Then he put his hands on her shoulders, and kissed both her cheeks, and he kissed Woodwise, and turned and went his ways, threading the stony tangle about the weltering water, which was now at middle height, and running clear and strong. So turning, once he beheld Woodwise and Bome climbing the path up the side of the gill, and Bome turned to him also, and waved her bow as a token of farewell. Then he went upon his way, which was rough enough to follow by night, though the moon was shining brightly high aloft. Yet, as he knew his road, he made but little of it all, and in somewhat more than an hour and a half, 
which came out of the pass into the broken ground at the head of the dale and began to make his way speedily under the bright moonlight toward the gate still going close by the water but as he went he heard of a sudden cries and rumour not far from him unwanted in that place where none dwelt and where the only folk he might look to see were those who cast an angle into the pools and eddies of the water moreover he saw about the place whence came the cries torches moving swiftly hither and thither so that he looked to hear of new tidings and stayed his feet and looked keenly about him on every side and just then between his rough path and the shimmer of the dancing moonlit water he saw the moon smite on something gleaming so as quietly as he could he got his target on his arm and shortened his spear in his right hand and then turned sharply toward that gleam even therewith up sprang a man on his right hand and then another in front of him just betwixt him and the water an axe gleamed bright in the moon and he caught a great stroke on his target and therewith drave his left shoulder straight forward so that the man before him fell over into the water with a mighty splash for they were at the very edge of the deepest eddy of the water then he spun round on his heel heeding not that another stroke had fallen on his right shoulder yet ill aimed not with the full edge so that it ran down his burney and rent it not so he sent the thrust of his spear crashing through the face and skull of the smiter and looked not to him as he fell but stood still brandishing his spear and crying out for the burg and the face for the burg and the face no other foe came against him but like to the echo of his cry rose a clear shout not far aloof for the face for the face for the burg and the face he muttered so ends the day as it begun and shouted loud again for the burg and the face and in a minute more came breaking forth from the stone heaps into the moonlit space before the water the tall shapes of the men of burgstead the red torchlight and the moonlight flashing back from their war gear and weapons for every man had his sword or spear in hand hallface was the first of them and he threw his arms about his brother and said well met gormain though thou comest amongst us like stone fist of the mountain art thou hurt with whom hast thou dealt where be they whence comest thou nay i am not hurt said face of god stint thy questions then till thou hast told me whom thou seekest with spear and sword and candle two felons were they said hallface even such as ye saw lying dead at woodgraze the other day then may ye sheathe your swords and go home said goldmain for one lieth at the bottom of the eddy and the other thy feet are well nigh treading on him hallface then arose a rumour of praise and victory and they brought the torches nigh and looked at the fallen man and found that he was stark dead so they even let him lie there till the morrow and all turned about toward the thorpe and many looked on face of god and wondered concerning him whence he was and what had befallen him indeed they would have asked him thereof but could not get at him to ask but who so could went as nigh to hallface and him as they might to hearken the talk between the brothers so as they went along hallface did verily ask him whence he came for was it not so said he that thou didst enter into the wood seeking some adventure early in the morning the day before yesterday sooth is that said face of god and i came to shadowy vale and thence am i come this morning said hallface i know not shadowy vale nor doth any of us this is a new word how say ye friends doth any man here know of shadowy vale they all said nay then said hallface hast thou been amongst mere ghosts and marvels brother or cometh this tale of thy minstrelsy for all your words said goldmain to that vale have i been and to speak shortly for i desire to have your tale and am waiting for it i will tell thee that i found there no marvels or strange whites but a folk of valiant men a folk small in numbers but great of heart a folk come as we be from the fathers and the gods and this moreover is to be said of them that they are the foes of these felons whom ye were chasing these twain and these same dusky men of silverdale would slay them every man if they might and if we look not to it they will soon be doing the same by us for they are many and as venomous as adders as fierce as bears and as foul as swine but these valiant men who bear on their banner the image of the wolf 
should be our fellows in arms, and they have good will thereto, and they shall show us the way to Silverdale by blind paths, so that we may fall upon these felons while they dwell there, tormenting the poor people of the land, and thus may we destroy them as lads a hornet's nest, or else the days shall be hard for us. The men who hung about them drank in his words greedily, but Hallface was silent a little while, and then he said, Brother Goldmane, these be great tidings. Time was when we might have deemed them but a minstrel's tale, for Silverdale we know not, of which thou speakest so glibly, nor the dusky men, any more than the shadowy vale. Howbeit, things have befallen these last two days so strange and new, that putting them together with the murder at Woodgrace, and thy words which seem somewhat wild, it may well seem to us that tidings unlooked for are coming our way. Come then, said face of God, give me what thou hast in thy scrip, and trust me, I shall not jeer at thy tale. Said Hallface, I also will be short with the tale, and that the more, as me seemeth, it is not done yet, and that thou self shalt share in the ending of it. It was the day before yesterday, that is the day when thou departest into the woods on that adventure, whereof thou shalt one day tell me more. Wilt thou not? Yea, in good time, said Face of God. Well, quoth Hallface, we went into the woods that day and in the morning, but after sunrise to the number of a score. We looked to meet a bear and a she-bear with cubs in a certain place, for one of the woodlanders, a keen hunter, had told us of their lair. Also we were wishful to slay some of the wild swine, the yearlings if we might. Therefore, though we had no helms or shields or coats of fence, we had bowshot plenty and good store of casting weapons, besides our wood-knives and an axe or so, and some of us, of whom I was one, bore out our battle-swords, as we are wont ever to do, be the foe, beast or man. Thus armed, we went up Wild Lake's way, and came to Carlstead, where half a score woodlanders joined themselves to us, so that we became a band. We went up the half-cleared places past Carlstead for a mile, and then turned east into the wood, and went I know not how far, for the woodlanders led us by crooked paths, but two hours wore away in our going, till we came to the place where they looked to find the bears. It is a place that may well be noted, for it is unlike the wood round about. There is a close thicket, some two furlongs about, of thorn and briar, and ill-grown ash and oak and other trees, planted by the birds and bees belike, and it stands, as it were, in an island, amidst of a wide-spreading woodlawn of fine turf, set about in the most goodly fashion, with great, tall, straight, bold oak trees, that seem to have been planted of set purpose by man's hand. Yea, dost thou know the place? Methinks I do, said Goldmain, and I seem to have heard the woodlanders give it a name, and call it Boar's Bait. That may be, said Hallface, well, there we were, the dogs and the men, and we drew nigh the thicket and beset it, and doubted not to find prey therein. But when we would set the dogs at the thicket to enter it, they were uneasy, and would not take up the slot, but growled and turned about this way and that, so that we deemed that they winded some fierce beast at our flanks or backs. Even so it was, and fierce enough and deadly was the beast, for suddenly we heard the bowstrings twang and shafts came flying, the iron shield of the upper dale, who was close beside me, leapt up into the air and fell down dead with an arrow through his back. Then I bethought me, in the twinkling of an eye, and I cried out, The foe are upon us, take the cover of the tree bowls and be wary, for the burg and the face, for the burg and the face. So we scattered and covered ourselves with the oak bowls, but besides iron shield, who was slain outright, two good men were sorely hurt, to it, Baldface, a man of our house, and Stonyford of the Lower Dale. I looked from behind my tree bowl, a great one, and far off down the glades I saw men moving, clad in gay raiment, but nearer to me, not a hundred yards from my cover, I saw an arm clad in scarlet come out from behind a tree bowl. So I loosed at it, and missed not, for straight there tottered out from behind the tree, one of those dusky, foul-favoured men, like to those that were slain by Woodgrey. I had another shaft ready notched, so I loosed and set the shaft in his throat, and he fell. Straightway was a yelling and howling about us like the cries of scalded curs, and the oak woods swarmed thick with these felons rushing upon us. 
for it seems that the man whom I had slain was a chief amongst them, or we judge so by his goodly raiment. We thought then our last day was come. What could we do but run together again after we had loosed at a venture, and so withstand them sword and spear in hand? Some fell beneath our shot, but not many, for they came on very swiftly. So they fell on us, but for all their fierceness and their numbers they might not break our array, and we slew four, and hurt many by sword-hewing and spear-casting and push of spear, and five of us were hurt, and one slain by their dart-casting. So they drew off from us a little, and strove to spread out and fall to shooting at us again. But this we could not suffer, but pushed on as they fell back, keeping as close together as we might for the trees, for we said that we would all die together if needs must, and verily the stour was hard. Yet hearken, in that nick of time rose up a strange cry, not far from us. Ha, 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 howoo! Ending like the howl of a wolf, and then another, and another, and another, till the whole wood rang again. At first we deemed that here were come some fresh foemen, and that we were undone indeed. But when they heard it, the foemen before us faltered and gave way, and at last turned their backs and fled, and we followed, keeping well together still. Thereby the more part of these men escaped us, for they fled wildly here and there from those who bore that cry with them, so we knew that our work was being done for us. Therefore we stood, and saw tall men clad in sheep-brown weed, running through the glades, pursuing those felons, and smiting them down, till both fleers and pursuers passed out of our sight, like men in a dream, or, as when ye roll up a pictured cloth to lay it in the coffer, but to Stoneface's mind, those brown-clad men were the whites of the wood that be of the father's blood, and our very friends. And when some of us would yet have gone forward and foregathered with them, and followed the chase along with them, Stoneface gainsaid it, bidding us not to run into the arms of a second death, when we had but just escaped from the first. Sooth to say, moreover, we had diverse hurt men that needed looking to. So what with one thing, what with another, we turned back, but Warcliffe's brother, a tall man, had felled two of those felons with an oak sapling which he had torn from the thicket. But he had not slain them, and by now they were just awakening from their swoon, and were sitting up, looking round them with fierce rolling eyes, expecting the stroke, for Raven of Longscree was standing over them with a naked war-sword in his hand. But now that our blood was cool, we were loath to slay them as they lay in our hands. So we bound them and brought them away with us, and our own dead we carried also on such biers as we might likely make there, and with them three that were so grievously hurt that they might not go afoot. These we left at Carlstead. They were Tardy the son of the untamed, and Swan of Bullmeadow, both of the lower dale, and a woodlander, undoomed, to wit. But the dead were Ironshield aforesaid, and Woolsark, and the Hewer, a woodlander, so came we sadly at eventide to Burgstead with the two dead Burgdalers and the captive felons, and the wounded of us that might go afoot. And ye may judge that they of Burgdale and our father deemed these tidings great enough, and wotted not what next should befall. Stoneface would have had those two felons slain there and then, for no true tale could we get out of them, nor indeed any word at all. But the alderman would not have it so, and he deemed that they might serve our turn as hostages if any of our folk should be taken. For one and all we deemed, and still deem, that war is on us, and that new folk have gathered on our skirts. So the captives were shut up in the red outbower of our house, and our father was minded that thou mightest tell us somewhat of them when thou wert come home. But about dusk to-day the word went up that they had broken out and gotten them weapons, and fled up the dale, and so it was but to-morrow morning will a gate thing be holden, and there it will be looked for of thee, that thou tell us a true tale of thy goings. For it is deemed, and it is my deeming especially, that thou mayst tell us more of these men than thou hast yet told us. Is it not so? Yea, surely, said Gormain, I can make as many words as ye will about it, yet when all is said it will come to much the same tale as I have already told thee. Yet belike, if ye are minded to take up the sword to defend you, 
I may tell you in what wise to lay hold on the hilts. Ah, that is well, said Hallface, and no less do I look for of thee. But lo, here we are come to the gate of the burg that abideth battle. End of chapter 22「Chapter twenty three of the Roots of the Mountains by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Talk in the Hall of the House of the Face. In sooth, they were come to the very gate of Burgstead, and the great gates were shut, and only a wicket was open, and a half score of stout men in all their war gear were holding ward thereby. They gave place to Hallface and his company albeit some of the warders followed them through the wicket that they might hear the story told the street was full of folk both men and women talking together eagerly concerning all these tidings and when they saw the men of the hue and cry they came thronging about them so that they might scarce get to the door of the house of the face because of the press so hallface who was a very tall man cried out good people all is well the runaways are slain and face of god is come back with us give place a little that we might come into our house then the throng set up a shout and made way a little so that hallface and goldmane and the others could get to the door and they entered into the hall and saw much folk therein and men were sitting at table for supper was not yet over but when they saw the newcomers they mostly rose up from the board and stood silent to hear the tale for they had been talking many together, each to each, so that the hall was full of confused noise. So Hallface again cried out, Men in this hall, good is the tidings, the runaways are slain, and it was face of God who slew them as he came back safe from the waste. Then they shouted for joy, and the brethren and Stoneface with them, for he had entered with them from the street, went up onto the dais, while the others of the hue and cry, gat them seats where they might at the endlong tables but when face of god came up to the dais there sat iron face looking down on the thronged hall with a ruddy cheerful countenance and beside him the bride for he had caused her to be brought thither when he had heard of the tidings of battle she was daintily clad in a flame-coloured kirtle embroidered with gold about the bosom and sleeves and there was a fillet of golden roses on her ruddy hair her eyes shone bright and eager, and the pommels of her cheeks were flushed and red, contrary to their wont. Needs must Goldmane sit by her, and when he came close to her, he knew not what to do, but he put forth his hand to her, yet with a troubled countenance, for he feared her grief mingled with her beauty. As for her, she wavered in her mind whether she should forbear to touch him or not, but she saw that men about were looking at them, and especially was iron face looking on her therefore she stood up and took goldmane's hand and kissed his face as she had been wont to do and by then was her face as white as paper and her anguish pierced his heart so that he well nigh groaned for grief of her but iron face looked on her and said kindly kinswoman thou art pale thou hast feared for thy mate amidst all these tidings of war and still fearest for him but pluck up a heart for the man is a deft warrior for all his fair face which thou lovest as a woman should and his hands may yet save his head and if he be slain yet there are other men of the kindred and earth will not be a desert to thee even then she looked at iron face and the colour was come back to her face somewhat and she said it is true i have feared for him for he goeth into perilous places but for thee thou art kind and i thank thee for it and therewith she kissed iron face and sat down in her place and strove to overmaster her grief that her face might not be changed by it for now were thoughts of battle and valiant hopes arising in men's hearts and it seemed to her too grievous if she should mar that feast on the eve of battle but iron face kissed and embraced his son and said art thou late come from the waste hast thou seen new things we look to have a notable tale from thee, though here also have been tidings, and it is not unlike we shall presently have new work on our hands. Father, quoth face of God, I deem that when thou hast heard my tale, thou wilt think no less of it 
than that there are valiant folk to be holpen, poor folk to be delivered, and evil folk to be swept from off the face of the earth. It is well, son, said Iron Face. I see that thy tale is long. Let it alone for to-night. To-morrow we shall hold a gate thing, and then shall we hear all that thou hast to tell. Now, eat thy meat and drink a bowl of wine, and comfort thy troth plight maiden. So Goldmane sat down by the bride, and ate and drank as he needs must. But he was ill at ease, and he durst not speak to her. For, on the one hand, he thought concerning his love for the sunbeam, and how sweet and good a thing it was that she should take him by the hand, and lead him into noble deeds and great fame, caressing him so softly and sweetly the while. And on the other hand, there sat the bride beside him, sorrowful and angry, begrudging all that sweetness of love, as though it were something foul and unseemly. And heavy on him lay the weight of that grudge, for he was a man of a friendly heart. Stoneface sat outward from him on the other side of the bride, and he leaned across her towards Goldmane, and said, There shall be thy tale to-morrow, if thou tellest all thine adventure, or wilt thou tell us less than all? said Face of God. In good time shalt thou know it all, foster father, but it is not unlike that, by the time that thou hast heard it, there shall be so many other things to tell of, that my tale shall seem of little account to thee, even as the saw saith, that one nail driveth out the other. Yea, said Stoneface, but one tale belike shall be knit up with the others, as it fareth with the figures that come one after other on the weaver's cloth. The one maketh not the other, yet one cometh of the other. Said Face of God, Wise art thou now, foster father, but thou shalt be wiser yet in this matter by then a month hath worn, and to-morrow shalt thou know enough to set thine hands a-work. So the talk fell between them, and the night wore, and the men of Burgdale feasted in their ancient hall with merry hearts, little weighed down by the thought of the battle that might be, and the trouble to come, for they were valorous and kindly folk. End of chapter 23「Chapter twenty four of the Roots of the Mountains by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Face of God giveth that token to the bride. Now on the morrow, when Face of God arose, and other men with him, and the hall was astir, and there was no little throng therein, the bride came up to him, for she had slept in the house of the Face by the bidding of the alderman, and she spake to him before all men and bade him come forth with her into the garden, because she would speak to him apart. He yea said her, though with a heavy heart, and to the folk about that seemed meet and due, since those twain were deemed to be troth plight, and they smiled kindly on them as they went out of the hall together. So they came into the garden, where the pear trees were blossoming over the spring lilies, and the cherries were showering their flowers on the deep green grass, and everything smelled sweetly on the warm, windless spring morning. She led the way, going before him till they came by a smooth grass path between the berry bushes, to a square space of grass, about which were barberry trees, their first tender leaves bright green in the sun against the dry yellowish twigs. There was a sundial amidmost of the grass, and betwixt the garden boughs one could see the long grey roof of the ancient hall and sweet familiar sounds of the nesting birds, and men and women going on their errands, were all about in the scented air. She turned about at the sundial, and faced face of God, her hand lightly laid on the scored brass, and spake with no anger in her voice. I ask thee, if thou hast brought me the token, whereon thou shalt swear to give me that gift. Yea, said he, and therewith drew the ring from his bosom, and held it out to her. She reached out her hand to him slowly, and took it, and their fingers met as she did so, and he noted that her hand was warm and firm and wholesome, as he well remembered it. She said, Whence hadst thou this fair finger-ring? said Face of God. My friend there in the mountain valley drew it from off her finger for thee, and bade me bear thee a message. Her face flushed red. Yea, she said, and doth she send me a message? Then doth she know of me, 
and ye have talked of me together well give the message said face of god she saith that thou shalt bear in mind that to-morrow is a new day yea she said for her it is so and for thee but not for me but now i have brought thee here that thou mightest swear thine oath to me lay thine hand on this ring and on this brazen plate whereby the sun measures the hours of the day for happy folk and swear by the spring-tide of the year and all glad things that find a mate and by the god of the earth that rejoiceth in the life of man then he laid his hand on the finger-ring as it lay on the dial-plate and said by the spring-tide and the live things that long to multiply their kind by the god of the earth that rejoiceth in the life of man i swear to give to my kinswoman the bride the second man-child that i beget to be hers to leave or cherish to love or hate as her will may bid her then he looked on her soberly and said it is duly sworn is it enough yea she said but he saw how the tears ran out of her eyes and wetted the bosom of her kirtle and she hung her head for shame of her grief and gold mane was all abashed and had no word to say for he knew that no word of his might comfort her and he deemed it ill done to stay there and behold her sorrow and he knew not how to get him gone and be glad elsewhere and leave her alone then as if she had read his thought she looked up at him and said smiling a little amidst of her tears i bid thee stay by me till the flood is over for i have yet a word to say to thee so he stood there gazing down on the grass in his turn and not daring to raise his eyes to her face and the minute seemed long to him till at last she said in a voice scarcely yet clear of weeping wilt thou say anything to me and tell me what thou hast done and why and what thou deemest will come of it he said i will tell the truth as i know it because thou askest it of me and not because i would excuse myself before thee what have i done yesterday i plighted my troth to wed the woman that i met last autumn in the wood and why i wot not why but that i longed for her yet must i tell thee that it seemed to me and yet seemeth that i might do no otherwise that there was nothing else in the world for me to do what do i deem will come of it sayest thou this that we shall be happy together she and i till the day of our death she said and even so long shall i be sorry so far are we sundered now alas who looked for it and whither shall i turn to now said goldmane she bade me tell thee that to-morrow is a new day meseemeth i know her meaning no word of hers hath any meaning to me said the bride nay said he but hast thou not heard these rumours of war that are in the dale shall not these things avail thee much may grow out of them and thou with a mighty heart so faithful and compassionate she said what sayest thou what may grow out of them yea i have heard those rumours as a man sick to death heareth men talk of their business down in the street while he lieth on his bed and already he hath done with it all and hath no world to mend or mar for me nought shall grow out of it what meanest thou said goldmane is there nought in the fellowship of folks in the aiding of the valiant and the deliverance of the hapless nay she said there is nought to me i cannot think of it to-day nor yet to-morrow belike yet true it is that i may mingle in it though thinking nought of it but this shall not avail me she was silent a while but presently spake and said thou sayest right it is not thou hast done this but the woman who sent me the ring and the message of an old saw oh that she should be born to sunder us how hath it befallen that i am now so little to thee and she so much and again she was silent and after a while face of god spake kindly and softly and said kinswoman wilt thou for ever begrudge our love this grudge lieth heavy on my soul and it is i alone that have to bear it she said this is but a light burden for thee to bear when thou hast nought else to bear but do i begrudge thee thy love goldmane i know not that rather me seemeth i do not believe in it nor shall do ever then she held her peace a long while 
nor did he speak one word, and they were so still that a robin came hopping about them close to the hem of her kirtle, and a starling pitched in the apple tree hard by, and whistled and chuckled, turning about and about, heeding them naught. Then at last she lifted up her face from looking on the grass, and said, These are idle words, and avail nothing. One thing only I know, that we are sundered. And now it repenteth me that I have shown thee my tears, and my grief, and my sickness of the earth, and those that dwell thereon. I am ashamed of it, as if thou hadst smitten me, and I had come and shown thee the stripes, and said, See what thou hast done. Hast thou no pity? Yea, thou pitiest me, and wilt try to forget thy pity. Belike thou art right when thou sayest, Tomorrow is a new day. Belike matters will arise that will call me back to life, and I shall once more take heed of the joy and sorrow of my people. Nay, it is most like that this I shall feign to do even now. But if tomorrow be a new day, it is to-day now and not to-morrow, and so shall it be for long. Hereof belike we shall talk no more, thou and I, for as the days wear, the dealings between us shall be, that thou shalt but get thee away from my life, and I shall be naught to thee but the name of a kinswoman. Thus should it be, even wert thou to strive to make it otherwise, and thou shalt not strive. So let all this be, for this is not the word I had to say to thee. But hearken, now we are sundered, and it irketh me beyond measure that folk know it not, and are kind, and rejoice in our love, and deem it a happy thing for the folk, and this burden I may bear no longer. So I shall declare unto men that I will not wed thee, and belike they may wonder why it is, till they see thee wedded to the woman of the mountain. Art thou content that so it shall be? Said face of God, Nay, thou shalt not take this all upon thyself. I also shall declare unto the folk that I will wed none but her, the mountain woman. She said, This shalt thou not do. I forbid it thee, and I will take it all upon myself. Shall I have it said of me that I am unmeet to wed thee, and that thou hast found me out at last and at latest? I lay this upon thee, that wheresoever I declare this, and whatsoever I may say, thou shalt hold thy peace. This at least thou mayst do for me. Wilt thou? Yea, he said, though it shall put me to shame. Again she was silent for a little. Then she said, Oh, gold mane, this would I take upon myself not soothly for any shame of seeming to be thy cast-off, but because it is I who needs must bear all the sorrow of our sundering, and I have the will to bear it greater and heavier, that I may be as the women of old time, and they that have come from the gods, lest I belittle my life with malice and spite and confusion, and it become poisonous to me. Be it peace, be it peace and leave all to the wearing of the years, and forget not that which thou hast sworn. Therewith she turned and went from that green place toward the house of the face, walking slowly through the garden, amongst the sweet odours, beneath the fair blossoms, a body most dainty and beauteous of fashion, but the casket of grievous sorrow, which all that goodliness availed not. But face of God lingered in that place a little, and for that little, while the joy of his life was dulled and overworn, and the days before his wandering on the mountain seemed to him free and careless and happy days that he could not but regret. He was ashamed, moreover, that this so unquenchable grief should come but of him, and the pleasure of his life, which he himself had found out for himself, and which was but such a little portion of the earth and the deeds thereof but presently his thought wandered from all this, and as he turned away from the sundial and went his ways through the garden, he called to mind his longing for the day of the spring market, when he should see the sunbeam again and be cherished by the sweetness of her love. End of chapter 24「Chapter 25 – of the Roots of the Mountains by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the Gate Thing at Bergstead. But now must he hasten, for the Gate Thing was to be holden two hours before noon. So he betook himself speedily to the hall, and took his shield, and did on a goodly helm, 
and girt his sword to his side for men must needs go to all folk motes with their weapons and clad in war gear thus he went forth to the gate with many others and there already were many folk assembled in the space aforesaid betwixt the gate of the burg and the sheer rocks on the face of which were the steps that led up to the ancient tower on the height the alderman was sitting on the great stone by the gate side which was his appointed place and beside him on the stone bench were the six wardens of the burg but of the six wardens of the dale there were but three for the others had not yet heard tell of the battle or had got the summons to the thing since they had been about their business down the dale face of god took his place silently amongst the neighbours but men made way for him so that he must needs stand in front facing his father and the wardens and there went up a murmur of expectation round about him both because the word had gone about that he had a tale of new tidings to tell and also because men deemed him their best and handiest man though he was yet so young now the alderman looked around and beheld a great throng gathered together and he looked on the shadow of the gate which the southering sun was casting on the hard white ground of the thingstead and he saw that it had just taken in the standing stone which was in the midst of the place on the face of the said stone was carven the image of a fighting man with shield on arm and axe in hand for it had been set there in old time in memory of the man who had bidden the folk build the gate and its wall and had showed them how to fashion it for he was a deft housesmith as well as a great warrior and his name was iron hand so when the alderman saw that this stone was wholly within the shadow of the gate he knew that it was the due time for the hallowing in of the thing so he bade one of the wardens who sat beside him and had a great slug horn slung about him to rise and set the horn to his mouth so that man arose and blew three great blasts that went bellowing about the towers and down the street and beat back again from the face of the sheer rocks and up them and over into the wild wood and the sound of it went on the light west wind along the lips of the dale toward the mountain wastes and many a good man when he heard the voice of the horn in the bright spring morning left spade or axe or plough stilts or the foddering of the ewes and their younglings and turned back home to fetch his sword and helm and hasten to the thing though he knew not why it was summoned and women wending over the meadows who had not yet heard of the battle in the wood hearkened and stood still on the green grass or amidst the ripples of the ford and the threat of coming trouble smote heavy on their hearts for they knew that great tidings must be towards if a thing must needs be summoned so close to the great folk moat but now the alderman stood up and spake amidst the silence that followed the last echoes of the horn now is hallowed in this gate thing of the burgstead men and the men of the dale wherein they shall take counsel concerning matters late befallen that press hard upon them let no man break the peace of the holy thing lest he become a man accursed in holy places from the plain up to the mountain and from the mountain down to the plain a man not to be cherished of any man of good will not be holpen with victuals or edge tool or draught beast a man to be sheltered under no roof tree and warmed at no hearth of man so help us the warrior and the god of the earth and him of the face and all the fathers when he had spoken men clashed their weapons in token of assent and he sat down again and there was silence for a space but presently came thrusting forward a good man of the dales who seemed as if he had come hurriedly to the thing for his face was running down with sweat his wide-rimmed iron cap sat awry over his brow and he was girt with a rusty sword without a scabbard and the girdle was ill braced up about his loins so he said i am redcoat of the waterless of the lower dale early this morning as i was going afield i met on the way a man akin to me fox of upton to it and he told me that men were being summoned to a gate thing so i turned back home and caught up any weapon that came handy and here i am alderman asking thee of the tidings which hath driven thee to call this thing so hard on the great folk moat for i know them not then stood up iron face the alderman and said this is well asked and soon shall ye be as wise as i am on this matter 
know ye o men of burkstead and the dale that we had not called this gate thing so hard on the great folk moat had not great need been to look into troublous matters long have ye dwelt in peace and it is years on years now since any foreman hath fallen on the dale but as ye will bear in mind last autumn were there ransackings in the dale and amidst of the shepherds after the manner of deeds of war and it troubleth us that none can say who wrought these ill deeds next but a little while agone was woodgrey a valiant good man of the woodlanders slain close to his own door by evil men these men we took at first for mere gangrel felons and outcasts from their own folk though there were some who spoke against that from the beginning but thirdly i knew tidings again for three days ago while some of the folk were hunting peaceably in the wildwood and thinking no evil they were fallen upon of set purpose by a host of men-at-arms but naught would serve but mere battle for dear life so that many of our neighbours were hurt and three slain outright and now mark this that those who there fell upon our folk were clad and armed even as the two felons that slew woodgrey and moreover were like them in aspect of body now stand forth hallface my son and answer to my questions in a loud voice so that all may hear thee so hallface stood forth clad in gleaming war gear with an axe over his shoulder and seemed a doughty warrior and ironface said to him tell me son those whom ye met in the wood and of whom ye brought home two captives how much like were they to the murder carls at woodgrays said hallface as like as peas out of the same cod and to our eyes all those whom we saw in the wood might have been sons of one father and one mother so much alike were they yea said the alderman now tell me how many by thy deeming fell upon you in the wood said hallface we deem that if they were any less than three score they were little less great was the odds said the alderman or how many were ye one score and seven said hallface said the alderman and yet ye escaped with life all save those three hallface said i deem that scarce one should have come back alive had it not been that as we fought came a noise like the howling of wolves and thereat the foemen turned and fled and there followed on the fleers tall men clad in sheep-brown raiment who smote them down as they fled here then is the story neighbours said the alderman and ye may see thereby that if one of those slayers of woodgrey were outcast their band is a great one but it seemeth rather that they were men of a folk whose craft is to rob with the armed hand and to slay the robbed and that they are now gathering on our borders for war yet moreover they are foemen in the woods who should be fellows in arms of us how sayest thou stoneface thou art old and hast seen many wars in the dale and knowest the wildwood to its innermost the alderman said stoneface and ye neighbours of the dale maybe these foes whom ye have met are not of the race of man but are trolls and woodwhites now if they be trolls it is ill for then is the world growing worser and the wood shall be right perilous for those who must needs fare therein yet if they be men it is a worse matter for the trolls would not come out of the waste into the sunlight of the dale but these foes if they be men are lusting after our fair dale to eat it up and it is most like that they are gathering a huge host to fall upon us at home such things i have heard of when i was young and the aspect of the evil men who overran the kindreds of old time according to all tales and lays that i have heard is even such as the aspect of those whom we have seen of late as to those wolves who save the neighbours and chase their foemen there is one here who belike knoweth more of all this than we do and that o alderman is thy son whom i have fostered face of god to wit bid him answer to thy questioning and tell us what he hath seen and heard of late then shall we verily know the whole story as far as it can be known then men pressed round and were eager to hear what face of god would be saying but or ever the alderman could begin to question him the throng was cloven by newcomers and these were the men who had been sent to bring home the corpses of the dusky men so they had cast loaded hooks into the weltering water and had dragged up him whom face of god had shoved into the eddy and who had sunk like a stone just where he fell 
and now they were bringing him on a bier along with him who had been slain a land. They were set down in the place before the older man, and men who had not seen them before looked eagerly on them, that they might behold the aspect of their foemen, and naught lovely were they to look on, for the drowned man was already bleached and swollen with the water, and the other, his face was all wried and twisted with that spear thrust in the mouth. Then the old man said, I would question my son, face of God, let him stand forth. And therewith he smiled merrily in his son's face, for he was standing right in front of him, and he said, Ask of me, alderman, and I will answer. Kinsman, said Ironface, look at these two dead men, and tell me, if thou hast seen any such besides these two murder carls who were slain at Carlstead, or if thou knowest aught of their folk, said Face of God, Yesterday I saw six others like to these, both in array and of body, and three of them I slew, for we were in battle with them early in the morning. There was a murmur of joy at this word, since all men took these felons for deadly foemen. But Iron Face said, What meanest thou by we? I and the men who had guested me overnight, said Face of God, and they slew the other three, or rather a woman of them slew the felons. Valiant she was. All good go with her hand, said the alderman. But what be these people, and where do they dwell? Said Face of God, as to what they are, they are of the kindred of the gods and the fathers, valiant men, and guests cherishing. Rich they have been, and now are poor, and their poverty cometh of these same felons, who mastered them by numbers not to be withstood. As to where they dwell, when I say the name of their dwelling place, men mock me, as if I name some valley in the moon. Yet came I to Burgdale thence in one day across the mountain necks, led by sure guides, and I tell thee that the name of their abode is Shadowy Vale. Yea, said Iron Face, knoweth any man here of Shadowy Vale, or where it is? None answered for a while, but there was an old man who was sitting on the shafts of a wain on the outskirts of the throng, and when he heard this word, he asked his neighbour what the alderman was saying, and he told him, then said that elder, Give me place, for I have a word to say hereon. Therewith he arose and made his way to the front of the ring of men, and said, Alderman, thou knowest me? Yea, said Iron Face, thou art called the fiddle because of thy sweet speech and thy minstrelsy, whereof I mind me well in the time when I was young, and thou no longer young. So it is, said the fiddle. Now hearken, when I was very young, I heard of a vale lying far away across the mountain necks, a vale where the sun shone never in winter and scantily in summer, for my sworn foster brother, Fight Fain, a bold man and a great hunter, had happened upon it. And on a day in full midsummer he brought me thither, and even now I see the vale before me as in a picture, a marvellous place, well grassed, treeless, narrow, betwixt great cliff walls of black stone, with a green river running through it towards a yawning gap and a huge force. Amidst that vale was a doom-ring of black stones, and nigh thereto a feast-hall, well builded of the like stones, over whose door was carven the image of a wolf with red gaping jaws, and within it, for we entered into it, were stone benches on the dais. Thence we came away, and thither again we went in late autumn, and so dusk and cold it was at that season that we knew not what to call it, save the valley of deep shade. But its real name we never knew, for there was no man there to give us a name or tell us any tale thereof, but it was all waste there. The wimbrel laughed across its water, the raven croaked from its crags, the eagle screamed over it, and the voices of its waters never ceased and thus we left it. So the seasons passed, and we went thither no more, for fight fain died, and without him wandering over the waste was irksome to me, so never have I seen that valley again, or heard man tell thereof. Now, neighbours, have I told you of a valley which seemeth to be shadowy vale, and this is true, and no made-up story. The alderman nodded kindly to him, and then said to face of God, Kinsman, is this word according with what thou knowest of Shadowy Vale? Yea, on all points, said Face of God. He hath put before me a picture of the valley, 
and whereas he saith that in his youth it was waste, this also goeth with my knowledge thereof, for once was it peopled, and then was waste, and now again is it peopled. Tell us then more of the folk thereof, said the alderman. Are they many? Nay, said face of God, they are not. How might they be many, dwelling in that narrow vale amid the wastes? But they are valiant, both men and women, and strong and well liking. Once they dwelt in a fair dale called Silverdale, the name whereof will be to you as a name in a lay, and there were they wealthy and happy. Then fell upon them this murderous folk whom they call the dusky men, and they fought and were overcome, and many of them were slain, and many enthralled, and the remnant of them escaped through the passes of the mountains, and came back to dwell in shadowy vale, where their forefathers had dwelt long and long ago. And this overthrow befell them ten years agone. But now their old foemen have broken out from Silverdale, and have taken to scouring the wood-seeking prey. So they fall upon these dusky men as occasion serves, and slay them without pity, as if they were adders or evil dragons. And indeed they be worse. And these valiant men know for certain that their foemen are now of mind to fall upon this dale and destroy it, as they have done with others nigher to them. And they will slay our men, and lie with our women against their will, and enthrall our children, and torment all those that lie under their hands, till life shall be worse than death to them. Therefore, O aldermen and wardens, and ye neighbours all, it behoveth you to take counsel what we shall do, and that speedily. There was again a murmur, as of men, nothing daunted, but intent on taking some way through the coming trouble. But no man said aught till the alderman spake. When didst thou first happen upon this earl folk, son? Late last autumn, said Face of God. Said I am Face. Then mightest thou have told us of this tale before. Yea, said his son, but I knew it not, a but little of it, till two days agone. In the autumn I wandered in the woodland, and on the fell I happened on a few of this folk dwelling in a booth by the pine wood, and they were kind and guest fain with me, and gave me meat and drink and lodging and bade me come to shadowy vale in the spring, when I should know more of them, and that was I fain of, for they are wise and goodly men. But I deem no more of those that I saw there, save as men who had been outlawed by their own folk for deeds that were unlawful belike, but not shameful, and were biding their time of return, and were living as they might meanwhile. But of the whole folk and their foemen knew I no more than ye did till two days agone, when I met them again in shadowy vale. Also, I think before long ye shall see their chieftain in Burgstead, for he hath a word for us. Lastly, my mind is, that those brown-clad men who helped Hallface and his company in the wood were naught but men of this earl kin, seeking their foemen, for indeed they told me that they had come upon a battle in the woodland wherein they had slain their foemen. Now I have told you all that ye need to know concerning these matters." Again there was silence, as Iron Face sat pondering a question for his son. Then a good man of the upper dale, Gritgarth to it, spake and said, Gold man mine, tell us how many is this folk? I mean they're fighting men. Well asked, neighbour, said Iron Face. Said Face of God, they're fighting men of full age, maybe five score. But besides that, there shall be some two or three score of women that will fight. Whoever says them nay, and many of these are little worse in the field than men, or no worse, for they shoot well in the bow. Moreover, there will be a full score of swains not yet twenty winters old, whom ye may not hinder to fight if anything is a-doing. This is no great host, said the alderman, yet if they deem there is little to lose by fighting, and naught to gain by sitting still, they may go far in winning their desire and that more especially if they may draw into their quarrel some other valiant folk, more in number than they be. I marvel not, though, they were kind to thee, son gold mane, if they knew who thou wert. They knew it, said Face of God. Neighbours, said the alderman, have ye any reed thereon, and ought to say to back your reed? Then spake the fiddle. As ye know and may see, I am now very old, and as the word goes, unmeets for battle. Yet, might I get me to the field, either on mine own legs or on the legs of some four-foot beast, I would strike, if it were but one stroke, on these pests of the earth. 
an alderman Miss Seymouth, we shall do amiss if we bid not the earl folk of shadowy vale to be our fellows in arms in this adventure for look you how few soever they be they will be sure to know the ways of our foremen and the mountain passes and the surest and nighest roads across the necks and the mires of the waste and though they be not a host yet shall they be worth a host to us when men heard his words they shouted for joy of them for hatred of the dusky men who should so mar their happy life in the dale was growing up in them and the more that hatred waxed the more waxed their love of these valiant ones now redcoat of waterless spake again he was a big man both tall and broad ruddy-faced and red-haired some forty winters old he said life hath been well with us of the lower dale and we deem that we have much to lose in losing it yet ill would the bargain be to buy life with thraldom we have been over merry hitherto for that therefore i say to battle and as to these men these well-wishers of face of god if they also are minded for battle with our foes we were fools indeed if we did not join them to our company were they but one score instead of six men shouted again and they said that redcoat has spoken well then one after the other the good men of the dale came and gave their word for fellowship in arms with the men of shadowy vale if there were such as face of god had said which they doubted not and amongst them that spake were fox of nethertown and warwell and gritgarth and bearswain and warcliff and hart of highcliff and worm of willowholm and bullsbane and hyneb of the marsh all these were stout men-at-arms and men of good counsel last of all the alderman spake and said as to the war that must we needs meet if all be sooth that we have heard and i doubt it not now therefore let us look to it like wise men while time yet serves ye shall know that the muster of the dalesmen will bring under shield eight long hundreds of men well armed and of the shepherd folk four hundreds and of the woodlanders two hundreds and this is a goodly host if it be well ordered and wisely led now am i your alderman and your doomster and i can heave up a sword as well as another maybe nor do i think that i shall blench in the battle yet i misdoubt me that i am no leader or orderer of men of war therefore you will do wisely to choose a wiser man-at-arms than i be for your war-leader and if at the great folk-moat when all the houses and kindreds are gathered men yea say your choosing then let him abide but if they nay say it let him give place to another for time presses will ye so choose yea yea cried all men good is that neighbours said the alderman whom will ye have for war leader consider well short was their reed for every man opened his mouth and cried out face of god then said the alderman the man is young and untried yet though he is so near akin to me i will say that ye do wisely to take him for he is both deft of his hands and brisk and moreover of this matter he knoweth more than all we together now therefore i declare him your war-leader till the time of the great folk moat then all men shouted with great glee and clashed their weapons but some few put their heads together and spake apart a little while and then one of them redcoat of waterlust to wit came forward and said alderman some of us deem it good that stoneface the old man wise in war and in the ways of the wood should be named as counsellor to the war leader and hallface a very brisk and strong young man to be his right hand and sword bearer good is that said iron face neighbours will you have it so this also they yea said without delay and the alderman declared stoneface and hallface the helpers of face of god in this business then he said if any hath aught to say concerning what is best to be done at once it were good that he said it now before all and not to murmur and grudge hereafter none spake save the fiddle who said alderman and war leader one thing would i say that if these foemen are anywise akin to those overrunners of the folks whom the tales went in my youth for i also as well as stoneface mind me well of those tales concerning them it shall not avail us to sit still and await their onset for then may they not be withstood 
when they have gathered head and burst out and over the folk that have been happy, even as the waters that overtop a dyke and cover with their muddy ruin the deep green grass and the flower buds of spring. Therefore, my rede is, as soon as may be, to go seek these folk in the woodland and wheresoever else they may be wandering. What sayest thou, face of God? My rede is as thine, said he, and to begin with, I do now call upon ten tens of good men to meet me in arms at the beginning of Wild Lake's Way to-morrow morning at daybreak, and I bid my brother Hallface to summon such as are most meet thereto. For this I deem good, that we scour the wood daily at present, till we hear fresh tidings from them of Shadowy Vale, who are nigher than we to the foeman. Now, neighbours, are ye ready to meet me? Then all shouted, Yea, we will go, we will go! said the alderman. Now we have made provision for the war, in that which is nearest to our hands. Yet have we to deal with the matter of the fellowship with the folk whom face of God hath seen. This is a matter for thee, son, at least till the great folk moat is holden. Tell me then, shall we send a messenger to Shadowy Vale to speak with this folk, or shall we abide the chieftain's coming? By my rede, said face of God, we shall abide his coming, for first, Though I might well make my way thither, I doubt if I could give any the bearings, so that he could come there without me, and belike I am needed at home, since I am become war-leader. Moreover, when your messenger cometh to Shadowy Vale, he may well chance to find neither the chieftain there, nor the very best of his men, for whiles are they here, and whiles there, as they wend following after the dusky men. It is well, son, said the alderman, let it be as thou sayest. Soothly this matter must needs be brought before the great folk moat. Now will I ask if any other hath any word to say, or any reed to give before this gate thing sundereth. But no man came forward, and all men seemed well content and of good heart, and it was now well past noontide. End of chapter 25《Chapter Twenty Six of the Roots of the Mountains by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ending of the Gate Thing. But just as the alderman was on the point of rising to declare the breaking up of the thing, there came a stir in the throng, and it opened, and a warrior came forth into the innermost of the ring of men, arrayed in goodly glittering war gear, clad in such wise that a tunical of precious gold-wrought web covered the hauberk all but the sleeves thereof, and the hem of it, beset with blue mountain-stones, smote against the ankles, and well-nigh touched the feet, shod with sandals, gold-embroidered and gemmed. This warrior bore a goodly gilded helm on the head, and held in hand a spear with gold-garlanded shaft, and was girt with a sword whose hilts and scabbard both were adorned with gold and gems. Beardless, smooth-cheeked, exceeding fair of face was the warrior, but pale and somewhat haggard-eyed, and those who were near by beheld and wondered, for they saw that there was come the bride, arrayed for war and battle, as if she were a messenger from the house of gods, and the burg that endureth for ever. Then she fell to speech in a voice, which at first was somewhat hoarse and broken, but cleared as she went on, and she said, There sittest thou, O alderman of Burgdale, is face of God thy son anywhere nigh, so that he can hear me? But Ironfaced wondered at her word, and said, He is beside thee, as he should be, for indeed face of God was touching her, shoulder to shoulder. But she looked not to the right hand, nor to the left, but said, Hearken, Ironface, chief of the house of the face, alderman of the dale, and ye also neighbours and good men of the dale. I am a woman, called the bride, of the house of the steer, and ye have heard that I have plighted my troth to face of God, to wed with him, to love him, and lie in his bed. But it is not so, we are not troth plight, nor will I wed with him, nor any other, but will wend with you to the war, and play my part therein, according to what might is in me nor will I be worser than the wives of Shadowy Vale. 
Face of God heard her words with no change of countenance, but Iron Face reddened all over his face and stared at her, and knit his brows and said, Maiden, what are these words? What have we done to thee? Have I not been to thee as a father and loved thee dearly? Is not my son goodly and manly and deft in arms? Hath it not ever been the want of the house of the face to wed in the house of the steer? And in these two houses there hath never been a goodlier man and lovelier maiden than are ye two. What have we done then? Ye have done naught against me, she said, and all that thou sayest is sooth. Yet will I not wed with face of God. Yet fiercer waxed the face of the alderman, and he said in a loud voice, But how if I tell thee that I will speak with thy kindred of the steer, and thou shalt do after my bidding, whether thou wilt or whether thou wilt not? And how will ye compel me thereto? she said. Are there thralls in the dale, or will ye make me an outlaw? Who shall heed it? Or I shall betake me to shadowy vale, and become one of their warrior maidens. Now was the alderman's face changing from red to white, and belike he forgot the thing, and what he was doing there, and he cried out, This is an evil day, and who shall help me? Thou, face of God, what hast thou to say? Wilt thou let this woman go without a word? What hath bewitched thee? But never a word spake his son, but stood looking straight forward, cold and calm by seeming. Then turned Iron Face again to the bride, and said, in a softer voice, Tell me, maiden, whom I erst called daughter, what hath befallen that thou wilt leave my son? Thou, who wert once so kind and loving to him, whose hand was always seeking his, whose eyes were ever following his, who wouldst go where he bade and come when he called, what hath betid that ye have cast him out and flee from our house? She flushed red beneath her helm, and said, There is war in the land, and I have seen it coming, and that things shall change around us. I have looked about me, and seen men happy, and women content, and children weary for mere mirth and joy, and I have thought in a day, or two days, or three, all this shall be changed, and the women shall be, some anxious and wearied with waiting, some casting all hope away, and the men... Some shall come back to the garth no more, and some shall come back maimed and useless, and there shall be loss of friends and fellows, and mirth departed, and dull days and empty hours, and the children wandering about, marvelling at the sorrow of the house. All this I saw before me, and grief and pain and wounding and death, and I said, Shall I be any better than the worst of the folk that loveth me? Nay, this shall never be and since I have learned to be deft with mine hands in all the play of war, and that I am as strong as many a man, and as hardy-hearted as any, I will give myself to the warrior and the god of the face, and the battlefield shall be my home, and the aftergrief of the fight, my banquet and holiday, that I may bear the burden of my people, in the battle and out of it, and know every sorrow that the dale hath, and cast aside as a grievous and ugly thing the bed of the warrior that the maiden desires, and the toying of lips and hands, and soft words of desire, and all the joy that dwelleth in the castle of love, and the garden thereof, while the world outside is sick and sorry, and the fields lie waste, and the harvest burneth. Even so have I sworn, even so will I do. Her eyes glittered, and her cheek was flushed, and her voice was clear and ringing now, and when she ended there arose a murmur of praise from the men round about her, but Iron Face said coldly, These are great words, but I know not what they mean. If thou wilt to the field and fight among the cows, and that I would not nay say, for it hath oft been done and praised aforetime, why shouldest thou not go side by side with face of God and as his plighted maiden? The light which the sweetness of speech had brought into her face had died out of it now, and she looked weary and hapless as she answered him slowly. I will not wed with face of God, but will fare afield as a virgin of war, as I have sworn to the warrior. Then waxed Iron Face exceeding wroth, and he rose up before all men and cried loudly and fiercely, There is some lie abroad that windeth about us as the gossamers in the lanes of an autumn morning. And therewith he strode up to face of God, 
as though he had naught to do with the thing. And he stood before him and cried out at him, while all men wondered, Thou, what hast thou done to turn this maiden's heart to stone? Who is it that is devising guile with thee, to throw aside this worthy wedding in a worthy house, with whom our sons are ever wont to wed? Speak, tell the tale. But face of God held his peace, and stood calm and proud before all men. Then the blood mounted to Iron Face's head, and he forgot folk and kindred and the war to come, and he cried so that all the place rang with the words of his anger. Thou dastard! I see thee now! It is thou that hast done this, and not the maiden. Now thou hast made a bear a double burden, and set her on to speak for thee, whilst thou standest by saying naught, and wilt take no scruples weight of a shame upon thee. But his son spake never a word, and Iron Face cried, Out on thee! I know thee now, and why thou wouldest not to the Westland last winter. I am no fool. I know thee. Where hast thou hidden the stranger woman? Therewith he drew forth his sword, and hove it aloft, as if to hew down face of God, who spake not, nor flinched, nor raised a hand from his side. But the bride threw herself in front of Goldmane, while there arose an angry cry of, The peace of the holy thing! Peace-breaking! Peace-breaking! And some cried, For the war-leader! For the war-leader! And as men could for the press, they drew forth their swords, and there was tumult and noise all over the thing-stead. But Stoneface caught hold of the alderman's right arm, and dragged down the sword, and the big carl, Redcoat of Waterless, came up behind him, and cast his arms about his middle, and drew him back. And presently he looked around him, and slowly sheathed his sword, and went back to his place, and sat him down, and in a little while the noise abated, and swords were sheathed, and men waxed quiet again, and the alderman arose, and said, in a loud voice, but in the wanted way of the head man of the thing, Here hath been trouble in the holy thing. A violent man hath troubled it, and drawn a sword on a neighbour. Will the neighbours give the dooming hereof into the hands of the alderman? Now all knew Iron Face, and they cried out, That will we. So he spake again, I doom the troubler of the peace of the holy thing to pay a fine. To it, double the blood whites that would be duly paid for a full-grown freeman of the kindreds. Then the cry went up, and men yea said his doom, and all said that it was well and fairly doomed, and Iron Face sat still, but Stone Face stood forth and said, Here have been wild words in the air, and dreams have taken shape and come amongst us, and have bewitched us, so that friends and kin have wrangled, and me seemeth that this is through the wizardry of these felons, who, even dead as they are, have cast spells over us. Good it were to cast them into the death tarn, and then to get to our work, for there is much to do. All men yea said that, and Forkbeard of Lee went with those who had borne the corpses thither to cast them into the black pool. But the fiddle spake and said, Storm face say as sooth. O alderman, thou art no young man, yet I am old enough to be thy father, so will I give thee a reed and say this. Face of God, thy son, is no liar, or dastard, or beguiler, but he is a young man, an exceeding goodly of fashion, well spoken and kind, so that few women may look on him and hear him, without desiring his kindness and love, and to such men as this many things happen. Moreover, he hath now become our captain, and is a deft warrior with his hands, and as I deem, a sober and careful leader of men. Therefore we need him and his courage and his skill of leading. So rage not against him as if he had done an ill deed not to be forgiven. Whatever he hath done, whereof we know not. For life is long before him, and most like, we shall still have to thank him for many good deeds towards us. As for the maiden, she is both lovely and wise. She hath a sorrow at her heart, and we deem that we know what it is. Yet hath she not lied when she said that she would bear the burden of the griefs of the people? Even so shall she do, and whether she will or whether she will not, that shall heal her own griefs. But to-morrow is a new day. Therefore, if thou do after my read, thou wilt not meddle betwixt these twain, but wilt remember all that we have to do, and that war is coming upon us, 
and when that is over we shall turn round and behold each other, and see that we are not wholly what we were before, and then shall that which were hard to forgive be forgotten, and that which is remembered be easy to forgive. So he spake, and Ironface sat still and put his left hand to his beard, as one who pondereth. But the bride looked in the face of the old man the fiddle, and then she turned and looked at Goldmane, and her face softened, and she stood before the alderman, and bent down before him, and held out both her hands to him, the palms upward. Then she said, Thou hast been wroth with me, and I marvel not, for thy hope and the hope which we all had hath deceived thee. But kind indeed hast thou been to me ere now. Therefore I pray thee take it not amiss, if I call to thy mind the oath which thou swearest on the holy boar last yule, that thou wouldst not gainsay the prayer of any man, if thou couldst perform it. Therefore I bid thee, nay say not mine, and that is, that thou wilt ask me no more about this matter, but wilt suffer me to fare afield, like any swain of the dale, and to deal so with my folk that they shall not hinder me. Also, I pray thee that thou wilt put no shame upon face of God, my playmate and my kinsman, nor show thine anger to him openly, even if for a little while thy love for him be abated. No more than this will I ask of thee. All men who heard her were moved to the heart by her kindness and the sweetness of her voice, which was like to the robin singing suddenly on a frosty morning of early winter. But as for Goldmane, his heart was smitten sorely by it, and her sorrow and her friendliness grieved him out of measure. But Ironface answered after a little while, speaking slowly and hoarsely, and with the shame yet clinging to him of a man who has been wroth, and has speedily let his wrath run off him. So he said, It is well, my daughter, I have no will to forswear myself, nor hast thou asked me a thing which is over hard. Yet indeed, I would that to-day were yesterday, and that many days were worn away. Then he stood up and cried in a loud voice over the throng, Let none forget the muster, but hold him ready against the time that the warden shall come to him. Let all men obey the war-leader, face of God, without question or delay. As to the fine of the peace-breaker, it shall be laid on the altar of the God at the great folk-moat. Herewith is the thing broken up. Then all men shouted and clashed their weapons, and so sundered and went about their business. And the talk of men it was that the breaking of the troth plights between those twain was ill, for they loved face of God, and as for the bride, they deemed her the dearest of the kindreds and the jewel of the folk, and as if she were the fairest and the kindest of all the gods. Neither did the wrath of Iron Face mislike any, but they said he had done well and manly, both to be wroth and to let his wrath run off him. As to the war which was to come, they kept a good heart about it, and deemed it as a game to be played, wherein they might show themselves deft and valiant, and so get back to their merry life again. So wore the day through afternoon to even and night. End of chapter 26「Chapter twenty seven of the Roots of the Mountains by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Face of God leadeth a band through the wood. Next morning, Trist was held faithfully, and an hundred and a half were gathered together on Wild Lake's way, and Face of God ordered them into three companies. He made Hallface leader over the first one, and bade him hold on his way northward and then to make for Boar's Bait, and see if he should meet with anything thereabout where the battle had been. Redcoat of Waterless he made captain of the second band, and he had it in charge to wend eastward along the edge of the dale, and not to go deep into the wood, but to go as far as he might within the time appointed toward the mountains. Furthermore, he bade both Hallface and Redcoat to bring their bands back to Wild Lake's Way by the morrow at sunset, where other good men should be come to take the places of their men, and then, if he and his company were back again, he would bid them further what to do. But if not, as seemed likely, then Hallface's band to go west towards the shepherd country, half a day's journey, 
and so back, and redcoats east along the dale's lip again for the like time, and then back, so that there might be a constant watch and ward of the dale kept against the felons. All being ordered, Goldmane led his own company northeast through the thick wood, thinking that he might so fare as to come nigh to Silverdale, or at least to hear tidings thereof. This intent he told to Stoneface, but the old man shook his head and said, Good is this if it may be done, but it is not for every one to go down to hell in his lifetime and come back safe with a tale thereof. However, whither thou wilt lead, thither will I follow, though a sure a death waylayeth us. And the old carl was joyous and proud to be on this adventure, and said that it was good indeed that his foster son had with him a man well stricken in years, who had both seen many things and learned many, and had good read to give to valiant men. So they went on their ways and fared very warily when they were gotten beyond those parts of the wood which they knew well. By this time they were strung out in a long line, and they noted their road carefully, blazing the trees on either side when there were trees, and piling up little stone heaps where the trees failed them. For Stoneface said that oft it befell men amidst the thicket and the waste to be misled by whites that begrudged men their lives, so that they went round and round in a ring, which they might not depart for until they died. And no man doubted his word herein. All day they went and met no foe, nay, no man at all, naught but the wild things of the wood, and that day the wood changed little about them from mile to mile. There were many thickets across the road which they had to go round about, so that to the crow flying over the tree-tops the journey had not been long to the place where night came upon them, and where they had to make the wood their bedchamber. That night they lighted no fire, but ate such cold victual as they might carry with them, nor had they shot any venison, since they had with them more than enough. They made little noise or stir, therefore, and fell asleep when they had set the watch. On the morrow they arose betimes, and broke their fast, and went their ways till noon. By then the wood had thinned somewhat, and there was little underwood betwixt the scrubby oak and ash, which were pretty nigh all the trees about. The ground also was broken, and here and there rocky, and they went into and out of rough little dales, most of which had in them a brook of water running west and south-west. And now face of God led his men somewhat more easterly, and still for some while they met no man. At last, about four hours after noon, when they were going less warily, because they had hitherto come across nothing to hinder them, rising over the brow of a somewhat steep ridge, they saw down in the valley below them, a half-score of men, sitting by the brookside, eating and drinking, their weapons lying beside them, and along with them stood a woman with her hands tied behind her back. They saw at once that these men were of the felons, so they that had their bows bent loosed at them without more ado, while the others ran in upon them with sword and spear. The felons leapt up and ran scattering down the dale, such of them as were not smitten by the shafts. But he who was nighest to the woman, ere he ran, turned and caught up a sword from the ground, and thrust it through her, and the next moment fell across the brook with an arrow in his back. No one of the felons was nimble enough to escape from the fleet-foot hunters of Burgdale, and they were all slain there to the number of eleven. But when they came back to the woman to tend her, she breathed her last in their hands. She was a young and fair woman, black-haired and dark-eyed, she had on her body a gown of rich web, but naught else. She had been bruised and sore mishandled, and the Burgdale carls wept for pity of her, and for wrath as they straightened her limbs on the turf of the little valley. They let her lie there a little, whilst they searched round about, lest there should be any other poor soul needing their help, or any felon lurking thereby. But they found naught else, save a bundle, wherein was another rich gown, and diverse woman's gear, and sundry rings and jewels, and therewithal the weapons and war-gear of a knight, delicately wrought after the Westland fashion. These seemed to them to betoken other foul deeds of these murder carls, so when they had abided a while, they laid the dead woman in mould by the brookside, 
and buried with her the other woman's attire and the knight's gear all but his sword and shield which they had away with them then they cast the carcasses of the felons into the brake but brought away their weapons and the silver rings from their arms which they wore like all others of them whom they had fallen in with and so they went on their way to the north-east full of wrath against those dastards of the earth it was hard on sunset when they left the valley of murder and they went no long way thence before they must needs make stay for the night and when they had arrayed their sleeping stead the moon was up and they saw that before them lay the close wood again for they had made their lair on the top of a little ridge there then they lay and naught stirred them in the night and betimes on the morrow they were afoot and entered the above said thicket wherein two of them keen hunters had been aforetime but had not gone deep into it through this wood they went all day toward the north-east and met naught but the wild things therein at last when it was near sunset they came out of the thicket into a small plain or shallow dale rather with no great trees in it but thorn breaks here and there where the ground sank into hollows a little river ran through the midst of it and winded round about a height whose face towards the river went down sheer into the water but away from it sank down in a long slope to where the thick wood began again and this height or burg looked well nigh west thitherward they went but as they were drawing nigh to the river and were on the top of a bent above a bushy hollow between them and the water they espied a man standing in the river near the bank who saw them not because he was stooping down intent on something in the bank or under it so they gat them speedily down into the hollow without noise that they might get some tidings of the man then face of god bade his men abide hidden under the bushes and stole forward quietly up the further bank of the hollow his target on his arm and his spear poised when he was behind the last bush on the top of the bent he was within half a spear cast of the water and the man so he looked on him and saw that he was quite naked except for a clout about his middle face of god saw at once that he was not one of the dusky men he was a black-haired man but white-skinned and of fair stature though not so tall as the burgdale folk he was busied in tickling trouts and just as face of god came out from the bush into the westering sunlight he threw up a fish on to the bank and looked up therewithal and beheld the weaponed man glittering and uttered a cry but fled not when he saw the spear poised for casting then face of god spake to him and said come hither woodsman we will not harm thee but we desire speech of thee and it will not avail thee to flee since i have bowmen of the best in the hollow yonder the man put forth his hands towards him as if praying him to forbear casting and looked at him hard and then came dripping from out of the water and seemed not greatly afeard for he stooped down and picked up the trouts he had taken and came towards face of god stringing the last caught one through the gills on to the withy whereon were the others and face of god saw that he was a goodly man of some thirty winters then face of god looked on him with friendly eyes and said art thou a foeman or wilt thou be helpful to us he answered in the speech of the kindreds with the hoarse voice of a much weather-beaten man thou seest lord that i am naked and unarmed yet mayest thou bewray us said face of god what man art thou said the man i am the runaway thrall of evil men i have fled from rosedale and the dusky men hast thou the heart to hurt me we are the foemen of the dusky men said face of god wilt thou help us against them the man knit his brows and said yea if ye will give me your word not to suffer me to fall into their hands alive but whence art thou to be so bold said face of god we are of burgdale and i will swear to thee on the edge of the sword that thou shalt not fall alive into the hands of the dusky men of burgdale have i heard said the man and in sooth thou seemest not such a man as would be ray a hapless man but now had i best bring you to some lurking place where ye shall not be easily found of these devils who now oft times scour the woods hereabout said face of god come first and see my fellows and then if thou thinkest we have a need to hide 
it is well so the man went side by side with him towards their lair and as they went goldmain noted marks of stripes on his back and sides and said sorely hast thou been mishandled poor man then the man turned on him and said somewhat fiercely said i not that i had been a thrall of the dusky men how then should i have escaped tormenting and scourging if i had been with them for but three days as he spake they came about a thorn bush and there were the burgdale men down in the hollow and the man said are these thy fellows call to mind that thou hast sworn by the edge of the sword not to hurt me poor man said face of god these are thy friends unless thou bereyest us then he cried aloud to his folk here is now a good hap this is a runaway thrall of the dusky men of him shall we hear tidings so cherish him all ye may so the carls thronged about him and bestirred themselves to help him and one gave him his surcoat for a kirtle and another cast a cloak about him and they brought him meat and drink such as they had ready to hand and the man looked as if he scarce believed in all this but deemed himself to be in a dream but presently he turned to face of god and said now i see so many men and weapons i deem that ye have no need to skulk in caves to-night though i know of good ones yet shall ye do well not to light a fire till moon setting for the flame ye may lightly hide but the smoke may be seen from far aloof but they bade him to meet and he needed no second bidding but ate lustily and they gave him wine and he drank a great draught and sighed as for joy then he said in a trembling voice as though he feared a naysay if ye are from burgdale ye shall be faring back again presently and i pray you to take me with you said face of god yea surely friend that we will do and rejoice in thee then he drank another cup which warcliffe held out to him and spake again yet if you would abide here till about noon to-morrow and may happen a little later i would bring you other runaways to see you and them also might ye take with you ye may think when ye see them that ye shall have small gain of their company for poor wretched folk they be like to myself yet since ye seek for tidings herein might they do you more service than i for amongst them are some who came out of the hapless dale within this moon and it is six months since i escaped moreover though they may look spent and outworn now yet if ye give them a little rest and feed them well they shall yet do many a day's work for you and i tell you that if ye take them for thralls and put collars on their necks and use them no worse than a good man uses his oxen and his asses beating them not save when they are idle or at fault it shall be to them as if they were come to heaven out of hell and to such good hap as they have not thought of save in dreams for many a many a day and thus i entreat you to do because ye seem to me to be happy and merciful men who will not begrudge us this happiness the carls of burgdale listened eagerly to what he said and they looked at him with great eyes and marvelled and their hearts were moved with pity towards him and stoneface said here ain't no war leader need i give thee no reed for thou mayst see clearly that all we deem that we should lose our manhood and become the dastards of the warrior if we did not abide the coming of these poor men and take them back to the dale and cherish them yea said wolf of white garth and great thanks we owe to this man that he bid us as this for great will be the gain to us if we become so like the gods that we may deliver the poor from misery now must i needs think how they shall wonder when they come to burgdale and find out how happy it is to dwell there surely said face of god thus we shall do whatever cometh of it but friend of the wood as to thralls there be none such in the dale but therein are all men friends and neighbours and even so shall ye be and he fell amusing when he bethought him of how little he had known of sorrow but that man when he beheld the happy faces of the burgdalers and hearkened to their friendly voices and understood what they said and he also was become strong with the meat and drink he bowed his head adown and wept a long while and they meddled not with him till he turned again to them and said says ye're in arms and seem to be seeking your foemen i suppose ye wot that these tyrants and manquellers will fall upon you in burgdale ere the summer is well worn so much we deem indeed said face of god but we were fain to hear the certainty of it 
and how thou knowest thereof said the man it was six moons ago that i fled as i've told you and even then it was the common talk amongst our masters that there were fair dales to the south which they would overrun man would say to man we were over many in silverdale and we needed more thralls because those we had were lessening and especially the women now are we more at ease in rosedale though we have sent thralls to silverdale but yet we can bear no more men from thence to eat up our stock from us let them fare south to the happy dales and conquer them and we will go with them and help therein whether we come back to rosedale or no such talk did i hear them with mine own ears but some of those whom i shall bring you to-morrow shall know better what is doing since they have fled from rosedale but a few days moreover there is a man and a woman who have fled from silverdale itself and are but a month from it journeying all the time save when they must needs hide and these say that their masters have got to know the ways to burgdale and are minded for it before the winter as i said and naught else but the ways thither do they desire to know since they have no fear by then was night come and though the moon was high in heaven and lighted all that waste the burgdalers must needs light a fire for cooking their meat whatsoever that woodsman might say moreover the night was cold and somewhat frosty a little before they had come to that place they had shot a fat buck and some smaller deer but of other meat they had no great store though there was wine enough so they lit their fire in the thickest of the thorn-bush to hide it all they might and thereat they cooked their venison and the trouts which the runaway had taken and they fell to and ate and drank and were merry making much of that poor man till him seemed he was gotten into the company of the kindest of the gods but when they were full face of god spake to him and asked him his name and he named himself dalach but said he lord this is according to the naming of the men in rosedale before we were enthralled but now what names have thralls also i am not altogether of the blood of them of rosedale but a better and more warrior-like kin said face of god thou hast named silverdale knowest thou it dalek answered i have never seen it it is far hence in a week's journey making all diligence and not being forced to hide and skulk like those runaways you shall come to the mouth thereof lying west where its rock walls fall off toward the plain but said face of god is there no other way into that dale nay none that fought what of said dalek except a bold cragsman with their lives in their hands knowest thou aught of the affairs of silverdale said face of god said dalek somewhat i know we wot that but a few years ago there was a valiant folk dwelling therein who were lords of the whole dale and they were vanquished by the dusky men but whether they were all slain and enthralled we wot not but we deem it otherwise as for me it is of their blood that i am partly come for my father's father came thence to settle in rosedale and wedded a woman of the dale it was my father's mother when was it that ye fell under the dusky men said face of god said dalek it was five years ago they came into the dale a great company all in arms was there battle betwixt you said face of god alas not so said dalek we were happy folk there but soft and delicate for the dale is exceeding fertile and beareth wealth in abundance both corn and oil and wine and fruit and of beasts for man's service the best that may be would that there had been battle and that i had died therein with those that had a heart to fight but even so saith now every man yea every woman in the dale but it was not so when the elders met in our council house on the day when the dusky men bade us pay them tribute and give them houses to dwell in and lands to live by then we had weapons in our hands but no arts to use them what befell then said the good man of white Garth. said dalach look ye to it lords that it befall not in burgdale we gave them all what they asked for and deemed we had much left what befell sayest thou we sat quiet we went about our work in fear and trembling but grim and hideous were they to look on at first they meddled not much with us save to take from our houses what they would of meat and drink or raiment or plenishing and all this we deemed we might bear and that we needed no more than to toil a little more each day so as to win somewhat more of wealth but soon we found that it would not be so 
for they had no mind to till the teeming earth or work in the acres we had given them, or to sit at the loom or hammer in the stithy, or do any man like work. It was we that must do all that for their behoof, and it was altogether for them that we laboured, and naught for ourselves, and our bodies were only so much our own as they were needful to be kept alive for labour. Herein were our tasks harder than the toil of any mules or asses, save for the younger and goodlier of the women whom they would keep fair and delicate to be their bed thralls. Yet not even so were our bodies safe from their malice, for these men were not only tyrants, but fools and madmen, let alone that there were few days without stripes and torments to satiate their fury or their pleasure, so that in all streets and nigh any house might you hear wailing and screaming and groaning. But, moreover, though a wise man would not willingly slay his own thrall any more than his own horse or ox, yet did these men so wax in folly and malice that they would often hew at a man or woman as they met them in the way from mere grimness of soul, and if they slew them it was well. Thereof indeed came quarrels enough betwixt master and master, for they are much given to manslaying among themselves. But what profit to us thereof? Nay, if the dead man were a chieftain, then woe betide the thralls, for thereof must many an one be slain on his grave mound to serve him on the hell road. To be short, we have heard of men who be fierce and men who be grim, but these we may scarce believe to be men at all, but trolls rather, and ill will it be if their race waxeth in the world. The Burgdale men hearkened with all their ears, and wondered that such things could befall, and they rejoiced at the work that lay before them, and their hearts rose high at the thought of battle in that behalf, and the fame that should come of it. As for the runaway, they made so much of him that the man marvelled, for they dealt with him like a woman cherishing a son, and knew not how to be kind enough to him. End of chapter 27